Okay, I'll just start. Okay. Hello, everyone. Yes, hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Hao Su. I am an assistant professor in the CSC department of UC San Diego. Um, please accept my greetings from California. And next, let me make the opening remark uh, for our first workshop on the generalizable policy learning in the physical world. <laughs> and welcome you to join our workshop on behalf of the organizing team. So as the first iClear workshop on generalizable policy learning, I will start to introduce the background of why we get together to create this workshop. And then I will introduce the logistics and give a preview of the events of the day. So let's start from the motivation of the workshop. I believe that for everyone of you listening to my talk now, you are first fascinated by the promise of building the intelligent agents that can interact with the physical world. And then we call such kind of AI with embodiment as embodied AI. So embodied AI can transform the world and change our lifestyle by redefining industries such as transportation, home services, logistics. It might also expand the life space of us human beings by enabling <laughs> um, applications such as pilotless space exploration. Um, if we abstract out application specific setups, a core challenge of embodied AI is to make decisions. An agent perceives the environment through vision, sound, haptics, or other sensor data, and then take an action to approach the goal. So we call the strategy to take an action based upon this perceived data as a policy. How do we obtain the policy that can approach the goal of the agent? Well, learning as a modern approach has attracted the, the interest of many researchers and industry practitioners. And learning means that an agent can improve his ability to make decisions from experiences. Such experiences may be obtained by the proactive interaction between the agent and the environment, or they may come from existing data sets in some form like demonstrations from others or even language instructions. And there are many sources to obtain training data for policy learning. So compared with classic approaches that hard code policies, Learning allows agents to improve its decision-making ability by enriching the experiences, which gives infinite possibilities to train smart agents. However, as a particular type of learning, policy learning also suffer from the fundamental challenge for any learning-based method, generalizability at test time. So in the machine learning framework, a policy learner is first to train on the training data, which could be interactable environments. But at deploy time, deployment time, the testing data could be unseen before. For example, if we are to train the driving policy of an autonomous vehicle in San Francisco, would it function safely in Paris? And therefore, the generalization is particularly important when learning policies to interact with the physical world. However, even defining generalizability of such policies is non-trivial. And this is because the spectrum of such policies is very broad, and the generalizability can be defined from many dimensions. Now, these policies can be high level, such as action plans that concern temporal, <coughs> temporal dependencies and causalities of environment states or low level, such as object manipulation skills to transform objects that are rigid, articulated, soft, or even fluid. And therefore, an embodied agent can face a number of changing factors, such as physical parameters, action spaces, tasks, visual appearance of the scenes, geometry, or even topology of the object. 
Um, next, let me illustrate by some concrete examples. So visual perception requires generalizability. If the agent is to push the chair, it must handle the geometry and the color differences between the training and the test ones. Sorry. And the variation of physical properties call for generalization. For the four-legged dog to walk on the ground of different materials, generalizability is important. There's also task space generalizability. It's particularly interesting to consider composition of generalizability of this kind. If an agent has been trained to organize a simple room, can it rearrange in the larger room? Well, generalizability may also happen across the morphology of agents. If a policy works for robot A, can we transfer it for robot B with few or zero extra training? So there are many fascinating problems and that inspire researchers to study and opens a large research space. And we will listen to this discussion to these interesting topics today. And next, let me introduce the logistics. Today, we're going to listen to invited talks from world leading experts in academia and industry to talk about generalizable policies. The talk will cover all the important dimensions we mentioned previously. And after the pre-recorded talks, we will have the speakers to answer questions in a live manner. At the second event, we will hold a live panel discussion at 10.15 a.m., which is Pacific time. Other than our invited talk speakers, we will have three additional experts to join us and to discuss the future of the field. Our workshop has received 40 submissions uh, for research papers. After peer review, peer review, two of them are selected for oral presentation, and then we will also host the two poster sessions in Gatherton to discuss other accepted papers. The final event is around an open challenge on learning generalizable manipulation skills. Last July, we released a many skill benchmark that evaluates the generalizability of object manipulation policies. This challenge focused on object level generalizability that a robot trained with a set of objects must work well on unseen objects. Tasks include manipulating articulation objects with reference joints or translational joints. It also tests two arm collaboration and the manipulation of under-actuated systems. We will conclude the first many skill benchmark uh, challenge by giving awards to the winners and listening to the oral reports from the winning teams. And finally, I would like to thank my co-organizers co for putting down the event. They are Yang Ming Kim from CEO National University Ming Lin from University of Maryland College Park, Sergey Levin from UC Berkeley, Tom Jo Mu from UC San Diego, and Ash Nair from UC Berkeley. And I'd also like to thank the program committee to help review the research papers submitted to the workshop. Okay, so that's all for my opening remark. And for the rest of the day, enjoy the event. Thank you very much. Hello, my name is Danica Kragic and today I'm going to address the problem of learning for contact strict tasks and tell you a little bit about our ongoing work. Our research is very much motivated by the human ability to interact with everyday objects in everyday environments. We do this swiftly, almost without thinking. 
And despite the fact that the media um, usually changes in terms of what we manipulate objects in, um, we do this again adaptively, freely, almost without thinking. So we don't think very much about how the friction coefficients change when we change from air to water or oil. We don't necessarily always think why and how we manipulate a knife dependent on um, whether the, the um, object we are shredding is soft or hard. Um, we are not always thinking about what are the forces and torques we are using when we are tying the shoes or buttoning a shirt and so on. Now, many of these tasks um, are still largely open in the area of robotics, and many of the topics that um, are going to be discussed during the workshop today are addressing uh, these uh, in, in, in some way. And the idea is that uh, for my presentation to give you uh, a little bit of an overview of uh, what are the problems we address and what are the methods we develop to uh, address these. Now, why are we in general um, interested in interaction tasks? And to me, uh, these are interesting from the control machine learning perception, HRI perspective, again, dependent a little bit on the application. And also because the majority of human uh, manipulation tasks are contact-rich tasks. So if we are to deploy robots in uh, human-populated environments or have them actually um, 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 help humans uh, in their uh, daily course or automate uh, some of those dirty, dull and dangerous jobs that uh, humans are doing either industrial settings, uh, outdoor settings and so on, we will need to address uh, um, the problem of uh, modeling um, uh, contact rich uh, tasks. There are also uh, properties if you compare contact rich versus contact free in terms of exchanges, forces, and energy, and uh, thinking about very complex, including very co uh, complex dynamics. And um, um, this is also what what then makes the uh, what, what makes them scientifically interesting. But also because most of these tasks uh, will require uh, both low level um, real time feedback and control that will not always um, be possible to solve in analytic way. So we will need uh, data driven methods to be integrated with more classical uh, analytic approaches. But if you also want to uh, combine, uh, let's say, some form of uh, simple primitive tasks, we will also need to address the problems of task uh, um, task planning and not only uh, resort to, to maybe low-level motion planning. Now, um, what um, is important, especially when it comes to the issue of dynamics and the, the, the fact that things change abruptly, fastly, and so on when interacting with the environment, we will need uh, not only real-time performance, but we will also need to address the problem of multimodal perception, multimodal control, how to encode this. And um, uh, we will need methods that can uh, um, identify or model complex physical properties that will not di be directly measurable with the available uh, uh, sensing devices. For example, one... Uh, uh, one uh, issue that we can bring up is that of friction. So how do we understand how the friction changes uh, when the media in which the object is uh, interacted with changes and so on. Now, a couple of works uh, I would like to mention, uh, mostly those that we have published during the um, last couple of years look into different types of applications. So it might be something that is related to direct physical uh, interaction between robots and the human. We might be thinking about EEG-based settings where the human and the robot interact and are trying to, um, through sensory motor contingency, uh, learn each other's um, behavior. Um, at some level and uh, also um, learn through interaction how to achieve common goals. 
It might be also um, control-based compliance tasks, uh, the robots and um, uh, humans carry things together and the adaptation is then related uh, to um, 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 controlling, let's say, forced work feedback, for example, and having then robots use both their manipulation and mobility capabilities. Some of the problems relate to um, physical interaction with um, objects that have partially unknown properties. So uh, in terms of uh, shredding or cutting, uh, understanding online uh, the, um, um, the properties uh, of objects. So uh, for example, how hard or soft the object is and use that to adapt the control parameters or address more classical problems of um, peg and hole, which uh, might be considered as a solved problem, but still can serve as an um, excellent example of how to test both model-free and model-based uh, RL algorithms and so on. So these are a couple of examples of works where um, I think um, the titles say a lot in terms also of the relevance for this particular workshop. Uh, so, um, um, for me, uh, the interesting problem of um, understanding how reinforcement learning, for example, can be used in human-robot interaction. Also, how we can use various types of representations, such as topological representations, in order to encode, efficiently encode uh, complex body motions for, uh, as we had here, whole arm manipulation. Then um, how we can deal with task planning, rearrangement, for example, with deep reinforcement learning, uh, with a combination of sim to real transfer. Um, um, one of the recent works that uh, we also looked into in terms of skill learning, how we can unify and evaluate various types of representations for continuous control in terms of analytic manifold learning. Um, how we can um, develop data efficient models um, um, or how we can achieve data efficient model learning and prediction for context rich manipulation tasks. And also uh, one of the more recent works that looks into more st stability guarantees or stable normalizing flow control for, uh, again, contact, uh, contact rich tasks. So some of these works, I'm going to go through and tell you a little bit more of how we address them in particular skill encoding for, um, from those perspectives. Now, uh, the red thread in our work uh, is uh, really state representation learning. So we are very much interested in how we can um, um, borrow uh, models uh, and develop them further from, from machine learning area, data-driven models, and apply them uh, on various robotics problems uh, where uh, then the direct physical interaction with the, with the world is assumed. And also do this not only in terms of rigid objects, but also take into account uh, soft and deformable objects to address this um, aspect of physical parameters beyond shape. And in our work, we combine then analytic and data-driven approaches uh, with the help of various types of kernels, priors, regularizes, latent space encoding, and uh, of course, seem to real transfer. Now, contact-rich manipulation, um, it was just start with a very simple peg and hole example, maybe key insertion. Uh, that task already in itself, uh, although it sounds rather simple, um, it has a couple of, um, um, let's say, open problems related to it. The first one is, of course, uh, being able to grasp a key, which I think is a problem in itself, how with um, a two or whatever N-fingered hand, one can uh, pick up a rather flat object, then how collision-free motion planning can be um, um, generated, and then uh, inserting the key, key really is uh, only that part is then the contact-rich uh, manipulation part. From the aspect of motion generation and context-rich manipulation tasks, uh, of course, uh, we would like to address uh, uh, generating of appropriate generation of um, uh, uh, motion forces, torques, and so on, but also at the same time efficiently exploit uh, the contact so that the contacts are also um, a source of information that can allow us then to uh, 
either uh, use that to, to uh, define various types of stability properties of other controllers or use them to uh, generate um, efficient um, exploration strategies and so on. Now, one example um, uh, of um, addressing or one uh, of the problems we address are um, uh, also uh, being able to generate safe um, exploration through uh, stability guarantees. And this is something that I'm going to tell you a little bit more about. Uh, so uh, these are just some examples of exploration strategies uh, in deep RL where uh, on the left-hand side, we show how uh, exploration strategy may look like uh, without stability guarantees and how it can look uh, as on the right-hand side with stability guarantees for um, uh, uh, a rather simple peg in a hole, uh, peg in a hole task. Now, dealing with unknown dynamics in general, uh, one can think about then uh, model-based reinforcement learning properties with um, um, integrating then um, model-based RL with uh, the idea of generating the data, learning the model, policy search, and so on by extending it with some LIPUM uh, function synthesis. So uh, resorting to some of the more classical approaches to stability guarantees where the idea is um, um, then um, to address the problems of how to then uh, provide online LIPON of uh, analysis, uh, learn potentially LIPON of uh, function. And there are many challenges uh, in terms of stability guaranteed deep reinforcement learning so that um, the dynamics of course is um, um, usually unknown. Uh, that we need a data-driven policy model uh, uh, with assumptions of random initialization, random exploration, and so on. And there has been um, some work uh, in this area, we see more and more uh, uh, during the last years, where um, um, usually in order to be able uh, to, to address the problem of stability, uh, lots of assumptions uh, is being made uh, in terms of uh, then uh, resorting to just uh, on, the, on the safe exploration part. In our work, uh, we'll look also into model three um, RL, uh, where we then uh, design a framework for uh, consisting of both offline and online part. Where the, in the offline part, we look uh, into how to define policy and life on a function with shared parameters and establish uh, stability and passivity for the manipulator in um, um, isolation with the assumption of passive environments. And then uh, in the online policy search part, exploring the parameter space, uh, uh, assuming uh, stability analysis is deterministic and respect then uh, if there are any parameter constraints. And uh, how we uh, recently implemented this uh, is uh, through the use of normalizing flow control, where the main motivation, the main scientific question was how to introduce deep neural networks into uh, stability policy structures. And here you have a little bit of an idea of how we think uh, of, the, of the whole framework. Uh, from the um, perspective of actually implementing this and using then the Lyapunov um, uh, function through normalizing flow uh, policy and, and with the classical uh, manipulator model with some assumption of idealized normal spring uh, damper model, where in particular then we deal with invertible, invertible deep neural network with uh, differential uh, Jacobian. And um, um, this is kind of uh, the setup uh, for those that are interested in more detail, please um, um, uh, go and look into the, into the paper. Now, one of the topics uh, of the uh, workshop is also um, um, the, the need for generating um, um, various types of tasks um, that are relevant for skill learning, uh, both in real life and simulation. So one of the recent works that we published at NeurIPS um, last year was uh, related to our uh, work on uh, sequential topological representations for predictive models uh, of deformable objects in particular. And the work that uh, we 
um, uh, presented was how we can uh, build uh, environments from basic uh, simul advanced environments from basic simulations where the tasks were um, addressing uh, scenarios for what we call topologically non-trivial uh, deformable objects. And the idea here was to propose a set of environments uh, where uh, one can study uh, various types of control algorithms for uh, learning skills of uh, how to manipulate this deformable object. And just to give you a couple of examples um, um, of how these um, uh, look like, uh, we have tasks of uh, three different levels of difficulty. For example, putting a tube scarf over the mannequin's head, putting a mask over the ears, putting a backpack with log handles around the mannequin's arms. And what one can study here from this particular tasks um, is um, A, uh, uh, what would be then the control strategies uh, to um, execute or achieve um, um, successful uh, execution uh, of these tasks. It might be also to learn representation learning. So what are the relevant uh, features to be used in control or to base the, um, um, the controllers on? or in terms of generalization. So uh, what is common between uh, putting a tube scarf over the mannequin's head and putting a backpack and how uh, one can generalize then skill learning uh, over uh, various types of tasks uh, uh, or tasks of various types of uh, difficulties. So I hope that, that uh, some of these examples will actually uh, serve as an inspiration uh, for um, assessing uh, various types Types of control algorithms and representation learning algorithms. I wanted to say also a couple of things of um, executing tasks on real physical robots and uh, dealing with uh, what may seem rather simple task of cutting. We see very little work in robotics on these particular tasks uh, where the specific focus from, from our perspective was really um, be able to adapt to uh, change properties uh, in objects or to learn those properties while um, um, uh, performing the cutting itself. So we started a couple of years back looking into how we can model and learn dynamics uh, that, that, uh, or dynamic uh, models that can be uh, applied over different uh, types of objects. So if something has a very hard crust or soft crust or soft body, hard crust, so different combinations of uh, these properties. And then also uh, how we can address some of the properties of interpretability. So understand uh, when things go well, why they go well, or when they go wrong, why they go wrong. So um, um, the work from Humanoids uh, 2019 looked into then data-driven model predictive control uh, for the contact-rich task of food cutting, where um, the questions we ask, how can we efficiently learn dynamics? So from very few examples, look into whether our models can generalize to unknown objects and also try to understand what are the failure cases. So if the knife gets stuck, or if the force applied is too high so that um, there is a um, um, high impact in terms of uh, velocity, we want to avoid that because either the knife might be dropped or the robot can be, well, it either uh, shuts down uh, because of the, of the high uh, velocities or um, um, it, it potentially can um, destroy the surface, the object flies on and so on. So um, in terms of the framework uh, that we've developed, again, it has uh, an offline and online part uh, where, where we deploy the three-stage training process from uh, deep um, MPC approach and looked in particular uh, how we can uh, then with a minimal uh, amount of data collection uh, with some representative example, adapt the model uh, online and study what are the properties of these models in different situations. And that was also very closely related then to the problem, as I mentioned, of interpretability, uh, where we wanted then to understand further why do similar models behave differently online and how can we evaluate uh, and anticipate that. So just to give you a couple of examples, uh, we started with various types of um, uh, recursive neural nets 
look into what, uh, if we train those, uh, what kinds of motions uh, could those result in? As, as you see here, it might be an appropriate small amplitude motions, not uh, always being able actually to cut through. If the friction is sky, potentially generate irregular sewing motion where, uh, well, uh, it goes well if the um, uh, knife doesn't have any teeth and so on. But again, it does take some time and it doesn't feel very efficient. Then looking into uh, something like um, 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 vanilla LSTM, uh, where again, we end up with various types of sewing motion or uh, something like uh, adapted uh, LSTM uh, uh, where we can achieve uh, smooth uh, sewing motion, breaking friction um, um, uh, and so on. So what I think it <clears throat> in general is really interesting when we talk about data-driven models is really to understand what are uh, um, the uh, failure cases um, and try to really do large-scale experiments in order to understand when things work, why they work, uh, but also challenge algorithms on uh, rather complex objects. So, for example, if we take a fresh squash or if we take a squash uh, that is three or four days old and try to really use the same trained algorithms, we'll see a very, very different performance. And this is really something that uh, I would urge everybody to really think about. Uh, uh, how do we easily change uh, properties of these objects and uh, test whether the algorithms or the models still, uh, still hold? In terms of interpretability, um, um, we I think we are the first that looked into um, building images from the four historic data and trying to understand whether we can use then uh, models uh, from uh, computer vision communities such as Grad Cam and try to understand uh, really um, uh, what is happening in our networks. Uh, how could we, how could we look into different heat maps? Uh, indicate what are the features of importance, but now in a completely different sensory space and so on, and uh, try to understand better whether the robot is uh, on the urge of actually getting stuck and how can then that be addressed online uh, by changing uh, the, the exerted force, for example. Our current work, uh, also uh, apart from uh, the work on uh, integrating Lyapunov stability, uh, looks also into more formal methods uh, and deals with what we call safe sets in terms of contact-rich uh, interaction tasks. So uh, um, um, about a year and a half, two years ago, we started to look into how can we approximate a set of safe states from positive and negative. Uh, examples, and then can we keep the system in the safe set for different dynamics and controller behaviors? So it's a little bit different way of dealing with, with the um, 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 safety. It's not from the classical stability point of view, but it's more from the safe set aspect. And um, um, I think that this is one, um, uh, this is another relevant approach of dealing with how we can learn skills. Um, also online while keeping uh, keeping uh, safe performance uh, of the of the robot. Now there are many things to be said about what the open problems are, and uh, if even if we are moving, I would say between all these areas, I think that one of the most difficult problems that um, we still uh, have to address in more depth is how to, in the best way, um, um, encode multisensory data. So it would be really, really nice if uh, many of our algorithms can uh, rely on visual, four-storic, tactile, proprioceptive data uh, in one system and still demonstrate uh, the um, um, a nice performance, continuous performance, uh, learn in those very complex multisensory uh, spaces. And um, I would say if uh, there are people out there looking for PhD thesis topics, I would say that uh, marrying data-driven, analytic, and multisensory would be um, definitely a way to go. Thank you so very much for your attention, and um, I am looking for, forward to your questions. Hi, everyone. Um, unfortunately, Professor Kodrick was not able to make the Q&A session today, um, so we'll just... Um, 
uh, so she, she said, um, please email her with any questions. Um, I, I feel free to email her anytime. Um, and um, yeah, we'll just move on to the uh, next session, which is um, Peter Stone. Thanks. My name is Peter Stone. It's a pleasure to be here talking with you today. Thank you very much to the organizers for inviting me. I'm going to start by introducing myself to those of you who, who don't already know me, telling you a little bit about where I'm coming from and some of the things I work on in my lab, and then focus in this talk on grounded simulation learning for sim to real, which I think is particularly important for robust and generalizable policy learning in the real world. We need to be able to um, to be able to do learning in simulation and be able to have that apply um, on real, real world robots. I am at the Learning um, Agents Research Group here at the University of Texas at Austin and also Executive Director of Sony AI America. And at UT Austin, um, there's been some really exciting times recently. We got one of the first um, National Science Foundation sponsored institutes, um, AI institutes on the, on the Foundations of Machine Learning, IFML and use that to found the machine learning laboratory. I'm the director of Texas Robotics here at UT Austin. We had a ribbon cutting on our, a new building of, about a year and a half ago, um, an old gymnasium that's been refurbished into a beautiful playground for robotics. We'll be hosting ICRA 2025. Um, myself and many of the other Texas Robotics colleagues here at, at UT Austin who are um, distributed across several different uh, departments. And uh, we look forward to, to hosting you at uh, ICRA 2025. I hope many of you will be able to be here in person. So again, for those of you who don't already know me, I've been working in artificial intelligence research for the past 25 to 30 years or so, always focusing on this question, to what degree can autonomous intelligent agents learn in the presence of teammates and or adversaries in real-time dynamic domains? Um, and you know, for the purposes of, of this talk, it's the learning aspect and trying to do this in, in dynamic real-time domains, which is characteristic of the real world. Um, so we publish in a bunch of different sub areas of artificial intelligence, autonomous agents, multi-agent systems. Um, and then within machine learning, we focus a lot in reinforcement learning and robotics, which will both feature strongly in this talk. We work in my lab, both on sort of fundamental new theory and, and algorithms um, and also more um, application-inspired research. And so when I give a one-slide introduction to my lab, it's often easiest to um, present the, the kinds of um, domains that inspire the research. Um, I'll talk a little bit about uh, RoboCup, robot soccer. I am currently the president of the International RoboCup Federation. Um, there's this is a clip from many years ago with the old Sony Ibo robots playing soccer. They're fully autonomous. They have to sense, decide, and act on their own. We now use the um, the SoftBank Now robots. Um, and uh, so these, you know, the humanoid robots that, again, have to sense, decide, and act. Um, this is showing a clip from a, from the finals of one of the competitions where our team was the one with the, their arms behind their back um, playing against a team from the University of Bremen. Um, and again, you know, the agents have to be able to um, to be able to control themselves in, in, you know, to walk, to kick, to coordinate in a multi-agent system, to think as a team, to, to reason adversarially. There's vision aspects that come into play and, and of course, um, you know, control policies. And um, here you see the robot scoring the first goal in a, in a game when, that we ended on uh, up going on to win the, uh, the finals in that, in that competition. I'll talk a lot more about learning skills on these kinds of robots as this talk proceeds. Um, another inspiring domain for me is trying to create general purpose service robots. So if you come to my lab, you'll see robots like this one um, wandering around in, in, in the lab, in the world, um, interacting with people. This particular video is where it was doing some grounded language learning from, um, from human interaction, collaboration with my colleague, Ray Mooney. Um, but these robots, these, if they're going to be part of the social fabric of the building, they're going to need to have generalizable, robust policies that can work with multiple robots, interact with people, um, in all of these, you know, all of these sorts of settings. I've also been very inspired by autonomous driving, as many of us have in recent years. I had a car in the DARPA Urban Challenge, one that's shown here. Um, and I've also thought a lot about what happens if all the cars on the road are 
autonomous? Will we have traffic signals and stop signs? Or will we have intersection control policies that look more like this one? This is, of course, a, a simulation, one that we put out more than more than 15 years ago and have done now um, you know, uh, a, a lot of research on how we can um, have distributed control of autonomous agents and yet much more efficient interactions um, at sort of contentious regions like intersections. And then most recently, my team at um, at Sony AI has just uh, just published a paper on the, on the that appeared on the cover of Nature um, because we created a, 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 the, a reinforcement learning agent, model free reinforcement learning agent that's able to to beat the world's best um, human drivers in Gran Turismo, which is a very real uh, racing game. It's not quite um, the the real world. It's it is a, a simulator. But it's a, a very uh, with a high degree of realism and such that that drivers in this game um, do cross over and use their skills in um, real racing in real um, Formula One racing as well. And so uh, I could I could give sort of you know I could give a one hour talk on each of these application domains. Um, but in this you know sort of short uh, short session today, um, I'm going to focus um, on especially a problem that's motivated by, by RoboCup soccer, as I already showed a video of. I'm the president of the RoboCup Federation right now. Um, our grand challenge is to create a team of humanoid robots that can beat the World Cup champion soccer players um, on a real field by the year 2050. So we still have some time. Um, just to get a sense, there's been a, there has been a lot of, lot of progress over the years. Um, you know, in, the, in the early years, there were, you know, sort of robots that could barely stand up and that were crashing into walls, um, moving slowly. These aren't all my own, my robots. These are videos from from colleagues um, at, at many different labs around the world. Um, but they're, you know, they were they were scoring some goals. Um, but if you flash forward a few years from from there, you start to see much better individual skills um, and and teamwork and faster you know behavior there's uh, the beginning of the humanoid league is shown here in the bottom right corner um, and if you've been following Robocop and and I really highly encourage you to come to a competition if you haven't before um, you'll you'll see that there's there's just some really inspiring problems and progress on getting robots to work robustly um, in the real world and one of the leagues that that I've participated in many um, many years, my team has won uh, nine out of the last ten years, is the Simulation League, um, the three D Simulation League, which features it prominently in this um, in this talk. In that, um, when we're trying to do sim to real, we need a basis, a simulation um, sort of substrate where we can do the learning. And in fact, um, to to win this uh, this competition, we've had these simulated agents learn skills like kicking and walking that were very fast and robust and, um, and then have tried to translate them to, to real robots. And finally, I did say that there's, you know, the goal is to, to be able to play against humans. Um, we do every year have the, the winners of this middle-sized league at RoboCup play against um, sort of, you know, uh, myself and my colleagues, other trustees of the RoboCup Federation. And, um, Though it looks like the robots are going to be very, you know, very hard to beat, we're still uh, we're still able to score on them, um, and so you know, we, it's clear that there's a there's still a ways to go if we're going to get you know really robust and generalizable and, and high quality policies on this task. But if we are, one of the things we need to do is do reinforcement learning, or one of the one of the possible approaches is to use reinforcement learning to learn skills behaviors on physical robots, and uh, the work I'm going to present. Um, was uh, played uh, a prominent role in the PhD thesis of both Patrick McAlpine, who's now at Sony AI with me, um, as well as Josiah Hanna, who's now faculty at the University of Wisconsin um, Madison. And the motivation is that you know if we're going to try to learn on physical robots, we'd love to just be able to do that, to just you know actually gather data on the robots and learn. But but there's a whole bunch of challenges as shown here. Um, the, you know, the robots, especially with these kind, you know, that the, the takes manual resets and the robots will break, the wear and tear make learning a non-stationary uh, problem. So there's a lot of incentive and appeal to trying to, to learn in simulation where you can do thousands of trials in parallel. There's automatic resets, the robots don't break. But inevitably, if you learn in simulation in this kind of a setting like this, where in the RoboCup simulator, you could have a robot learn 
to dribble a soccer ball quickly or really just to, to walk straight ahead as quickly as possible. <coughs> Excuse me. You can learn a policy in a simulator. Um, and I'll talk a little bit about how we do. Um, but, if, um, but if we apply that in the, in the real world, usually because of the, the sim to real gap, um, even if the policy can apply, as it does here, it doesn't work nearly as well. And so here you see the robot you know, takes one or two steps on using a policy that works great in simulation, and it just falls over when we use it in the, in the real world. So this motivates what I think is a very important problem right now in, um, in robotics and machine learning called sim to real. Um, and of course, several people are, have been, been focusing on this, this problem, which is, which is great. The general setup is that um, you have a, uh, or the setup that I'm gonna consider in this talk is you have a policy that interacts with the environment in sort of the standard reinforcement learning kind of way where there's actions that are emitted by the policy that's sent to the environment and they cause a, um, a change in the state and some kind of reward. And you're trying to find a policy that maximizes that reward over time. And then you have a simulated environment that can execute that same policy, but the simulated environment inevitably is a little different than the real environment. So it gives you, when you execute the same action, you get a slightly different state, a slightly different reward. And there's generally two classes of approaches for dealing with this sim to real. One is domain randomization, where you um, make the simulator a little more random, hoping that the policy that you learn will be uh, more robust. And there's sort of a, a, a some really you know some nice approaches that I that I cite here at the um, at the bottom of the slides, and the other type of approach is to take a small amount of data from the real world and use that to improve the simulator or to maybe even create the simulator. And it's that class of approaches that I'm going to focus on um, in this talk. And in particular, I'm going to present a um, a paradigm that we introduced in my lab called grounded simulation learning, and it's an iterative approach. That make that is ground. It's is sort of um, the foundation is is the premise that you can never get a perfect simulator. So we're going to try to to imp gradually improve the simulator, but only in the region of the policy space where we're currently searching, at the risk of making it worse other in other regions. And so, um, like I say, it's an iterative approach as as um, illustrated here. We get some real world policy executions from a from a base policy, the policy we start with. We execute those to get some real world state action trajectories, take those trajectories to ground the simulator. That's the key of the method. I'm going to, and I'll, I'll, I will expand on that in the coming slides. Once we have this grounded simulator that's representative of the real world, um, we can then use um, learning in the simulator to improve the policy. Then we take that improved policy, get some more um, real world policy executions, and repeat the cycle. And the idea is that when we then ground the simulator with this with data from this improved policy, it might make the simulator worse in the area of the policy space where we were before, but it should make it better in the current place that we're searching in policy space and therefore allow us to take another um, improvement step. Okay, so the key of this is the simulator grounding. And how do we do the grounding? Well, you know, we're trying to come up with a simulated environment that is um, as close as possible to the real environment. But we're doing it in a um, under the assumption that we already have a pretty good simulator. So rather than just throw away that that simulator, we're instead going to learn a um, an action, what we call an action transformation function. That's sort of a, a wrapper around the simulator, or the, you know, an interface between the policy and the simulator that allows us to keep the simulator as a black box. And the goal is to create to transform the action that comes out of the policy, such that the transformed action will have the same effect in the simulator that the original action had in the real world. Okay, so that's the key. And um, I'll, I'll state, state that again and, and illustrate it in these coming slides. We wanna replace the robot's action that comes out of, that's, that's specified by our policy with an action that produces a more realistic transition. And we're gonna call the function that does that the action transformation function, G. And it's a function of our current state and the action that the policy emits. Opening up this, this box G um, a little bit, we're going to do this by uh, composing a forwards dynamics model of the real world, which is a function that says, if I'm in a state S and I execute action A, what's the predicted next state S hat that I'll 
that I'll get. That's our forwards dynamics model of the real world. And we'll compose that with an inverse dynamics model of our simulator, which is a function that says, if I'm in a particular state, our current state, and I'd like to get the effect of going of transitioning to s hat, what action should I execute? And that's action a hat. So that's our transformed action. So you know, if we compose this these these two functions, then we should, in principle, be able to take take any action and transform it to a different action that will have the same effect in the simulator um, that the original action had in the real world. And so that's what this grounded action transformation um, does to learn this, this forwards dynamics model and inverse dynamics model, we do gather some real world trajectories and some simulated trajectories, pass them through a, a neural network, not a particularly deep one, but, but one that you know, takes, the, um, takes these uh, training. Um, it's, it's basically a supervised learning, learning function to get a problem to get both the forwards dynamics model and the inverse, dyna uh, inverse dynamics model. And using this general methodology, we can then um, evaluate or test um, <coughs> um, by uh, applying or learning in a, um, in a simulator, either the RoboCup simulator or a more sophisticated gazebo simulator, and try to translate to the real world. And um, for our initial policy, we used a, um, a walk that was the fastest known at the time. It was created by some colleagues of ours who were involved in RoboCup at the University of New South Wales. Um, and, uh, and so I'll show that, that walk working as our starting point. And for the policy search algorithm that we do um, learning in simulator to try to, in the simulator to try to optimize the parameters of this walk, we use CMAES, which is a derivative free stochastic search method. Um, but uh, that um, models the, both the, the, um, the co models the covariance and the, um, and the average performance of the, the various policies. Um, so as we, uh, as we um, I'll, and I'll show in the, in the paper, we actually do, we transfer, uh, transfer from SimSpark to SoftBank and also from uh, Gazebo to, to uh, SoftBank robot, to the real robot. And then we do a lot of experiments going from one simulator to the other as if Gazebo were the real world so we can get some more uh, statistical significance to our results. So the punchline really is, is the, the, you know, this result that if we start with the UNSW walk, this was the fastest known walk at the time on the, um, on the now, uh, it was going 19.3 centimeters per second. We then go one iteration through grounded simulation learning and you'll see sort of a, a noticeably different walk, one that sort of squats a little bit lower to the ground. Um, going 26.3 centimeters per second. We gather more data from that policy and uh, reground the simulator and do another iteration. And we got to this walk that was um, at the time the fastest known stable walk on the robot going 28 centimeters per second. And so this is, you know, that, that's the base method. Um, it was introduced in a AAAI paper in 2017. And the, you know, the, the main result is it improved the walk speed of the now by over 40% compared to state of the art, uh, the state of the art walk engine. Um, and then we've now been, been looking at extending to other robotic tasks and platforms and, and understand, trying to understand when do grounding actions work and when, do, um, when does it not. And, um, and a, a core part of Josiah's thesis was, thesis was also making a connection between um, grounded simulation learning and off policy evaluation for reinforcement learning and safe learning. And I'm not gonna go into the details of uh, of that due to, to time constraints here, but there's some really interesting papers at, at ICML um, that, that appear in his thesis that, that make this, this connection. And there, I have a longer version of this talk on my website where, you could, where I talk about that a little bit. But just to, to finish off in the time I have remaining, I'm gonna talk about a few extensions that we've made to this grounded simulation learning method. Um, a couple that appeared at, at uh, IROS in 2020 and um, I'll just briefly mention uh, one that, that appeared in, in, um, in NeurIPS this, that same year. So these two IROS papers, the first um, was based on the, um, the premise that, uh, oops. let me see if this video plays, hopefully it does. Okay, here we go. Um, you know, it's, uh, 
it's the, st the starting point is, is exactly what I showed you before. The, the top walk is our initial walk and the bottom walk is, is the walk learned by um, grounded simulation learning. So it's, you know, sort of um, the shown in the, in the split screen. And um, one, one thing we, we recognized after, after doing that first work was that um, this action transformation function doesn't necessarily need to be composed um, of a forwards dynamics model and inverse dynamics model. Um, it could actually be done in a more end-to-end -end way and that there's a particular advantage of doing that, which is um, that rather than making the objective to, to have this transformed action match our current action on every time step, rather really what we want is that the trajectories that come out of our grounded simulator or the transformed simulator match the trajectories that come out um, in the real world. And so that that actually reframing the formulating the problem that way um, makes it seem a little bit more like a reinforcement learning problem where the agent itself is this action transformer. It's trying to take as input an action, output another action, and um, and basically uh, make the trajectories that result um, match the trajectories that come from the from the real world. And um, this forward model being close to this forward model it generates a reward signal uh, that um, so that you know the action transformer could, in principle, learn to um, to you know have some trans action transformations that are not ideal um, in the one step state, but learn it from a delayed reward that get us you know trajectories that are that are more simul similar. And um, without going into too much detail, you know we evaluate this in some of the Mo Majoko domains. In fact, since the YouTube player is not going really quickly, I'm just going to skip through to um, to some of the results and just show that that um, that basically we're able to learn a much more um, smooth and and concise uh, transformation function. This is this is when we actually did an experiment where the the simulator and the real world were exactly the same because we made the you know we pretended the real world was the simulator and the original gap method would still learn to transform the actions in this sort of scattered plot when we knew that the identity function was ideal, which is what our gap was able to, um, to learn. And then we did repeated where we knew that the scaling should be um, either you know, cutting the actions in half or multiplying them by two because the, uh, we were in a pendulum that was either twice as heavy or twice as light. The other extension I want to present here is, is where we move to stochastic environments. So um, the the grounded, um, grounded simulation learning that I presented so far was on a flat ground, but in principle, the robot could, could be learning to, to walk in, in um, a sort of you know, bumpier terrain. And, and here we purposely put bumps under the carpet and show that you know, the, the, what was learned um, in uh, the method that I presented for previously didn't learn an ideal transformation function because it assumed that the um, that the forwards dynamics models and inverse dynamics models were deterministic. But we found that if we actively modeled the non-determinism or the stochasticity in the environment, especially in particular in the forwards, um, forwards uh, dynamics model, we could learn a policy that was much ro more robust to this stochasticity. And again, in the interest of time, I'm skipping over some of the details, but the results are that we were able to, um, using this stochastic GATT, we were able to um, get a robot that a, a policy that falls over much less frequency fre frequently falls over only one out of ten times um, or one out of twenty out of the two grounding steps at a small cost to the speed. Um, and so here you see um, side by side some of the um, some of the trials. On the right is using the original grounded simulation learning method, and many of the the trials fall over. On the left is showing the result of, of actually modeling the transitions as being stochastic. The robot's able to learn a much more robust policy. It's not perfect. I think one of them here falls over, but the rest of them successfully get to the, um, get to the goal. And um, then just to, uh, and, and this is joint work with, um, in addition to Josiah, who I introduced earlier, Sid Desai, Harash Karnan, who are currently PhD students in my lab, and Garrett Warnell, who's a research scientist at um, Army Research Lab. And then finally, I don't have to have time to, to talk about, we also had a paper at NeurIPS that treats this action transformation function as a distribution matching problem 
um, and takes uh, sort of modern adversarial learning methods to try to match the action transformation function um, so that the, the distribution of trajectories that comes out of the simulator matches the distribution of trajectories that, um, that we see in the real world. And so that's an alternative approach within this um, general paradigm of grounded simulation learning. So all of this, uh, this, this work fits in, into the, the context of, of my research question that I introduced at the, at the beginning of the talk. It brings together reinforcement learning and robotics to try to learn policies in simulation that are um, robust and generalizable um, in the real world. And, um, and with that, I'd be, I thank you for your attention and I'll be happy to, to try to answer some questions um, right now live. Um, and also very much invite you to, to reach out by, by email if you have any comments or questions about the talk. Thanks for your attention.
Okay, um, so we, we have um, Professor Stone here um, answering questions. So if anyone has questions, please uh, put them in the uh, rocket chat or, um, or or come join the Zoom chat. Um, so yeah, so thank you for the talk. Um, so um, yeah, generally, uh, I was um, yes, yeah, super uh, impressed by like the results in Robo Soccer, and um, I was curious about like your kind of intuition for scaling up Sim to Real. So. Uh, do you feel kind of like in in your simulator grounding work is there real world effects that are still kind of difficult for sim to capture um is online adaptation in the real world kind of an option robust software then i think yeah i mean i think in answer to your first question yes the real world is very difficult to capture and we don't claim at all that, that we've solved the problem um in fact you know the whole premise of our grounded simulation learning is that it's you know i, I don't think it's near-term feasible to create a a simulator that does solve all of the, you know, um, that, that does perfectly model the real world. And, mm -hmm. you know, sort of we, we grounded simulation learning sort of accepts that, embraces it, and, you know, mm -hmm. sort of tries to do more of a locally good enough approximation. Mm -hmm. um, and, uh, you know, I, I think it, there, there's been fantastic advances. I think there's a lot more, you know, this, this, I've been really impressed by some of the recent simulators and some of the physical realism that, that goes on there, but, um, you know, I, I don't think we're, at least in the near term future, going to get to a point where we can confidently do all of our learning and simulation and without any kind of mixing with real world data or, you know, um, tuning in the real world, be, you know, confidently deploy policies in, in the real world. So I think sim to real is, I think one of the, it is going to be one of the, you know, sort of fundamental challenges in machine learning and robotics and, and in robust policy general, general, um, generalization for, um, for quite some time. And, uh, you know, I think it's, it's going to sort of grow into a more important and, and, and present sub subfield and sub area. Cool. Yeah. That, that, that makes a lot of sense. Um, is, is online adaptation an option in robo soccer? Like do, do people yeah try kind of, yeah, directly training the real world, especially. After yeah. With a limited, uh, you know, in a limited capacity. So at least, you know, you have, um, the the actual robo soccer games in that robo cup are short they're like 10 minutes or 20 minutes that kind of thing so you know you're not going to be able to adapt you know, most things that you might want to adapt to are, is going to be based on a small amount of data so you know you're um you're not going to be learning a new policy from scratch you you know we we have had seen examples of um you know a, a team becoming more offensive or defensive like if you know if there's if you have like two or three policies that are pre you know, pre-canned and, and you want to, um, you know, test out which one is working best for the opponent, you might, tr you know, for this particular opponent, you might try each one for a minute or two and then settle on, you know, which one to do. Um, mm -hmm. the, the skills themselves, things like walking and kicking and, and vision, that you're, you're, the kind of data you need for that is not going to be adapted during a game. But there's, there's sort of different scales of online adaptation, right? There's, there's the training you do back in your lab over the, you know, the months leading up to, to the RoboCup competitions. Then there's okay. the, the adaptation you do when you get to the competition and you have a day and a half at the, the actual site. Um, I wouldn't call that online adaptation, but we do, you know, all the, you know, the teams do like sort of tune, retune their walks for the surface, which is a little bit different than the one back home and the, and the lighting conditions are a little bit different or the, you know, the, the, the surroundings. And um, so there's, you know, adapt, there's sort of, that, that's sort of intermediate between fully offline. It's still offline, but it's, yeah. but it's time pressured, um, limited data. So, you know, sort of a step towards online adaptation. And then there's the adaptation during the course of an actual, you know, 10-minute um, game um, that you can do. But, but it's got to be like, you know, you're selecting from a, a small number of options for, with, a, you know, based on a small amount of data. Um, and, you know, there are, there are aspects of, um, of an overall, you know, controller that that, that is appropriate for it, But it's not going to be the low-level skills. Got it. Got it. Cool. Um, okay, so we, we have a question from Rinal Kalakrishnan. Um, great talk, Peter. I was wondering about the RGAP method, which matches trajectories in both domains instead of per time step. Does this need the same starting conditions to be replicated in both domains? It seemed like the previous forward inverse dynamics method didn't have that limitation. Um, yeah, it's a good good question. So, so uh, you know, RGAP is is not. It's it's again not. Um, Oh, let's see. Go, going back to does the starting conditions have to be the same. So it is. It, it, it's basically trying to come up with transitions 
that are um, that match your your forwards dynamics model, um, but over time rather than per per step. Now it's you know the sequence. Um, so you know the the reward signal is still coming from uh, not not a, an exact same trajectory in the real world, but it's but your fidelity to the forwards dynamics model. So. Um, if I recall correctly, we weren't we weren't enforcing that that you needed to have trajectories from exactly the same same point. Now you know you have to um, in practice what we're working on. You know the skills we're we're using for for like you know a walking robot. It's not there's there's not that many you know starting point isn't that relevant. You're you know they're always uh, it's going through a cyclic cyclical kind of um, kind of process. Um, but yeah, it's a it's a good question. If we were you know working on skills where the, where there's you know sort of ranges of starting points, like you know something like a manipulation where you know the arm could start in various places or uh, objects could start in various places, um, you know presumably it would work better if if you if you if the distributions are similar. But but in 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 theory, the the forwards dynamics model is the thing that's providing the reward, and as long as that covers the the starting position for your, you know, the, um, the range of starting positions for your simulator, it still should be applicable. Now, yeah, so there's a question of, you know, is it applicable versus does it help performance if you're, you know, have the same support or the same um, set of starting conditions? And that's, those are different questions. Um, and we haven't done that experimentation. Got it. Um, great. So yeah, uh, um, thank you, Professor Stone for um, coming here for the Q&A. Um, so yeah, now we'll break um, for um, a 10 minute break and then we have a, a hour long poster session after that and then um, we'll be back here at 1015 PDT for the live panel discussion. Thank you. Okay. Uh, then have we gone back? All right, hello everyone. My name is Youngmin Kim and I'm an assistant professor in Seoul National University and it is Great pleasure to invite you all in this panel discussion session. So before we actually start on the discussion, let's take turns so we can introduce ourselves as a panelist, okay? So let me just uh, call out the names because there are so many of you. So uh, can we start with Peter Stone, please? Yeah, thanks. Hi, everybody. It's a pleasure to be here. My name is Peter Stone. I'm a professor of computer science at the University of Texas at Austin. Um, I'm the director of Texas Robotics, and um, and, and uh, in a little bit of a scheduling snafu, we have uh, an all-day Texas Regional Robotics Symposium here on campus today, so I'm actually going to need to um, step out partway through this uh, panel because we have folks from Texas A&M, like Robin Murphy's group and Lydia Kavraki's group from Rice and everybody here. Um, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to excuse myself partway through, but um, in addition, I'm also executive director of Sony AI uh, research in America and um, looking forward to the panel. All right, thank you. And uh, maybe we can move on to Nadia Figueroa. Hi, everyone. Uh, first of all, thank you all for, for inviting me. I'm Nadia Figueroa. I'm an assistant professor in the mechanical engineering department at the University of Pennsylvania. Um, I just started my appointment this uh, this year and finished the semester of my first semester of teaching introduction to robotics. So I'm really excited of, of uh, achieving that milestone. Um, yeah, so I, and I do research in uh, human aware uh, robotics. So developing efficient and safe uh, learning and control schemes for physical human robot interaction. All right, thank you. And next on the list is Hao Su. Hey, everyone. Uh, my name is Hao Su. Um, I'm an assistant professor in the CS department of UC San Diego. Um, I, I work on problems uh, that interact between um, vision, graphics, learning, and robotics. Okay. Thank you. And sorry if I mispronounce your name, Bernal Kalak Kristan. <laughs> sorry. Yeah. Um, hi. Uh, so my name is Bernal Kalak Krishnan. 
Um, so I lead a robot motion team at Everyday Robots. We are part of Alphabet. Um, and we do a bunch of machine learning based control uh, and you know everyday tasks with robots. That's great. So we also have Xiaolo Wang with us. Hi. Um, yes, I'm Xiaolong. I'm an assistant professor from UC San Diego in the EC department. Um, I'm also working on in the session with um, computer vision and robotics. And I'm recently quite interested in um, dexterous hand and also um, locomotion uh, with black robots. Thank you. Thank you. And Deepak Pratak. Hi, uh, thank you for the invitation. I am uh, Deepak Pathak. I'm an assistant professor at Carnegie Mellon University in the School of Computer Science. And uh, my work and research is at the intersection of uh, machine learning, computer vision and robotics, and more recently, uh, robot learning, uh, primarily. And uh, we are interested in all kinds of robots, uh, from manipulation, uh, arm to dexterous hands to walking uh, robots. Thank you. All right, thank you. And Professor Ming Lin? I think you're Hi. muted now. Hi. Uh, I'm Ming Ling from University of Maryland at College Park. I co-lead the Gamma Research Group here. Um, I also, I'm also um, an Amazon scholar, so I consult for Amazon on some of their uh, physics-based inspired learning-based algorithm. Um, I'm a faculty, by the way, in computer science department. And we're working physics-based modeling simulation and robotics as well. Great. Okay, so last but not least, Dan Fei Su, please. Hello, everyone. My name is Dan Fei. I'm a research, currently a research scientist at NVIDIA. I'm, I'm joining Georgia Tech Interact, a School for Interactive Computing in the fall as assistant professor. Uh, my research is in robot learning, with uh, specifically, more specifically, on imitation learning and planning. Um, I'm also interested in human robot interaction and uh basic other aspects of uh combining robotics and machine learning thank you okay thank you so that's all of our panelists and i'm really excited to start our panel discussion so uh so i'll i have a list of questions but we can always be free and discuss broader topic if it allows okay so let's start with professor peter stone it's not that because you have to leave early so so can I start with a general question? So what factors play the most important roles in generalizable policy learning? Do you have an opinion? Maybe we could have that data is most important or inductive bias or what would be the key factor for generalizability? Yeah, I don't think, I mean, I, I tend, questions like that when I tend to usually answer that uh, they all matter, that's, you know, it depends on the situation, right? There's not gonna be, one key factor that's um you know th these days with methods um you know the, the data-based methods obviously do need um need data but inductive bias is important as well i think for real general for robust generalization we're going to need to combine methods it's not going to be i think it's really interesting what we're learning from you know end-to-end -end deep learning and what the you know what's possible there and what the limit but there's you know that's not going to solve the whole problem i think we're going to need to to you know, bring to bear all of the different uh, tools from the AI toolbox, in, including symbolic reasoning and probabilistic modeling, um, as well as um, as uh, neural network-based methods, the things people are calling neurosymbolic methods these days a little bit. Um, but uh, you know, I, I think the um, some some of the the questions that you see to this with you know er, early also were you know along the lines of where where should we be focusing our generalization? Is it at the you know, level of reaching and grasping, or is it more at the level of um, things like opening a cabinet and and skills like that? And you know, I, th I think um, all of these are, are interesting. I, I you know, um, Marinal, I really like that you know the ambition that's going on in, in in everyday robots and and you know the kinds of things you're doing there. It's also the the same kind of um, tasks and ambition that we've had for several years in RoboCup at home, and that's that's one thing I didn't mention in my 
introduction is that I'm president of the RoboCup Federation right now. And within RoboCup, you know, we for many years had these tasks of, of trying to create general purpose service robots in sort of wide varieties of scenarios. And I think, you know, they're going to need to, um, to generalize at the level of, of, you know, robustly being able to reach and grasp and, 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 uh, and maneuver and, uh, and, you know, at the very lowest levels, and then also at the, you know, at the more task levels, like, you know, not the opening one cabinet won't be good enough. It's got to be able to do it in everybody's home and everybody's cabinets, everybody's, you know, floor plans and things like that. I think one of the, the most, you know, interesting and useful um, decompositions of generalizability is maybe into navigation versus manipulation versus perception. Um, and you know that those can start we can start by thinking about you know those each individually um and then a lot of the interest and challenge will be as we try to put those together and you know what do we do with mobile manipulators um how can we you know generalize along each of those dimensions uh first individually and then you know and then try to to combine them so i don't know if that's uh that's not directly answering your your question but it's touching on sort of a bunch of the things that you you asked us to think about as leading up to the to the panel so maybe it'll seed some discussion yeah, that's very good overview of the topics that we are interested to talk covering today. So thank you very much for your answer. And the, is there anyone else who wants to add on that? Otherwise, um, we could maybe now we started with a very general question. Now we can maybe focus on more specific questions because um, Professor Peter Stone kindly mentioned that there is a kind of uh, decomposition of tasks that we could handle when we're approaching this general eligibility. So I would like to ask a question to Deepak Patak. So you've done some work on uh, uh, primitive skills and how you could uh, define an elementary skills, I think. So uh, if you want to learn a set of primitive skills and compose them to generalize to a new tasks, so what would be the appropriate granularity? So do you want to have it like a opening a cabinet or we want to be more general of reaching, grasping and pulling or in addition, there could be also hand-eye coordination. So it's a very difficult problem. So, but do you have some insight on that? Um, yeah, I think this also ties to the previous question as to what matters in generalization and what level should you generalize. Um, I agree with uh, Peter's uh, view. Uh, I want to add to it that I personally think of it at two levels. Um, for instance, uh, let's take the kind of effort Mridan and his team is doing at Google, where you want robots to do multiple things in multiple environments, okay? So like if I see a cabinet, I should know that or if I see a cabinet, I should roughly go to the cabinet door and try to open it. So there is a clear breakdown there. Like one is this high level, you can say visual common sense that, okay, what should I do uh, if I see something? Where should I roughly go? And then there is low level common sense, which is sensory motor common sense. Like how do you move your fingers to uh, grasp something? Or how, how hardly do you hold something? Is it hard enough to, uh, uh, to, to pull the cover out? Or is it uh, hard enough to just hold it? Or things will fall or not? So this, I think, this low level skill, which is how do you, how you're actually dealing with the contacts and all this. I think this kind of things to generalize always need to be improving. Like as you interact more in the real world, you get more data and you should incorporate that in your uh, current uh, low level control. While the high level thing that, oh, where should I go? I think this can benefit a lot from the existing, existing data already on the web. Like if I see uh, lots of humans doing something, I can figure out okay, what do humans usually do? If they see a cabinet door, they go to the cabinet door. They don't just try to go to the different parts of the hinge of the cabinet. They never really go to the hinge of the cabinet. So I think data plays a really key role in this high level uh, uh, visual uh, 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 common sensical things like where to go, where should I do? And then at low level, the, the lowest level skills, I think that needs to be always uh, uh, improving. Uh, like how you touch the object, how you uh, grasp them. If you fail, you have to succeed and adapt in the in the real world. Uh, so I think dividing it into these two levels, I I believe is the uh, is like one of the um, maybe one of the promising ways to generalize to different things. Now in the low level, as you ask, there can be different things. Open a microwave and all this. Uh, I still think even those skills are not really uh, what we should probably think of. We should divide open a microwave into two parts. Okay. 
where in the microwave should I interact? And then roughly when I have a handle-like thing, how should I grasp a handle? Now, if you break it this way, you are able to de facto do lots of tasks. Like for instance, handle of microwave has probably similarities to handle of a door. Even the microwave is vertical, door is horizontal, but the low level contact, it's very similar how you're grasping and holding it. So uh, I think breaking the problem into these kind of uh, uh, levels instead of uh, breaking into discrete skills, I feel like uh, uh, could, could lead to better generalizability. And one could use like passive data. I, I don't know, like there is this latest work from Medal's team where they use this uh, passive data on the language models, visual models, etc. We also have something. It can help in the high, high level part, but the low level part, if you keep improving it, um, I think that's the only way to uh, uh, really get robust generalization. Right, yes. So there is also a question on the chat. So if anyone would like to answer, so is it, it mentions what would be the challenges involved in generalizing perception to robots, which can perform a wide variety of tasks in everybody everyday environments. And I think that kind of echoes what you just mentioned, Deepak, and, um, but it is also a very hard question. So anybody has insights on that? So I, I was just going to comment because I have dabbled in, uh, I have dabbling in a bit of looking at sort of the robustness issue. And what I have seen is many of the, the, you know, the image processing algorithm, the vision algorithm focus largely on detection recognitions. And, and there, there are lots and lots of algorithms that have also looked at the generalizations um, in, in terms sort of, you know, image domain, domain shift in the images that was being acquired, um, particularly in autonomous driving, um, how it's being acquired in one city and, and the training is being done in one city and, and moving into maybe a countryside of another country. And, and so there are a lot of really interesting questions there and observation that has been made uh, in the vision side. But I think there is a lot broader and general question is how would these domain shifts in the images affect the robot um, learning, you know, and, and performance in terms of executing particular skills that we're talking about, whether it's motion planning, navigation, control, or autonomous steering. Um, and I haven't seen as much being looked at um, the effect of image processing and the variation that we see uh, in, in the images to how that would actually perform the robot uh, task performance. And, and that, I, I think there are some implications we are looking at right now, but we don't have a great deep understanding yet on what that really translates. And that's really kind of bridging the gap between computer vision and robotics, because robotics people tend to focus on sort of learning to execute a certain task. And, and not really thinking about how these variation in image input actually affect the performance of the learning outcome. Right, so that's a very important point. And I believe we have quite a bunch of experts on vision and robot combination in this panel as well. So, so I would love to hear from others. Yeah. 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 Maybe also comment a little bit. Uh, uh, well, well, I was working on a project, and I think the main problems, I feel like there's one challenge that's a bit hard to deal with, which is now, how do we get the data that we should use to relate for certain actions? For example, you can get a lot of YouTube videos for human perform tasks, right? But these videos are like high level information, and they're not sufficient. They do not include information for those uh, manipulation tasks, especially those contact rich tasks. And then, of course, you could in simulator to get some of like the data that um, does give you like contact rich information, like your con the, the contact information, but then the video realisticity is not as optimal. And then, if you're in the real world, you can get something that's like visually true, and then you have the low level information 
but it's very hard to get enough diversity and amount. I feel like this is a, a, a big challenge. How can we combine different sources of video data? Right? <laughs> can we get more about the high level from YouTube, like more of a low level from real robotics and something from simulator, I don't know, like a, a way to figure out a, a combination. And the other is, well, in computer vision, we have done a lot of processing tasks. We are assuming that object recognition is, is the basics, almost like a segmenting objects, uh, instant segmentation, segmentation, classification. And then like, well, maybe we do 60 folds, but are they sufficient for manipulation, right? But there would be some kind of concepts that are necessary, <laughs> but we are unaware of. So I feel like understanding what are the key visual concepts to to infer is also another big challenge few people really fall deep in that. Mm -hmm. so yeah, thank you. Yeah, I agree. And speaking of collecting data, I think we cannot uh, skip um, talking to Marina Kalakashian because you are from the kind of industrial background and you might have better access to large scale data. So can you share some experience and what do you think would be the uh, we can also expand on discussing what do you think would be the benefits of being from industry and having access to large scale data versus doing work on academia. Yeah, so I mean, you know, it's, I think we're in a privileged position to have access to lots of robots and lots of resources to collect data and resources to, to, to train on the data and stuff like that. So, you know, I don't want to play that down. Um, and I, I also wonder if that influences my sort of view on things like the, the previous topic we were discussing around, for example, decomposition of um, skills into like sort of primitive things or even other aspects like decomposing the problem into perception and uh, motion, right? So I think with both of these, um, like I think it's appealing to do that kind of breakdown and like you can get quite far with that. In fact, if you do that, there's also like nice inductive biases that can help you generalize. But I think with both of these kind of factorizations, um, there's a ceiling that we hit um, in terms of performance, right? So for example, like if you're breaking down, um, you know, your, I don't know, robots execution into small skills like, you know, pull, push, grasp, and so on. Um, it, it turns out that like you can't really do complex high level tasks, you know, strictly using such a breakdown or rather like quite often each of these individual primitives need to understand the broader context of the task. I think the, the most canonical example is like when you're grasping something, you need to know what you're going to do with that object afterwards. Otherwise the grasp just might not, you know, make any sense. Right. But I think there's like similar examples across all, all those things. And, um, you know, so, so in our work, we've like, yes, of course we have primitives because that, that just makes sense to uh, plug together as building blocks. But we also have, um, you know, heavily relied upon like kind of putting those together and then optimizing end to end, right? Whether it's a chain of actions or whether it's like from pixels to actions, right? Because both of those, um, you know, if you create abstractions, you know, it's nice, but um, it does limit you in some ways. And so, you know, connecting that to the industry piece, I think like, yes, it's, you need more data if you want to break those abstractions a little bit. Yeah, that makes sense. Great. But even with enough data, so I'm curious, Bernal, like with a, with a lot, with, you know, the, uh, is there an amount of data that's enough to do everything you want to do from pixels to actions? Um, or, you know, are you going to, you know, or, or are you in, in pulling in or embracing other, other methods as well? Um, definitely not. That's the answer to the first part, right? I mean, I don't think we can, yeah, like that's definitely not possible, right? Like, but, but I think what I'm really excited about um, in the future is um, I think what someone mentioned just before, right? Like being able to pull in data, other kinds of data sources, like say YouTube or like, you know, or 
as a community, if we kind of pull together all of our data sets, like that would provide a lot more diversity. Um, and I think recently we've seen a lot of excitement in pulling together like language models and vision models and like plugging those two things together and stuff like that. So I think, you know, obviously like there's a long road down that path of like leveraging other giant data sets um, and seeing how we can use that to improve robot generalization. Um, yeah, and I agree with 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 uh, specifically with regards to like you know videos, online videos, and things like that. Then that very strongly motivates learning from demonstration and learning from especially um, imitation from observation, where you don't have access to the actions, but you just have actions, you know, access to uh, sequences of states, which I think is a an important um, important area to yeah if we're trying to generalize from from these large you know sort of external data sources. Uh, speaking of scalability and demonstration, I'd like to invite Nadia Figueroa to comment on that. So you've been working quite a lot about human robot demonstration stuff, if I observe correctly. So can you please comment on that, please? Yes, definitely. Actually, I was waiting for Peter to, to finish so I can make some comments on, on the discussion right now. So I definitely agree with uh, um, uh, uh, Mrina about the fact that there it seems that there's a lot of work being done on creating kind of like generalizable uh, policies at the low level for example reaching being able to reach robustly being able to grasp robustly and then there's uh, people doing a lot of research at more of the high level of like learning how to open a cabinet in general but there is a like there still is a gap in order like we should be able to inform the low level control policies uh, about kind of like that what the high level goal is such that we don't need that much data in order to make those low level control policies generalizable like they can just adapt if we if if we if we come up with control policies that have some sort of guarantees which is kind of like the work that i do that uh, for example have uh, stability convergence guarantees maybe we can bound the states based on uh based on exploration or or based on uh, uh failures then we could uh, we 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 could we, we basically don't need that much data to have like a very robust low level control policy. We could simply have the robot uh, try that policy, that nominal policy, and then adapt on the fly. Uh, but this is and uh, this is only achievable if we can introduce some sort of structure into in, into the control policies. I don't believe that just having millions of data like where like. It, it's obviously useful to have lots of data because then you can see a whole bunch of uh, different scenarios and then the policy can be learned like in this generalizable way. But when it comes to these policies, like uh, when it comes to these policies, like interacting in environments where the, where the human comes in and then just suddenly changes the, the task or changes the location of the objects or yeah, wants the robot to grab another object instead of the one that was it, it was initially re reaching for, those type of, of like adaptations at the task level, uh, uh, I think they 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 can be realizable with not just data but also introducing some sort of structure, which is kind of like what you mentioned, being like inductive bias. You know, like how can we like? Uh, I feel that we should kind of like convert towards like trying to bridge that uh, a gap between those two schools of thought of okay, we have a whole bunch of data, let's just learn a generalizable policy uh, 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 or having like a very parametric policy where we just learn the parameters. Uh, can we find something in the middle? Can we find something in the middle where, where, we, ex where we leverage the, the strength of all of these deep learning algorithms, but at the same time, we introduce laws of physics that we know as roboticists, like they're not gonna change, you know, like physics is not gonna change. Uh, the, the dynamics of an object is not gonna change. The robot is gonna move following the, the Euler-Lagrange equations. Like we know these, that, that these kind of like physical concepts are not gonna change unless we change, we move to another planet. But, but uh, 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 so yeah, I mean, I, I think there, there's a lot of exciting work in order to really uh, come up with these generalizable uh, um, uh, control policies. Because from my point of view, like one factor that a lot of people I feel like don't really uh, focus on is, is adaptation. Like how can we 
given, let's say that we learn the control policy on, on, uh, and in simulation with a whole bunch of different environments. Uh, but then when we, when we do it, when we apply it in the real world, then there's always this gap of, of, uh, uh, either the, the, the domain changed, the context changed, uh, and then what happens when the human is in the loop? Like, can the robot use those same policies that were learned in simulation or that were learned kind of like through autonomous exploration? Uh, how can they adapt like without having to like relearn or, or like having to ask the human for more data? Because I'm more of the school of thought of, let's try to learn uh, as much as possible with the least amount of data because we, the data comes from the human. So like, and, and I don't want my humans to be just giving hundreds of demonstrations. No, I just want to demonstrate it once. And, uh, and, and, and let's see if the robot can, uh, can, can, can do the task. And if it can't, then it, can, it should ask for help. It should ask for some sort of refinement. And, then, and, and all of that requires this kind of like introduction or injection of a bias based on structure and on the physics of the problem. All right, sounds great. So, um, speaking of structure or physics or dynamics, including those in the policy learning, so uh, this is this kind of brings up another topic that I wanted to discuss today. So it's one of the hot topic, I guess. Um, what would be the better form of, for example, model free versus model based? So I think some people might have a prior on model based, but other people are also saying about model free. So does anyone in this panelist have a preferences on one over the other? Or is there any insights that you would like to share? I mean, I, I think model free versus model based is not so much a matter of generalizability, which one's going to generalize better. It's a matter of how much data you have. So you know, you can use model free methods, and there's benefits to it. Um, if you have enough data, um, and, you know, model-based methods are about, I think, very much along the lines of what Nadia was saying, and I agree entirely, is, you know, you, use what you know, don't try to learn what you know. Um, if you have a model that's even an approximate model, use it to start and, and tune it based on experience. And, um, you know, not, not I, I, I think, Nadia, you said all the, the data comes from, from humans, and I think that's, that's some data comes from humans. You can also have data that comes from the robot, you know, exploring by itself and experimenting by itself. Um, and, you know, but, but yeah, to me, that's, that's the crux of model free versus model based is, you know, model based is much more data efficient, but at the expense of computation, um, and, you know, model free is, is much more computationally efficient at the expense of, of data in general. But I think both have the potential to, to generalize for different tasks. Okay. Yeah. I kind of agree. So. Yeah. yeah, I would definitely agree on that. I would second on both what Nadia and Peter has mentioned. Um, I do, you know, working in differentiable physics uh, for a few years, and I do want to say that um, certainly being able to utilize knowledges and model we already have would actually help accelerate the computation. And, you know, as someone who also been working in deep learning for uh, a few years now and but prior to that I was very much a simulation and physics person and I always believe that there is a role for simulation and in fact there is very much a role for simulation because we can capture all the data we want from the real world there is the cost of the expense uh, but there's also real physical world limitations you know and and so um, you know the idea of using only one versus the other I, I don't think it's a practical uh, approach. I think we, we would need to consider using, considering both approach and possibly even combine both approach going forward to the future. Um, and, but I do, I do totally agree. I think whenever we can use any information about a model, don't, don't throw away everything we, we already know. Uh, it, treat the model itself as a prior. And that's gonna help us tremendously in terms of overall computations and also not to mention saving the memory. <laughs> I mean, I think there are debates on this in, in you know, the, like um, game playing or, you know, where, where there's, you know, and then, you know, so Rich Sutton's, you know, his The Bitter Lesson and all of the, you know, all of these kinds of um, sort of uh, argue, you know, arguments or discussions about whether you should, you know, bias the models with any kind of, of human uh, information, but those only apply in the setting where you have tons and tons and tons of data. 
right? When, when in robots, on real robots, we're trying to learn in the real world. We're just, it's going to, you know, maybe eventually, maybe someday if, if, you know, everyday robot succeeds and there's, you know, a robot in everybody's house, um, and, you know, then, then, you know, we, we get, uh, uh, you know, then maybe there'll be enough data if we, if we can solve the privacy issues, um, to, to get all the things back and learn in a, a completely model free, uh, way without, you know, any, any biases. But I think, you know, for the foreseeable future, robotics is going to be heavily dependent on model, model based approaches because of, you know, it's just not a setting where you can get the kind of data you can get when you're playing Go or, um, you know, or like my, my team at Sony AI did on, you know, playing a, playing a PlayStation game, these kinds of things are, you know, tons and tons of data is available so you can afford to be model free. Yes. Yeah. So I think uh, Professor Xiaolong Wang also have can add on that because you have been working on a very challenging setup where you are manipulating observing the dexterous hands and then having the model of hands, but also have a very challenging setup for visual observation because it's highly complex and highly occluded. So can you please add on that? Right. Um, yeah, I think that's actually two questions. One is vision, one is the uh, model base. Um, so for the model base side, I definitely think model base has a very large potential, uh, but then what kinds of supervision we should use to train the model uh, is still a, a big problem. Um, so if you look at the current, uh, a, a lot proper approach, Jimmer, Jimmer V2, and then I think V3 is coming, uh, it's all based on pixel reconstruction uh, or learning like the, everything about the world. Um, so learning word model. Um, so I think, I'm not sure if that is the, the, the necessary, the, the right way to do uh, model base to learn the model. Um, using pixel reconstruction. So how and I actually recently have a paper that um, tried to use the reward to, to kind of learn the model. So essentially you don't do pixel reconstruction, but then you more focus on the task, on the important things that matter for the task, and then use those signals to, to learn the model. So you get rid of the low level details and everything backgrounds um, when you are learning the model. Um, of course, that limits the generalization. Um, so so the other way to solve this problem is to basically uh, use a lot of tasks and then and, and then basically uh, try to generalize from there. Um, so there are there are this problem as well. So I think it's interesting to think about like what kind of supervision um, we should do uh, use to to learn the model. I think Deepak might get, might can add later. Uh, maybe um, he works on a lot of self supervised work model and does it does he really believe in that I, I'm interested in know. Um, but on the second part, on the on the vision part, um, actually I want to jump back to like uh, like Min said that um, the, the image processing and, and, and adaptations and uh, on the vision is is very challenging. And I totally agree. Um, in the dexterous hand project, we, we did a lot of work on pose estimation, uh, hand pose, 60 pose. And then although there are so many people working on this area, um, they're all focused on the YCB object. But then it's that still does not work. When, once you change the table, you change the light a little bit, you change the camera angle a little bit, all the pre-trained YCV object model does not work. Um, so something needs to be there. Maybe we need to go beyond just this YCV objects um, to do this robotics experiment. Um, so so that's that's a lot. Uh, that's some challenge. And then I think um, right now we are also not connecting a lot of 3D perception to to the action. Um, so we are all doing from from 2D. Um, I think the many skill challenges is about this, uh, but then there's a lot of challenges there as well. Like for example, it's hard to sample the, the, the important point cloud. So when we are doing hands, we find that it's actually very hard to sample the, um, the, the, the points in the finger. There's so little points in the finger. So there are a lot of these practical challenge when you're doing the, with the real world. Uh, so we need to deal with simulation and real together. And then uh, we also need to connect everything end to end. So, so we need to true problem. Yeah, but maybe, yeah, so that's just some thoughts. Yeah. yeah, thank you very much. So I think you also brought a very important topic that everyone would have some comments on. So real world versus simulator. So uh, can I invite Daniel, I mean, Dan Face Sue? To talk about this, so yeah. So have actually, any... I have a yeah. yeah. I have a, some thoughts on kind of loop back to this theme of the workshop, which is skill learning uh, or generalized skill learning. 
and also related to the pri the things we talk about in terms of what to learn because there's a lot of prior available already to us for example we probably don't want to learn a navigation system when you, we have a capable slam system so i guess the question sort of the thing i want to bring up is the lessons from for example thomas driving domain because a lot of like the thomas driving domain has been like a kind of a become a systems research uh problem right like you have a whole stack of system you try to integrate everything together and they have the privilege of these sort of thing where you can define intermediate representations like funny boxes or trajectories and all this um and it is still a very very hard problem when you can bring a break things down into pieces and make them work in the real world. And it's actually even a harder problem in robotics for manipulation or, um, or, or mobile manipulation, because we don't have the privilege of defining interview representation. Like what people have mentioned before, uh, if you wanted to do different tasks like grasping or pouring water or we're pushing even pushing things you don't have the model for those things or you don't have intermediate representations for these so um so i guess the question i, I want to bring up or like the point i want to bring up is that this problem of intermediate representation or representation that you can use to glue things together learn part and probably like the things that you have model for like you have some good models of kinematics well we have good very good kinematics model or even dynamics model for some of these tasks um, but for other ta for other problems, we don't like we need to learn a models. But what 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 do you connect these things with, and what do you connect the skills? How do you connect skills that use different types of models together to form a larger system? So I guess from the system perspective, I guess what to learn and how to learn them, and maybe that can inform us of how to collect what data to collect and what what data to annotate or extract. So I'm just trying to say, like, the skill learning is not, I don't, I don't think it's an independent problem. It's, it's part of the broader system where you need to think about the representations and what data to inform the representations based on. Right, so representation is a hard one. So I guess some people just use image as it is. Some people use 3D representation. Some people use other abstract and yeah, but the problem is that different ta each different task require right. a different uh, mm -hmm. representation. And if we want to actually have IVD robots, what, what should we do? Right. Mm -hmm. I don't know if people have thoughts about this. Or... I would like to uh, go back to the original question of model free or model based. It seems like everybody suddenly converged to model based being the right thing to do. And model <laughs> is already out of the picture. Uh, <laughs> And although I do a lot of model based things, I would still make a case that the answer is not so black and white, uh, right? If like for learning skills, like doing one task really, really well, let's say walking, we have found that model free things are, are there's no issue with that. If you can train them, uh, let's say in simulation or somewhere, uh, model free methods actually work really well. And do you really go about building a model of like which terrain will you ever encounter? Like if I go to riverbed, if I go to stairs, if I go to oily surface, if I go to whatever, like will I make model that works in every such scenario? Or I just go by model free way and say, okay, how many, uh, how many ways can I fall? How many ways can I interact with, with the, the surrounding? In this setting, for instance, like uh, we have found that in the work like RMA, which is rapid motor adaptation, where we had these walking robots walking in several different terrains. Model free methods work really well uh, if you can train them in simulation. And in not just our lab, even Marco Tur's lab from ETH, uh, they have similar results and they also use model free methods because the task is consistent. The task is only one, let's just walk, right? So in my belief, uh, if you divide the task into this low level scale of like actually dealing with contexts and high level scale, what to do? I think model base is probably the right abstraction for the high level thing. Oh, if I see something, I should go there. If I do this, if I, I should roughly interact here. But the low level skill, I mean, there is no reason to, to say that this is data efficient even in nature. Like locomotion evolved for the first 3 billion years, uh, then hand took uh, several million years. And the last abstraction of this reasoning, it just like 30,000 years, 100,000 years, like very, very little compared to the long time we spend learning these low level skills. 
So uh, whether model free or model based, I think it really depends on which setting uh, are we trying to do. Um, and uh, yeah, so, so I, I think the black picture is not so black and white that oh, we should jump to model based or jump to model free. I think it really depends like at what level of abstraction we are thinking it. I think yeah, the problem is actual, actually like there's a single task called walk or move to a target location, right? It's like playing Go, win a game. So if we can define a task at that level, I think it's sufficient to give a lot of data. And also we have simulators for, for these kind of things. But once you start dealing with different objects and different part of the sub, even, even if you have different objects, tasks, like your yeah. fingers, the way your fingers are touching different objects. Like if I take this, pick this up, I'm sure a lot of things are shared between all these tasks. Like this is almost like, I think the analogy I give in my group sometimes is a joke that uh, legs on the ground, like uh, on hills, on riverbed, on oil surface, it's almost like fingers on different objects. Uh, it's just a matter of magnitude. Like you have way more touch in this, maybe less touch in, in, in the legs, but it's almost like same kind of interaction. Like, so I think this notion of discrete task, or oh, this is picking, this is that, that really limits us from getting access to this high scale of shareability, which we have at the low level, at the lowest level. They, everything is shared. Like how my finger touches this, that, for different tasks, it's very shared across all of things. Uh, uh, yeah, I know Peter was going to say something. If I'd like. um, yeah, well, I, I was just gonna say, I don't just emphasize, I, I agree with you that, that model free, um, you know, like I said at the start, it's, you know, if you have enough data, you can, you know, it is a possibility to do that. And I think like, you know, Dante's saying in simulation, if the simulation is good enough, or if you have good sim to real methods, and then, you know, you can, you can go model free. But, but again, I still think, um, you know, Nadia's point that, that, um, that we shouldn't, we shouldn't make the robot learn what we already know. That, that's the, what's, what's most important from my perspective. And we do know a lot about how to model the, the physical world. Um, you know, and that, that is different from, from, you know, like there are in, in things like Go or something like that, there, there are some things that, that are, that are known, but it's, you know, it's more likely that there's, you know, that there's been a lot of human biases that, 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 you know, and that starting from scratch could, could discover, um, completely, you know, uh, new strategies of doing things, but, you know, physics is physics, as, as not you said, and I think those, you know, so, so I think there's, there's, you know, there's this combination. Our simulators that are that are generating the the, the model free data are a model in, in some sense. Um, so it's yeah, in, in that like sense, just, there's a model. There. Just a disclaimer, like I, I'm supporting model free only because no one else was supporting. Eighty percent of yeah. my work <laughs> is getting models. <laughs> so and I and I'm getting, I, I I actually do a lot of model free work too. Just you know, yeah, yeah. for robots, I find you know in particular. Um, you know, model base tends to be much more required. So maybe I should chime in here in support of model free, right? Um, I, so I agree with everyone that says that, you know, physics is, you know, we know the laws of physics, we should definitely make use of them. But I think um, the challenge in that for me is like, we're kind of ignoring the, the state estimation or perception and, and state modeling part of it, right? And so like, Yes, I would love to use physics, but that means that for every object, you know, if it's a rigid object, I need like a perfect six star pose and maybe some uncertainty and stuff like that. And like, that can be hard to get. Um, there's other objects that are not rigid. And so like, I think I can take an example from a real life task that we do, which is like sorting waste into recycle, compost and trash, right? And you have to deal with a lot of like crumpled wrappers and paper and like all kinds of messy stuff, right? And um, I don't know, like, how, how would we, you know, you, like, one is, like, even modeling the physics for that is hard, like, estimating the state of that, you know, using some other system is also hard, and so I think maybe this also touches upon the intermediate representation issue uh, that was brought up, right, it's like, you know, how can we represent this in a model, right, like, for, for any object, right, because we are talking about generalizability, and so, our robots, like they need to sort whatever trash people put in, right? That's, we don't really have a choice on what kind of objects we have to deal with. Um, so those are the things that I think make it hard to, to be fully model-based for us. So I, I totally agree 
I think um, I, I don't want to make it sound like I'm only pushing for a model-based approach. I think both model-based and model-free approaches have their place. Um, but I was just saying that, uh, you know, in agreeing with Nadia, that whenever it's possible to use model-based approach, there are certain advantages because you can compute with less, right? And, and we are not talking about this, but as somebody who actually worked for Amazon, these energy consumption, memory consumptions are real problem when you are pushing out a product. And, and we're coming, we're talking about a company that sell, you know, that, that, that's, that service the world through AWS, right? And so compute is not free. Um, so we need to think, you know, sort of what is a reasonable approach to minimize the compute? I think this is going to come back to 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 be an issue uh, in the upcoming year is energy consumption of all the learning based algorithm right and it's not just energy consumption but memory consumption um so that's one but um but i do also want to say even this example about classifying and binning trash where to throw there is a model for that too it's called model matching <laughs> right you you match the piece of of object that you want to recycle. So the, 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 I think that the idea of model, it, it can go beyond physics. It can be other kind of rule-based. Um, so, so I think we, we should think much broadly in terms of what, what it means, it's model-based and versus model-free. But I do think that, you know, there are approaches that are completely model-free that works really well. One of the example in motion planning is this randomized sampling, right? And Hey, it's model free. It works really, really well. Um, and, and so, but, but then when people start adding other kind of constraints, it seems to help accelerate the computation of random sampling. So that just, just, you know, just something to kind of think about. Um, and I don't think we should shut the door on anything. I think we just need to be open-minded about when to use what that, that would serve the purpose the best. Um, I, I would say that we should always use both of them. For every task, for, the, for, for, the, for every task, you break it in a way that first part is model based and the remaining part is model free. I mean, towards the very, very end. Like if you go about solving, okay, pick up trash, open drawer, and if you train model free methods for them from scratch, that's also really hard. If they don't generalize. If you change the door knob slightly, it just fails. First, it takes millions of samples. But if you roughly know that, okay, for going to door knob, you use model based. And then at the very end, where things can be shared, like very, very low level scale, then you want to free. Um, I think this. I this think even for, for the lack like, local motion, I mean, I also did model free there, but I feel like recently some experiments we did also feels like model base are also very, very strong there. So probably it's not just model free also for. Oh, I, I agree, but like the, the argument, like let's say that this gives model based model free usually is that model based are very simple efficient and want to come to model free. Like that's what the usual argument is. But how simple efficient they are, like probably they are 10x simple efficient or 100x. But, right, but, things, but I think things are in billion idea. samples, right? Like things are in billion, million samples. If you cut, it, cut 10x, 100x, doesn't really change anything uh, because we can not do neither of them in the real world. So, uh, like, right, even though. I'm yeah. I think I'm not arguing the, the sample efficiency also is like the, the robustness and, and like and this kind of thing um, is also very strong baseline. Like like I think if we really do MPC good, like for the local motion thing, um, mm -hmm. the transfer and then the terrains and things that you can handle the real robot is also very, very impressive. So so I, I don't I think we should not just also make decision there, like model free will solve everything there. Uh, no, I, 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 I am yeah. agreeing with that, but I think I'm not saying that we should make a decision about right. either of them, but I'm saying if both of them take a lot of samples, uh, uh -huh. right, uh, like maybe in order of millions, why is this even, does this even matter? If, if both of them are really, really sample and efficient, unless like what Nadia is saying, it's like, oh, you come to tens of samples or hundreds of samples. With model based, then it makes sense. But if you look at all the current model based methods in learning, they will still take hundred thousand samples on, uh, on 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 DM control, <laughs> and model free take million. So personally, I don't see the the benefit of either or choosing right. or make a, choosing either of them. Right? Uh, um, 
Yeah, unless you go to Nadia's thing and make make that work or make like 10 samples, 20 samples, then it makes sense and everything should be model based. But if it's a matter of 100,000 versus million, I think they are both similarly bad. Sure. Uh, I, I agree. I agree with you. And, and I'm not fully against model free, not at all. I mean, I think like there are like really amazing works that have used model free methods, like you mentioned, like for walking, like quadrupeds and stuff like that. But one thing, like, I feel like it's difficult, like if the task is specified correctly, then model free methods are going to be that are, are, are going to be very like uh, performing very well. So that this kind of like comes back to like the task specification problem. Uh, and that problem also uh, is connected to model, like it doesn't matter if it's model free or model based. Uh, it really depends on like how you specify the task, like what's the objective, what's the goal, uh, how, how the engineer or how the human translates that task uh, the, the, the basically what the high level goal is or, or will, will you give like the sub goals like that, that's really kind of like, uh, like important, I think as well, because like if the, the task is specified correctly or like, uh, that, then any of these methods will, will work. Maybe model free methods will even, uh, have, uh, a more, you know, like, uh, exploration, uh, in the state space. But, uh, and I think that's something also related to the representation that Dan Faye said, like, uh, like what's the appropriate representation and, and how can we use that to specify the task correctly such that, that we can then uh, basically have kind of like a, a, an efficient uh, learning scheme. So I also want to join a little bit. I, I think that there's an interesting question about like uh, when round into model from model this. So which one gives better reusability of what has been learned? I think that this is actually an important question. Just like for model based, assume that the, the, the emeritus are for some ability to understand the world and model the world, right? It will be like a transferable to new situations. On the other hand, if the completely novel world, then like a building a new model itself needs to acquire a lot of new data. And for model free, I also feel like there are some kind of transferability, especially if you're entering a new world. And, and that's a key study you really do not know what a proper model is probably just a try <laughs> so just a try <laughs> just a to try the error and through trying the error and building your model i feel like they both have their their will of reusing past experiences and probably this is something that they can think of either like you know in a, in a way like called pre-training or like a, in a way that's called like continuous learning <laughs> Yes, so I, I was just sitting back and enjoying what the kind of discussions they are going on. And yeah, it's very interesting. And um, I think we are about to finish, but let me just bring up another one more topic to discuss that I really wanted to touch. So what would be the future for simulator for more generalizable policy learning? So there is an issue of safety and also um, having a sample efficiency and also what kind of um, uh, reward we want to form and that really well everything is integrated and that also brings down to what kind of data we really want and how can we make it more generalizable or transferable to the real world so if is there anyone who wants to comment on that or was it too abrupt of the change of the topic <laughs> All right, um, then can Nadia, can you please comment on safety issue when we are like doing human robot uh, co collaboration or any other of the research that you've been working on? Yeah, sure. So um, actually to, to solve some of the safety problems, I use machine learning for that. So basically I use uh, learning methods to kind of like learn what the bounds are, for example, in the joint configuration of a multi robot system. Uh, and then use that, 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 that model that can be the, like that machine learning technique. It could be a support vector machine. It could be neural network. We, we, if it's differentiable, we have the gradient so we can introduce it, inject it directly into a, a reactive con control scheme, like, uh, like repulsive, uh, uh, forces or in inverse kinematics. Um, so, uh, that, and, and that work is really interesting because I basically learned kind of like these constraints, I learned the constraints 
manifold like in 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 simulation uh and uh and and then i i apply and i use it like in in real world like experiments that the robot doesn't uh um doesn't uh collide with itself like or with uh, with the uh, with, with the with the environment um so another type of work that i've been doing is uh given for example uh, a couple of demonstrations we can learn this kind of like vector field that represents the trajectory like of the of, of like a low level control policy of following a certain trajectory uh, going to a target reaching uh, things like that uh, and that that can be learned from like one or two demonstrations from uh, from from the human uh, but what I've seen is that, uh, and what's cool about these methods is that uh, since they have some sort of like stability and convergence guarantees, if the robot is perturbed, which are kind of like the, the type of uh, uh, experiments that are really focus on like the, the human is the robot, the human teaches the robot a task, and then the robot is doing the task, and then the human just comes in and grabs the robot and say, oh, I don't want you to grab this object, grab this other one. Uh, and the and the robot and the and, and the robot can allow that perturbation and then just continue on with the, with the task that, that it learned before. And you can do that by 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 model by using learning these control policies that way. Uh, but what I found is that uh, because we don't because we only learn from like one or two demonstrations, and the, these are the optimal or like the let's say the positive demonstrations. If the robot is perturbed in regions in the state space where we haven't seen data before, those might be failure states or th those might make the robot fail the task. For example, if the task is for the robot to transport uh, uh, food on a spoon and what we're learning is basically simply the trajectory of going from here to here, uh, but we're not grounding kind of like that high level task of what, what the robot has to do is actually not just follow those trajectories, but also transport this uh, the, the, this object uh, and if, if 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 the and the factor is perturbed for example if it's changing in the orientation uh, that was never seen in a demonstration and even with a control policy that has some sort of stability guarantees uh, it you you can't really like uh, you can't do anything about it but uh, just learn from that failure uh, so what I'm some of the research that I'm that I'm doing right now is how to introduce those failure states or how to bound kind of like the state space of these low level control policies uh, with uh, certificates, with control barrier functions, with kind of like modulations where you learn what this, uh, let's say the, the, feasi the feasible regions in the state space of this demonstration of, the, of these trajectories are. And, uh, and, that, and, that, and that also transfers to kind of like uh, safety in the sense like if, if we can learn efficiently these bounds in the state space and these bounds can also be used for collision avoidance for example in an environment if you just have a a, a 3d point cloud and then you basically use that 3d point cloud to to create this uh, uh, differentiable function that represents the bound in the state space and then you input that into these uh, reactive control policies all right thank you thank you very much and yes yeah, so i think we are kind of reaching to the end of this panel discussion and i really love the hot topics the discussion became suddenly very active and it was very interesting to watch and there are many topics to think about and before we part i just wanted to add my personal note that i really love all of your research and we would like to i would like to meet you in person in near future in one of the conferences not in the virtual platform so we can chat more freely and more personally Right. Are you coming to ACRA? Uh, I can, but it, I think many of you should be. Well, I will be. I will be here. here. <laughs> I think be here. <laughs> yeah. Now we are getting more in-person conferences, which is quite exciting. Yeah. Yeah. And thank you very much for all the time and then wonderful discussion. And let let's discuss in person in the near future. Thank you so much. Hi everyone, my name is Zhu Tian, and I'm excited to share with you how my lab mate Aiden and I approached the Many Skill Challenge, No Restriction Track, and share what we learned from the experience. First, I'd like to thank the Many Skill team for providing this testbed for manipulation policies and for bringing together researchers in RL, CV, and robotics to approach the topic of generalizable policies. Aiden and I were pretty excited about the four tasks here because it will be really helpful to get our robots in the lab to perform them. I mean, this Kinova Movo robot 
costs 150k US dollars. It can definitely do more when it's not laboring for experiments or demos. If it can push off its chairs and move buckets, aren't they the same as picking up my lunch delivery from the lobby? Jokes aside, I do, we do want general purpose robots to assist our elderly at home, patients in hospitals, help with delivery at restaurants and hotels, and especially in dangerous situations like the lockdown right now in Shanghai due to Omicron. There are a lot of challenges in developing generalizable policies. First, we are given a diverse set of objects. Some chairs may be too heavy for our best performing policy to push to the target before timeout. For some buckets, the most robust pickup primitive would be grasping with two grippers on the rim, while for others, the best would be hugging them with two arms. So the policies we tuned for training objects might not perform as well on the unseen test objects. The second challenge is partial observability. We sometimes only see one side of the chair, so the estimate of the chair center would also lie on that side, resulting in the robot waiting at the wrong final configuration, thinking that it has already achieved the goal. A third difficulty is the limited time steps allowed in the policy evaluation. Each task must be completed within 200 control time steps, which equals to only two seconds of simulation time. So if we are to implement a policy that opens a door like humans do, even though we may compute the arm trajectory using motion planning, we don't have nearly enough time to follow the path exactly with PID controllers. Even for the simple goal of moving to one configuration computed from inverse kinematics, we often have to trade accuracy for time. Despite the difficulties in perception and control, we took a robotics approach by splitting up the problem into point cloud processing and stage-dependent position or velocity control. At the heart of our pipeline is a task-specific strategy represented in a state machine. Point clouds are processed for estimating object attributes and poses, which are used to compute target and defector poses and determine the stage of policy. One stage may be controlling the arm to reach the target configuration or move the base along a target direction. Inverse kinematics is used to find joint positions and PID controllers are used to convert desired joint, desired joint positions into desired joint velocities. Next, we will dive into each of the modules. We identify the following object attributes that are important for each task. We care about handles and rims for sampling grass poses in the Cartesian space. We care about the location of the door hinge and whether it opens to the left or right to compute intermediate grip poses. We also care about the center of the chair base so we can compute the base configuration to stop pushing. For doors and drawers, we use the handle points to find antipodal grip poses that avoids collision with the cabinet. We merge the segmented handle points in the first few time steps because sometimes the points in the first step are too sparse or noisy. This is a video showing the accumulation of points. For the chair pushing tasks, we extract the chair from the point cloud, then find the center point of the chair using principal components analysis. Because of the uh, partial observations, we found that using PCA is much more accurate than taking the mean of the chair points. For the move bucket task, we first filter out only points on the rim of the bucket so we know if it's thin enough for gripper grabs and where to grasp. To do this, we use a ransom lag algorithm to find the best fitting circle to the rim. We sample antipodal grasps on the rim and select pairs of it that are far apart enough to be grasped by two grippers. Next, I'll talk about task specific strategies. Here is a video of our cabinet drawer policy. It checks if the handle is in grasp, and if it isn't, it attempts to regrasp with a different grasp pose. For cabinet door task, we experimented with two policies. The first was to directly open the door by pulling in a circular gripper trajectory, but the time constraint limited the number of intermediate gripper poses we could select, result in a low ac overall accuracy. The second was to open the door slightly by pulling straight and then push the door open using uh, the mobile base. We call this the booty move which by the way is our worst policy in, in evaluation because there are too many stages, there's many opportunities for failure, such as lo losing the grasp or not pull open enough before releasing the grasp 
accidentally slapping the door closed during base motion, or butt kicking the door at the wrong position, resulting in either being stuck at the door handle of the other door or missing the handle entirely. In retrospect, we should have used the gripper pushing strategy because it's simpler, thus must be faster to carry out, thus less sacrifice in control accuracy for execution time. The stages for pushing the chair involves going behind the chair, facing it in a direction towards the target, then hugging it by decreasing the angles of three joints on both arms. But that's not enough. When it's, enough, cl it's close enough to a target, it will continue nudging it and waits until the task is successful, as seen in this example. We have two strategies for moving buckets. The first was to pick the bucket up using two grippers, and the second was to hug the bucket to lift it onto the platform. While the prehensile bucket picking policy had a much higher success rate, it failed on buckets with too wide a rim to be grasped. So we end up submitting the hybrid policy where we first check if the rim is too thick for gripper grasps. Here are our results on the final evaluation. As you can see, we outperformed the baselines by a large margin. Contrary to the learning methods, our method has less discrepancy between testing and training scores. We achieved almost perfect scores for opening drawers and similar good scores for pushing chairs. Why are there still some discrepancy for opening doors and moving buckets? We think it's because the control parameters and heuristic stretch holes we tuned for the training objects aren't fitted for those in the test objects. Here are our some common failure cases for our policies. For example, we might not manage to grasp it stably before timeout. We might put the bucket at an unstable position, or we might be pushing too slow to get the chair on time. To demonstrate the generalizability of our drawer opening policy, we tested it on a real robot with real noisy point cloud inputs with the handles marked by a red duct tape. Thank you for listening. I'm happy to join discussions and answer any questions. Hello, everyone. My name is Kun Wu. Today, I'm going to give a presentation about our work, a minimalist ensemble method for generalizable offline deep reinforcement learning. Uh, here is the outline. Uh, first, I will introduce the background and the benchmark we will focus on. Uh, the deep reinforcement learning has achieved impressive results on many applications, such as robotics and uh, autonomous driving. However, there are limitations of the existing uh, DIL method. The first one is that they usually require massive active interactions with the environment but uh, it's usually not uh, practical in, uh, in many real-world scenarios. Uh, also, many methods use the training environment as the evaluation environments, so which uh, leads to the negligence of the generalization ability of the agent. So, uh, to fulfill the potential of DRL, an ideal policy should have the ability to learn from a previously collected dataset without additional interactions, uh, which is the same goal of the uh, offline DIL. And the second one is the generalization ability for the unseen scenarios and objects uh, in the testing environments. Peng Zhou Mu and uh, his team proposed the seven manipulation scale benchmark and organized the uh, many scale challenge. Uh, in this paper, we focus on the no interaction track in the many scale challenge. Uh, in this chart, there are four different tasks, and uh, for each task, uh, there are only one set of fixed uh, expert demonstrations can be used for, for training. And uh, there is no more uh, additional interactions with the environments. For evaluating the generalization ability of the agent, there are unseen objects and new scenarios in the testing environments. Uh, now we uh, now I will introduce our method. Uh, notice the letter uh, the demonstrations are from experts. So uh, we propose a mini minimalist uh, ensemble 
imitation learning based method. Uh, the picture right side is the overview of uh, of our methods, and uh, we use uh, both strapping sampling technique to generate many different datasets and train a bundle of robust agents independently. And for each agent, we we only make some simple modifications on uh, network architectures and hyperparameters turning. And we also propose a method for feature uh, diversity improvements. Uh, finally, we combine all the agents as an ensemble model and take the average actions as the result. Uh, for each single agent, uh, we use the same backbone network pro uh, provided by the many scale challenge. Uh, we directly train the point net plus uh, transformer using behavior cloning. And since the demonstration are optimal, we, uh, we, we use a large batch size to learn a conservative model, uh, fitting on the successful demonstrations and uh, reduce the company error. And we also add uh, two dropout layers to mitigate the overfitting problems uh, and make the model more robust. Uh, for ensemble modeling, uh, we firstly use uh, both strapping to generate different subdata sets to increase data diversity. And then we also uh, generate orthogonal basis rendering to increase the feature diversity. Here, the picture right side is the process of the feature diversity improvement. Uh, firstly, we uh, we sample a real symmetric matrix AJ from the uh, uniform distribution. Uh, here, the J is the index of the single agent. And, and then we produce the orthogonal basis BJ uh, consisting of the eigenvectors of AJ. And then we can uh, get the, the diverse new features FJ by multiplying the global feature GJ uh, with the basis BJ. Here we report the result on the many scale change leaderboard. Uh, the table one shows the success rate on the no interaction track of the many scale challenge. The, the final scores are the mean success rate of all four tasks in both the training and the testing environments. And uh, uh, from this table, we can observe that uh, except uh, for the first team, our result outperformed other teams by a large margin in most uh, environments. And we also uh, built extensive ablation studies on the local training environments. Uh, here, the table two shows the ablation studies on the batch size B and the dropout D in terms of the success rate. Uh, for the task uh, draw, we can observe that uh, the success rate increase, increased as the batch size increased. And uh, uh, when we uh, fix the batch size, the dropout layer can also improve the performance. And uh, here, the table three shows the ablation studies on base agent number M and the feature diversity improvement F. And also for the task drawer, as the number of the agent increased from one to 20, uh, we can see the success rate increased by a large margin. And when we also fix the agent number, we can observe that the feature diversity improvement can also improve the, uh, the success rate. And finally, uh, please allow me to recap our work. Uh, given the expert demonstrations, we propose a minimalist ensemble method to enhance the generalization ability of the model. And then we use a large batch size and drop out regularization to train a robust single agent. We also use both strapping sampling and randomly generated orthogonal basis to increase the uh, 
diversity of the all agents. And the result uh, on the no interaction track of the many scale challenge and our uh, local ablation studies uh, demonstrated the effectiveness of our methods. And I hope our work has uh, given you some insight for the generalizable offline deep reinforcement learning. And uh, thank you very much. Hello everyone, we are presenting our paper Sync to Lab to Real, Safe Reinforcement Learning with Shielding and Generalization Guarantees. I'm Kai Jie. And I'm Alan. 
Uh, in this work, uh, we aim to address the same two real gap, disparities in robots' performance and safety when we transfer policies trained in simulation uh, to real environments. We consider vision-based indoor navigation task. In simulation, uh, the simulator is fast and paralyzable, uh, and there's no concern for safety. In real, uh, we often have constraints on hardware, and safety is needed. This opens up the need for sim to real transfer. The major question we ask is, can we bridge the gap safely? Motivated by the conventional engineering practice, we propose a middle-level training, which we call lab. The goal of a lab training includes fine-tuning more realistic conditions and certify agents' performance and safety. Overall, uh, we call our framework uh, sim to lab to real. In our framework, uh, we first train in simulation using diverse environments and conditions. Then, in the lab stage, we fine-tune the policy safely in more specific and realistic conditions. Finally, we deploy the policies in real environments with performance and safety guarantees. In sync to lab transfer, we train the policy to be safety aware, minimizing number of safety violations in lab. In lab to real transfer, we train the policy to be probabilistically safe in terms of strengthening to unseen environments in real. Here we show our in, uh, overview of our training setup and pipeline. First, we pre-train diverse safety-aware policies in simulator. We explicitly handle safety by adding a wrapper around any performance policy to shield unsafe actions. We will talk about how to shield and when to shield in later slides. We then fix safety-aware policy in the lab training and start to learn the policy later distribution. Using the information from these two stages, we can certify the safety and performance before deployment in the real world. Let's first look at how to train the safety where do policy in simulation. Our safety module relies heavily on Hamilton Jacobi safety analysis. The value function represents the maximum cost along the trajectory. For example, the cost can be assigned distance function to obstacles. On the other hand, Conventional safe IL trains a discounted sum of binary costs. We train the safety value function and the policy end-to-end -end from RGB images. These are the safety value functions we obtain uh, compared to a conventional safe IL. Our advantages include uh, we learn from dense distance signals, so we observe that reachability-based IL better recovers the unsafe zone and it reduces a great number of safety violations in the later training stage and the real deployment. In addition, we learn from near defeat, but risk-based IL can only learn uh, when it fails. Once we get the safety queue function and the backup policy, we can apply shielding to make our policy distribution safety aware. This is an environment we have obstacles showing pink and a yellow gold region. We first sample a latent variable Li1 from the latent distribution and the performance policy maps observations to actions conditioned on this latent variable. If we don't add any safety treatment, the performance policy leads to a collision. Instead, we let the safety module monitor the actions proposed by the performance policy. Let's look at the candidate action at this moment. We have a shielding classifier, which is based on the safety queue function. It takes in the current observation and the candidate action and check if the safety cost is above the threshold. If the safety cost is above the threshold, then it thinks that even if we follow the backup policy for the rest of the time, the robots will eventually hit the obstacle. Instead of executing the action from the performance policy, we apply the action from the backup policy. By using the shielding, the robot can reach the goal safely. We can also sample a different latent variable from the distribution and that results in a different and safe trajectory to the goal. Now, we complete the training of the safety aware due policy. Next, uh, in the lab training, we fix the due policy and fine tune the policy distribution to adapt to realistic conditions. We also leverage generalization bound to obtain probabilistically safe policy. In simulation training, uh, we train using diverse environments to obtain the prior policy distribution, P0. For example, it corresponds to different trajectories around the obstacles. Now we consider more specific conditions, D, a distribution of such environments. Suppose we have a, training, a set of training environments S 
uh, green dots here. And then we use them to train the pursued policy distribution P. We also define RSP as a training reward averaged over S. The goal of our work is to maximize the test reward in expectation over unseen environments from D. Previous work in pack-based control provides such a guarantee that the true expected reward can be lower bounded by the training reward minus some regularizer between the prior and posterior. Thus, in lab training, we fine-tune the policy distribution to maximize the bound. During lab training, we always apply shielding to minimize the number of safety violations. After lab training, we certify the dual policy by computing the generalization bound. Now we have finished the two, the two training stages. With minimizing the generalization bound in lab training, we obtain safety dual policy that probabilistically generalizes to, generalizes to unseen real environments, which is then deployed in real environments with, with confidence. Here, we show the two types of simulated and realistic indoor environments used in, in, in experiments. We call the first one vanilla, where cylindrical and rectangular obstacles of different dimensions and poses are randomly placed in undecorated rooms. Next, we have advanced, where we place realistic furniture model from the 3D front data set in rooms. In sim training, we randomize the layout. In lab training, we use professionally designed room layouts from the data set. We also perform lab to real transfer in this setting. For Molina environments, we also consider different dynamics and test requirements in lab stages, such as the velocity range of the robot or the conditions for reaching the goal. In advanced environments, we have some sample room layouts for SIN and lab trainings. We compare our algorithms with baselines such as pack based control, conventional RL, and safe RL. The major difference lies in the safety treatment. Our framework proposes having a separate safety wrapper with reachability based RL, while other works add penalty to reward, use risk based monitor, or don't handle safety explicitly. Another highlight of this framework is we are able to give performance and safety certificates after the training. And these are the metrics we used uh, to evaluate experiment results. We first want to answer the question, if our framework has lower safety violations during lab training, we can see our methods all, performs by a all perform other methods by a large margin. And we want to point out the risk-based safety monitor does not make a notable difference here. We think this is because the unsafe region they recover is too thin, so the backup policy cannot react in time. Next, let's look at how they perform in the unseen environments. Methods that explicitly handling safety have less than number of safety uh, failed trials. Among those, our methods have the least. We also evaluate how important the two stages are. If we pretend the policy in a thin stage, we can reduce about 60% of violations in the lab training. This is because the safety module can override the unsafe actions right away from the beginning of the training. With lab training, we can reduce about 60% of unsuccessful trials since we fine tune the policy to adapt to specific realistic conditions. Next, uh, we show the results of lab to real transfer. We performed 30 trials of real experiments in 10 different indoor environments, as shown on the left here. The robot needs to navigate around furniture without collision using RGB observations. Our method improved the safety generalization bound by a large margin over previous pack based methods and also achieved the best safety in unseen environments, in simulation, and in real. As a summary, we combine Hamilton Jacobi reachability analysis and the pack based theory in a two stage training to provide theoretical safety guarantees and improve empirical safety in vision based indoor navigation tasks. More content can be found on our project website. You can scan this QR code, and we are happy to answer your questions in the poster session. Thank you. Hello everyone, I'm Xuan from Columbia University. Uh, today I'm going to talk about iterative residual policy for generalizable dynamic manipulation of deformable objects. Mm. 
So the topic for today's workshop is on generalizable policy learning in physical world. And I think a question that's really central to this workshop is what does a policy actually need to learn in order to support physical interactions in real world? And I think if you ask this question to different people, you'll get very different answers because fundamentally the answer to this question really depends on what kind of physical interactions we are considering and also what kind of objects you actually want your system to interact with. So for example, for different uh, for interaction types, if we only consider um, the type of interaction like quasi-static interactions, such as uh, this kind of slow pick and place or pushing an object very slowly, then the object's motion um, under this kind of interaction is primarily influenced by the robot's action instead of objects' physical properties. So what that means is that the policy only needs to kind of understand the object's 3D geometry um, in order to properly interact it, but does not really need to worry about other physical properties about objects. However, if we start to consider dynamic interactions, uh, such as sliding the objects on a, on a table or even tossing the objects uh, into like faraway bins, then under those kind of interaction types, then the object's motion is starting to be influenced by both uh, the action and also the object's physical properties. So for example, the object's friction or center of mass will basically determine the uh, tri uh, projectile trajectories if you toss the objects. So in this kind of uh, scenarios or cases, uh, the same action will actually uh, have result in different effects if the object has uh, different physical properties. And uh, therefore, it will require the system to explicitly or implicitly understand those properties in order to properly execute action. And uh, similarly, on the other dimension, uh, the, the policy also needs to have a different level of understanding about objects depends on the type of objects you need to interact with. Right? So in the earlier example that we show all the videos, we only kind of uh, considering rigid objects. However, uh, deformable objects often has much more complex dynamics due to their extremely high degree of freedom and also under attribution. Uh, and also at the same time, a deformable object's uh, physical property are often de de uh, described or defined by many, uh, those, by many of those kind of very hard to measure parameters, such as nonlinear stiffness or density distributions which makes it even harder for the system to estimate or understand uh, those kind of parameters and in order to uh, infer the proper actions to interact with it. So with this context, uh, today's talk actually kind of fall into the extreme of both dimensions, where we uh, primarily consider dynamic manipulation of undeformable objects which will really require the learning algorithm or the policy uh, to reason about all those kind of hard to measure physical properties in order to accurately accomplish the task. And on top of that, we're also going to add one more requirement, uh, which is process goal conditions. So here are two example tasks that fall into the categories of goal conditions dynamic manipulation uh, in the context of deformable objects. So for example, in the first video, which uh, is trying to, we are trying to hit a goal location with a, uh, with the tip of a whip. Uh, and in the second example is we try to reach a goal configuration uh, of a, 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 a class defined by the key point locations on the class. So in both uh, tasks, the goal condition is defined by the target key point configurations, uh, where the key point is either the tip of the uh, whip or the uh, corners or edges on the class. And since the target uh, configuration are actually very far uh, away from the system's uh, maximum reach range, so it actually requires the system to use dynamic actions in order to um, really reach those configurations, which means that um, just actions like pick and place will not be able to um, enable the system to reach to those goal conditions. So in fact, uh, this kind of dynamic manipulation task for deformable objects is even very challenging for human. Right, so given a new rope, we are actually very unlikely to be able to hit the goal uh, location in the first try. Uh, and but the good thing is that after a few attempts, we are often able to able uh, to get closer and closer to the goal and eventually hit the goal. So what do we learn during this process of um, different attempts? So 
the question, um, I think this is also related to the question, so what does the policy need to learn in order to do this very complex task? Right. So if we think about what we did in this process, um, did we really try to learn the prediction of full trajectory from different action? Um, I think probably not, uh, at least I cannot do that. And or do we kind of try to explicitly learn the different physical parameters of the rope, like uh, its nonlinear densities? I guess probably not either. So instead, what we really rely on in order to ref, uh, refine our action is basically a good intuition, or we can call it a prior knowledge, about how we can adjust our action in order to affect the, uh, the trajectory or the, um, the rope trajectory. Right, so for example, we know that uh, if we can swing harder on the rope, then it's more likely to get the rope go higher. And uh, also at the same time, if we're able to extend our arm more, then we will let the rope reach further. So what we are going to do is we're going to rely on this kind of intuition in order to adjust our action iteratively in order to get closer and closer to the goal. So in this work, uh, we call this intuition residual dynamics. And the, our hypothesis is that uh, the knowledge about the change um, in terms of how much we change the action will change the effect on the trajectory uh, is much easier to learn. And also this kind of intuition is much easier to transfer uh, to different ropes with different uh, physical parameters. Yeah, so this is the summary of our hypothesis. The knowledge about the change is much more generalizable to different ropes and uh, uh, then the specific mapping between actions um, and the trajectories. So based on this intuition, we propose the algorithm called uh, iterative residual policy. And at its core, the, what the algorithm really learned is a residual dynamics model that takes in an observed trajectory and a delta action that we can apply it on top of our current action. Uh, as, uh, and both the trajectory and the action is input. And what the network need to predict as an output is an updated trajectory after applying this delta action. So here, the robust action is represented uh, with the, the target drain angle and also the maximum uh, drain speed. And then by sampling different delta action and then predict uh, their corresponding trajectory, the algorithm could uh, iteratively select the better action that will get uh, uh, the rope uh, or get the trajectory closer to the goal. So here is actually the selected uh, 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 best delta action that will get closer uh, to the goal compared to other delta actions that we sampled at this iteration. And then we'll directly apply this delta action on, the, on top of our current action uh, in order to get the action that we want to execute or try in the next iteration. So note that uh, this residual dynamics model is actually trained entirely in simulation that's learned only with simulated trajectories and actions. As you can imagine for this task, there is actually a huge sim to real gap. So here is actually showing you the trajectory uh, of a very similar rope um, generated in simulation and real world. Um, but the hope is that the learned residual dynamics, especially its general direction, is able to generalize to the real world when it, even if it's only trained on simulation. As a result, uh, with this ability to adapt, the system will be able to adjust its action based on the visual observations that are collected from real world and therefore adapt to different uh, configurations and also rope parameters. So here is the system in action. Uh, at each iteration, the rope trajectory is tracked by a calibrated camera. And then the distance to the goal is measured by the shortest distance uh, 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 along the trajectory. So here the red uh, dot is indicating the shortest, um, the shortest distance from the tra whole trajectory to the goal. And then the algorithm will try to sample a set, uh, a collection of different delta action and predict their trajectories using the learned uh, residual, residual dynamics. So here on the right, you can see the uh, different trajectory predictions corresponding to different delta actions. Um, and uh, the action that associates with the smallest distance will be selected as the uh, delta action that we're gonna use for the next iteration. So in this visualization, uh, the best action is always visualized on the top. 
So this process will repeat until uh, the system reaches the goal. You can see that with one step uh, optimization, uh, the system already able to reduce uh, the distance to the goal by selecting a better data action. So that is basically one iteration of how system is able to optimize for one particular robes with the visual feedback. And then we also uh, conduct our more systematic uh, evaluation on our system. And I think one of the focus in our evaluation is that we want to see uh, how well the system is able to generalize uh, in terms of um, in different dimensions. So for example, we want to see how well the learned model is able to generalize to real world dynamics, uh, even when it's only trained in simulation only, or how well the, uh, the, the policy is able to generalize to objects with unknown uh, or new physical parameters that is not experienced in training. And, this, uh, and lastly, we also want to see how well the system is able to generalize to new robot hardware embodiments. Um, and in the following experiments, uh, uh, what all the results I'm going to show you is actually um, gener uh, generated by, uh, by using the same model trained in simulation. So first I'm going to show you some of the testing results on different ropes. And as you can see, many of them is actually quite significantly out of training distribution, such as this very long uh, thin class that has significantly higher uh, air resistance compared to the ropes that we trained on, uh, which is in simulation that does not have an, any air resistance. And also this uh, um, whip actually has a, a non-uniform uh, mass distribution, which will also behave very differently under uh, almost the same um, action. Before I'm going to show you the results, I want to, again to highlight how challenging the task is. So here we show different uh, rope trajectories under the same robot action. And due to different physical properties, such as the aerodynamics, mass distribution, or the stiffness of the rope, the resulting trajectory actually varies very drastically. So as a result, the robot really need to adapt its policy online based on, based on the visual feedback in order to generalize to this kind of novel and unknown parameters. So here is the result of the final trajectory after the policy convergence. So you can see that the algorithm really need to kind of choose different action in order to uh, achieve to the same goal in order to accommodate different rope parameters. So we also uh, further validate the system's uh, generalization capability with respect to different robot hardware embodiments. So what we do here uh, in this exper uh, experiment is that we're gonna change the length of robot's last link uh, which is uh, modeled by a uh, wooden stick, uh, at which basically um, changes the mapping between the robot's action and its effects on the rope. So in this case, the system is actually forced to kind of relearn all this kind of uh, action to effects mapping in order to adapt to new uh, embodiments using the new observations. So uh, among these uh, three different variations, the 50 centimeter uh, length uh, link is the length that we use to generate the training data, which means that the longer and the shorter links are actually not seen during training. So here is the result. Um, as expected, we can see that the robots with longer or shorter links actually always typically start with much higher uh, initial error compared to the one that is uh, uh, similar to the training data. Uh, however, regardless of this initial uh, error, both uh, all the, the system is able to kind of adjust pretty quickly in order to uh, adapt to this difference um, based on the visual feedbacks or the observed trajectories. And eventually for all these three systems is able to reach a pretty low um, error uh, in the end. And in the next experiment, we're gonna kind of try to stress test the system as robustness. So what we do in this experiment uh, is that we will first let the system converges on a given goal and also a given rope. So you can see that the loss already decreased uh, and the, the system is able to uh, reach to the goal pretty close. So after that, we'll uh, try to gently mess with the robot by tying a few knots on the rope. So this kind of action effectively actually changed the rope's uh, both linear density and also its length. 
So it's actually two pretty, co pretty critical um, parameters on the rope that the system actually needs to adapt to. So after that, immediately we can observe that there is a much higher error uh, caused by these uh, changes on the rope parameters. However, after one or two iteration, the policy can quickly update or update, uh, adapt to the new system dynamics and regain a good policy. So in the next set of experiments, we're going to uh, try to compare our uh, method with uh, other alternative approaches. So here we highlight two strongest baselines. One is called optimal action that is optimized in simulation. Uh, so uh, in order to get the optimal trajectories in simulation, we actually manually measure the row parameters. And this policy only has a single step because it's uh, already trying to execute the optimal uh, action that's uh, optimized uh, in simulation environment. So as, as you can see that this method actually generally does not give us a very good performance and typically results in around 20 centimeter error, uh, which really highlights the big seem to real gap for this task. And another method that we compare to it uses a linear model in order to approximate uh, the whole uh, dynamical system. And we can, um, as, as we'll, we'll see uh, uh, very soon in the uh, later slides, this method actually has trouble uh, convert to a good solution um, with, within a, um, a reasonable number of steps, which really demonstrates this kind of nonlinearity of the system. So in comparison, our method can continuously improve its action and reach uh, to the goal in the end. So here at iteration six, our policy is already able to uh, reach to the goal and with a very uh, small error. Uh, however, the linear model still struggles to reach a, to a good performance. So here is the quantitative results. I think on, uh, the method on the left is uh, optimal action that's optimized in simulation, uh, which is actually optimized for each individual row parameters. Uh, as we can see that on average, it's actually um, still resulting around 10 or even 20 centimeter error. On the, uh, on the other hand, our method is able to consistently achieve a much lower uh, error for all different ropes and embodiments. And finally, in order to demonstrate the generality of our method, we also try to apply the same method to a different task, which is cross placement task with minimal modifications. So the goal for this task is try to place a, a place a cross on a table given a target pose, where the pose is defined by nine different key point locations on the cloud. So again, the algorithm does not have the physical does not know the physical parameters of the cross. Therefore, it's really need to adjust this action in order to adapt to those uh, to those kind of different physical parameters. So here we are going to show two typical strategies that's learned by the algorithm. So in the first uh, step, the algorithm always use the same initial actions. However, due to the different physical properties on different class, uh, it actually results in different uh, uh, end configurations. And the, in the first example, the class is actually lent a little bit too close uh, compared to the goal configurations as we uh, ask the system to reach. And in the second example, uh, the same action actually caused the class to fold by itself due to the uh, high densities on the class uh, physical parameters. So what's, uh, with that observation of that trajectory, the policy will adjust its action uh, differently according to that uh, observation. So in the first case, the policy actually increased its uh, stroke in order to swing further so that it can uh, get him closer to the goal. However, in the second case, it actually, the policy actually chose to decrease its, its speed in order to prevent uh, the class folding by itself. And here you can see the policy actually continue to adjust its action based on the uh, visual observations. So the algorithm uh, typically for this task converges within uh, three or four steps. So as you can see, this formulation of uh, iterative residual policy is actually pretty general and that can be applied to many uh, repeatable tasks with complex dynamics. Right? So in this case, the complex dynamics is actually introduced by this deformable objects, uh, physical parameters. And I think uh, what, uh, what we learned uh, from this project is that 
instead of trying to learn the full dynamic model that maps directly from action to its effects, in this case, it's a rope trajectory, uh, the, the algorithm can learn and make use of a residual dynamics model. So in the rope example, uh, which means that we can, instead of uh, learning this full trajectory mapping from the action, which is um, really hard to learn, or try to decode the precise physical properties of the rope. Uh, what the system can learn is actually how to change its current action in order to affect its trajectory so that it's getting closer to the goal. And as a result, this kind of uh, uh, residual dynamics is turned out to be much easier to learn and also more generalizable uh, to different uh, physical properties on the rope or uh, the, uh, the cloud. So I think uh, in, in summary from our experiments, we kind of show that um, this kind of residual dynamics is able to generalize uh, to many conditions, such as uh, uh, this kind of noisy real world dynamics, new objects with unseen physical properties, and even uh, different robot hardware embodiments. And I think that's the end of my talk, uh, and I'm happy to take questions. Professor So, so welcome Hi. to our live Q and A session and a very great talk. And I think we got two questions from our questionnaire. So the first question is like, the idea of learning a residual policy is really brilliant. The rope whipping experiment seems a relatively short horizon task. So is it possible to extend the proposed method to some longer horizon tasks? And uh, are there any potential difficulties? Yeah, so I think that's a great question. And I think that's a correct observation. Uh, I think learning, uh, so what we have tested in the uh, iterative residual policy uh, uh, work is actually very uh, short horizon uh, task. It's only kind of like a few seconds. And in terms of time, it's short and also the horizon is short. It's kind of just predicting one action in order to achieve the goal. I think in order to make it for longer horizon, I think the, the naive approach is kind of sequencing a, a set of or like a, a several primitives in order to achieve a longer horizon uh, task or goals. But uh, the problem is that once we start to consider that those kind of long horizon tasks, uh, we cannot always assume that we can reset the state. So I think for uh, iterative residual policy to work, uh, we always kind of uh, assume that the next action we can reset to the initial state and we can retry the action in order to observe the difference. But uh, for longer horizon tasks, that assumption may not uh, work anymore. So I think that is a one potential issues to extend it to long horizon task. Yeah. I see. Uh, and uh, the second question is like, uh, the sim to real performance shown in your paper is really great. The question is, to achieve this sim to real result, what kind of physical parameters should be calibrated between simulation and the real world? Yeah, I think uh, in our work, actually, what we want to show is that even the idea is that the simulation actually has a very big gap compared to the real world. And we actually show that in one of the examples. But the idea is that as long as the direction of the simulation is correct, kind of like how you change your action, um, the, 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 the direction of how your change actually affects the direction of the trajectory, as long as that part can be generalizable, then even if the simulation is incorrect, it can be, the, the knowledge learned can be transferred to real world. So in our particular implementation, I think the simulation has a very few parameters that we can actually set. 
And uh, uh, there's a lot of things that does not consider, for example, aerodynamics. So no matter how much we tune, I think there will always be a huge gap. So I don't think we actually spend a, a, a lot of time to tune those parameters. Um, so I think that is an advantage of residual, of iterative residual policy, yeah. I see, I see. And there is one more question from myself. Actually, I'm working on some, also working on some simulation stuff. I'm curious mm -hmm. uh, what kind of physical engine or framework you use to do such kind of soft body simulation? Yeah, so for this work, uh, uh, so basically we used uh, Madruco, which uh, you, I, I guess you're probably very familiar. And it's, it's actually not yeah. the best simulator to, to simulate soft bodies, and it has a lot of limitations. So for other works that we actually uh, care more about the, the realistics of the, the simulator, or like when we really simulating complicated cloth like garments, we use um, uh, the, the simulator from NVIDIA, it's called NVIDIA Flex. Uh, and mm -hmm. also their new Omniverse is another framework that actually provides pretty good yeah. um, like backend uh, for, for simulating soft body. Yeah. Yeah, I think there are a lot of new simulators are invented and worth to try. And I think we still have a lot to do in the simulation and the using simulation in learning your method. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Okay. I think I think yeah, that's correct. <laughs> yeah. Then thank you so much for, for the for answering these questions. And uh, I think that's it for uh, this live QA session. And thank you again for coming to our workshop. Thank you. Thank you for inviting me. Bye bye. <laughs> Bye. Hello everyone, welcome to my talk. My name is Nadia Figueroa. I am an assistant professor at the University of Pennsylvania since January of this year. And first of all, I would like to thank the organizers for uh, inviting me to give this talk in this workshop. And in this presentation, I will talk about the main themes in my research, which focus on endowing robots with the capabilities of learning from humans in an efficient way, while at the same time being able to physically collaborate and interact in a safe manner, as shown in this video, where a robot manipulator is performing a pick and place task while allowing the human operator to safely modify and adapt the task on the go. Now, the work that I will present today uh, highlights contributions from my PhD thesis, uh, which I conducted at APFL in Switzerland, as well as some of the my most recent work as a postdoc at, at MIT. So my research is motivated by this vision that one day we will have robots working alongside humans in a myriad of tasks, from teaching robots to perform complex tasks like sorting, cleaning, or manipulating objects in factories, warehouses, or in households, to physically collaborating with them uh, to perform joint tasks such as handing over large objects or cleaning a shelf from your room. Now, these tasks, uh, while they seem trivial for humans to perform, they are actually quite complex for robots as they require detailed knowledge about the task goals, the structure, and even the environment around them. However, thanks to the advent of uh, collaborative robots and compliant controls, control schemes, one can physically guide a robot to perform a task. However, pure imitation or replay of such guided demonstrations is not sufficient for the robot to perform it robustly in dynamic environments where both the location of the objects or the robot state might change. Further, when the task requires the human to be in the loop, we add another level of complexity as the robot should be able to adapt to any changes imposed by the human or the environment while still being able to guarantee some sort of uh, task success. Hence, for robots to truly be adopted in such scenarios, we, we must minimize the time and effort it takes a human to train a robot. Uh, we want the robots to be adaptive and reactive to changes uh, imposed by the human or other agents while at the same time guaranteeing task completion. And very importantly, we should also guarantee the safety for both the human and the robots while they are physically interacting or simply, simply in close proximity with each other. So if we think about these objectives from an optimization perspective, it is quite challenging to guarantee all of them at once. Uh, so they might as they might have contradicting or even unspecified goals. 
However, if we consider the objectives regarding uh, guaranteeing robustness, adaptability, and safety, these properties can be inherently addressed by uh, concepts and tools from control theory, such as the analysis of feedback control systems, state estimation, and stability theory. On the other hand, in order to achieve efficient teaching, if we are able to demonstrate the task to the robots, we can use techniques from machine learning to learn a model of the task that can then be used to control the robot to generate the desired motion or interactive behavior. Now, using machine learning to teach uh, robots, as you all know, is not a novel uh, idea. Much research in the field has focused on developing very impressive reinforcement learning, imitation learning schemes that have allowed robots to perform manipulation tasks with very nice results. However, these techniques are not necessarily efficient within the uh, physical human robot interaction domain, right? Because they either require lots of model selection heuristics to find optimal par parameters. Some require lots of data and training time to learn uh, simple behaviors such as reaching or grasping. Uh, further, lot, there's lots of models of the tasks or policies that are learned uh, uh, and are not guaranteed to, uh, uh, to be robust to changes in the task or to even consider the humans in the loop or in the vicinity of the robot. And finally, uh, it's often difficult to find a model or a policy that can provide a good trade-off between reproduction accuracy of the data uh, or demonstration data that, that was given and convergence uh, guarantees. So in order to use machine learning techniques to teach robots tasks through demonstrations while providing uh, safety and robustness guarantees, in my research, I propose techniques that seamlessly blend tools and concepts from control theory uh, with machine learning. Specifically, to learn models that are adaptive, we assume that the motion of the robot can be a generator controlled with an autonomous dynamical system of the following form, where x uh, can be the position of the robot, x dot is the velocity, and f of x is this first order differential equation, which uh, describes the evolution of the state variable x towards the target x star. And by using this formulation, we can ensure the conver convergence and stability uh, of, of, the, of, these, of, these, of these motion policies via Lyapunov theory. Uh, so what are the tangible benefits of using uh, this control theoretic formulation to generate robot motion? Well, first of all, uh, computation time is incredibly fast, which enables us to produce extremely fast and adaptive behavior, such as catching objects in flight. And also, not only can we adapt to changes in the task, like the video that I showed at the beginning, uh, but also to unwanted perturbations, allowing them to happen, but finalizing the task once the perturbation is gone. So the main idea here is to be able to learn or shape these dynamical systems, which are inherently vector fields that are representing the robot motion from data generated by the human so, then we, so that we can provide all of these desirable guarantees while being efficient when transferring the task to the robot. So in the rest of the talk, I will show that by using this dynamical system-based formulation to generate the motion of a robot and then coupling them with impedance control laws and optimization techniques, we can guarantee uh, efficient learning and some inherent adaptability in the, in the learned models. Uh, so uh, basically, we'll guarantee learning, adaptability, and I will also talk about uh, safety. So how we can guarantee uh, um, uh, some uh, safety for, for the robot through learning self-collision self avoidance. So when transferring tasks to a robot in the learning from demonstration domain, one seeks to demonstrate the task to the robot in hopes that the robot learns a generalizable model of the task that can uh, be adaptive but yet execute the task properly. Um, so at this point, uh, there are many approaches that are capable of learning such dynamical system-based motion policies from demonstrations in an efficient way. Um, yet many approaches still lack the representation power for uh, highly nonlinear complex motions and the ability to introduce ways to modulate stiffness uh, within this type of, of control law. So some years ago, uh, Kansari and Billard uh, proposed to encode a dynamical system uh, via a constrained Gaussian mixture regression algorithm, which they called SETS. Uh, and um, th this algorithm basically uh, learns a conditional uh, probability distribution of 
the of the demonstrations and uh, and imposes constraints on the Gaussian uh, mixture model parameters. And these constraints are derived by uh, a Lyapunov uh, function. So why do we need to propose a, a new dynamical system formulation to represent more complex tasks? Well, here in, the, in, in this uh, figure, the red trajectories are the demonstrations that I'm giving to the robot and the black trajectories are the executions of this control law that was learned with this initial algorithm. So as we can see, we can ensure we ensure convergence because that's the constraint that is imposed on the parameters of this uh, control law. So it will always reach a target regardless of what motion is going to perform. Uh, however, uh, the the reproduction is quite inaccurate, right? So it's not really following the, this highly nonlinear motions. And the reason behind this is that uh, this algorithm was using a very conservative uh, a Lyapunov function. So basically a, a very simple quadratic Lyapunov function to derive the constraints on the parameters. Uh, so uh, what I what we did was use a less restrictive Lyapunov function to, to derive these stability constraints. And we, we uh, figured out that we can easily create a more, uh, um, a, a less restrictive Lyapunov function by introducing this symmetric positive definite matrix, which basically reshapes um, a typical energy function into a more elli ellipsoidal uh, type of energy function, which allows uh, more uh, nonlinear uh, trajectories in in the in the learned dynamical system. So, in order to uh, to learn these dynamical systems from data, we basically given the set of nonlinear trajectories, which are the red ones that we see here, we en encode them by representing this dynamical system as a mixture of linear dynamical systems. And these systems, these linear systems are weighted by a mixing function gamma, which is a scalar function bounded between zero and one, and with the constraint that it should sum up to one. And what intuitive, intuitively what this gamma function is doing is indicating in which regions of the state space the linear systems are active, and then mixes them to create this smooth transition between them. So given the requirements of this gamma function, we basically parameterize it with the, with the Gaussian mixture model learned on the position measurement. So basically here, a Gaussian mixture model is used to kind of like represent the area, the distribution of, of, uh, of our trajectories. So now given, the mix, given the, this mixing function, what we do is we, what we now need to learn the linear system parameters. And we do this uh, uh, with a non-convex semi-definite program where we basically minimize the mean square error, the velocities, uh, subject to stability constraints derived by this, uh, this newly proposed uh, Lyapunov function. So one of the caveats of this, uh, of this technique is that the reproduction accuracy of this formulation relies heavily on how well the Gaussians are fitted to the trajectory, uh, uh, how well they follow basically this assumption that each Gaussian sh in, should represent an area in the state space that can be represented by a single linear uh, or it can be reproduced by a single linear that dynamical system. So in order to achieve that, uh, we proposed uh, a Bayesian non-parametric Gaussian mixture model estimation approach that uses a prior that is biased uh, to ensure this uh, physical consistency. So basically, uh, this metric takes into consideration both the closeness of the points in Euclidean space, as well as the cosine similarity of their corresponding velocity measurements, such that uh, we, we bias the clustering of the Gaussian mixture model when we're estimating it on the data, uh, such that each Gaussian basically represents uh, trajectories in the state space that follow a linear motion. So with this new approach, we can infer the optimal number of Gaussians uh, K uh, uh, via sampling while ensuring a physically consistent fit uh, on our trajectory data. So uh, with, uh, with our physically consistent Gaussian, this mixture model and the optimization using the parameterized Lyapunov function, we can encode entire, uh, um, yeah, we can encode entire complex tasks in a single dynamical system. Now, in order to exploit the robustness uh, um, to perturbations that are in inherent in these motion generators, the robot should be either mechanically compliant or one can use a passive compliant control scheme as the equation that I'm showing here. So in this case, compliance is achieved by using this dynamical system-based impedance control law for a, torque, for a torque control robot that allows for perturbations while ensuring the convergence to the target defined by this learned uh, dynamical system. 
So now here, the top row videos, you can see how we taught uh, a robot to turn a lamp on and off while pressing the button, showing that the approach can handle this implicit via points. Uh, and on the bottom row, you can see uh, the robot arranging boxes in a shelf while, uh, while being perturbed by the human to change the box uh, uh, to pick. Again, by simply encoding the entire task with a single dynamical system and through the impedance control law, we can achieve very robust behaviors with minimal, comput with minimal computation and without really having to introduce uh, uh, more sophisticated control schemes that are able to recover from these perturbations because the dynamical system itself already has those properties. So let's take a closer look into the, into the behavior of these dynamical systems together with this compliant uh, robot controller. Uh, so in all the videos and the experiments that I showed before, the underlying behavior can be described as follows. So we have these uh, reference trajectories, which are these red trajectories that, that are displayed on the screen uh, that we use to learn or to shape this vector field to learn this dynamical system then. While following these dynamics, uh, even though the robot is perturbed, we always reach the target, right? We always reach the target because we always have this curve that, that in the state space that will lead us to, to the target. However, we are not really tracking the desired reference trajectory very accurately anymore after the perturbations. Um, so basically, we can achieve, we, we're allowing for perturbations and we ensure convergence, but we're, we have, we, we're lacking now this reference trajectory tracking behavior. Um, so how can we provide, like, and of course, there are many tasks in robotics and manipulation that require for the robot to basically allow for these perturbations, but at the same time, kind of like go back to the reference trajectory that was demonstrated. So how can we now uh, provide that type of behavior with these dynamical systems? So in order to do that, we propose to embed this kind of like stiffness like behavior in the dynamical system formulation itself. So basically in this orange region, we can see that the integral curves of the dynamical system are now attracted towards the trajectory, uh, yet the entire dynamical system itself still converges to the target from anywhere in the state space. So what we're doing is we're kind of like embedding this type of spring-like symmetrical attraction around, around uh, regions uh, in, in the state space in, where the reference trajectory really needs to be tracked. So to achieve this, uh, we propose this, this new uh, dynamical system formulation, which we call the locally active globally stable dynamical system or LAGS, which has the, the following form. So mainly it's a combination of a global dynamical system as the one uh, 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 using, following the, the exact same formulation as the one I presented before, and then a local dynamical system, a local system, uh, uh, which is also formula formulated as a mixture of, of linear systems as in the, in the previous contribution. Yet the, the global dynamics basically converge towards a target. So here we can see here the global dynamics converge towards a target, and then the local dynamics are basically converging towards a trajectory. So by an activation function, uh, which is basically this uh, uh, function between zero and one, we are uh, we we use this to now mix the global and the and and the local uh, dynamics such that the robot can smoothly go from this global region where it will go towards the target to the local region where it will it will, it will converge towards the trajectory. So when we mix these two uh, dynamics uh, with this activation function alpha, uh, this results in this behavior where the outside activation region and the DS is compliant, while inside this uh, orange region, the that dynamical system is stiff with respect to this uh, reference trajectory. Uh, and here we show an experiment of this formulation being uh, used to follow a reference trajectory of a certain shape. Uh, as can be seen, the robot is still compliant uh, while performing the task, yet it's stiffer in the in those areas of local attraction. So basically, the the orange areas around certain parts of the shape, uh, where after allowing the perturbations, the robot basically goes back to the reference trajectory. And as you can see in the video, 
these very nice kind of like behaviors emerge of uh, kind of like even going into uh, a, into this cyclical motion or, or, or even trying to go back to a trajectory which is not at all uh, something that was coded. So it's, some, it's something that emerges from having this type of dynamical system as our main motion policy and then using a compliant control, control scheme that allows for perturbations. And here uh, we can see how uh, we use the same approach to, uh, to have a human or robot that can react to unwanted perturbations. Basically, in, the, in this case, the dynamical system was shaped following this track on the floor. And, uh, uh, and as you can see, the, and here the robot it was, uh, is, is being controlled by, uh, by a passive uh, control scheme. So it basically allows for perturbations. So it allows for uh, the, the human to perturb its path, but then once the perturbation is gone, then it goes back to, towards the path that it, it, should, that, that it learned to, to do. Um, so up until now, I have covered learning, uh, basically this, uh, using these dynamical system formulations to learn uh, the, uh, um, uh, controllers from data that, that are adapted, that have these very nice kind of like adaptive uh, behaviors uh, with some implicit safety guarantees due to the passivity of the control approach. So basically if the robot is compliant, then we are in a sense already uh, uh, showing, uh, already providing some, some form of safety. But obviously, that uh, safety requires much more than that. So, uh, for example, let's let's look at uh, the, the, the this example where we have two robots that are that are compliant, that are allowing for these perturbations uh, from from the human, and they basically follow uh, whatever force it is that the human is applying. So, in this case, of course, we want the robots to always be compliant and allowing these these external forces or perturbations from the human. But we, we also uh, would want them to not collide with each other, right? So um, in this multi multi arm uh, scenario. So to alleviate this, what we did now is we proposed an approach that learns the regions in the joint space of these two robots that lead to collisions within within this multi arm setup. Uh, and we do this by learning this uh, this gamma function, which we call the self collision boundary function. Uh, and and we do this by learn by and this boundary function has these properties. So it's less than one in collided configurations. It's equal to one in boundary configurations. So boundary meaning that the robots are are at the boundary of being in in a collided configuration. And then free configuration is basically the the, the robots are are away from being in collision. So if we have a, a, um, a function that, that gives us um, these types of, of, uh, of measures, uh, we can then use this uh, smooth function, which must be differentiable, to formulate a constraint for a, for, for a QP uh, quadratic program inverse kinematics problem. So in order to learn this, uh, this function here, uh, I'll show uh, in, in a, a kind of like a toy um, example. So let's say that, we sample the, the joint space of the of, of the robot and we found which were the collided joint configurations and which were the non-collided joint configurations. Uh, so what we can do is then we learn this smooth boundary function that separates the collided versus the non-collided. So basically it becomes uh, um, a classification problem. So here you can see what the what the proper what, what these properties mean. So basically when the gamma function is is higher than one, then it's in the free configuration space. When it's lower than one, it's in the collided configuration. And when it's when it's equal to one, it's right at the boundary. Um, so let's see what, what's the behavior of this boundary of this boundary function and how, and how we can actually use it for control. Uh, so here uh, we uh, I show the proposed inverse kinematic solver. Uh, so it's in a, a quadratic program that's convex. Uh, and uh, it satisfies uh, the desire and effector motion, which is give, which can be given by a dynamical system, uh, and it also satisfies the kinematic constraints, so joint limits. And it has this this third uh, constraint that uh, that basically forces the robot to not penetrate this collision boundary. Um, so let's let's see what happens uh, within within this uh, this small region. So. What this um, what this what this solver is doing is implicitly using this collision boundary function as kind of like a repulsive vector field in joint space. 
So as the robot is going, uh, as the multi-robot system is, is going towards the boundary, what we use is we use the gradient of this function. That's why it's important for it to be differentiable. So we use the gradient of this function to kind of like repulse the robots towards the free configuration, uh, um, the free, the free, the free, the free uh, configuration such that it doesn't lead to collisions. So um, one thing to note is that the, this boundary function, as I said, must be differentiable. So we used the sparse support vector machine initially to solve the QP problem, and we could we could we could solve and, and execute this this gamma function at 500 hertz on, on a standard CPU. But of course, given more processing power, we can use either Gaussian processes or even neural networks to model such smooth boundaries. So here you can see in the simulation on the left, we plot this gamma, the value of the gamma function as the robots start entering into each other's workspaces. Uh, and as can be seen, it's, it smoothly drops to zero, which is when we repulse the, mo the, the motion between the two end effectors. Uh, and here on the right, you, you can see the, the video of the, of the robots actually performing this in, 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 with, 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 the, with, with two real um, robots. And then here in this video, uh, uh, you can see how fast uh, this uh, th this solver can be. So here, the two robots are tasked to track the, the hands of this operator, which uh, uh, has uh, some uh, markers which are tracked by a by OptiTrack system. As, as you can see, the, the human is going into uh, the, the workspace of the other robots, and, and they can basically avoid colliding with each other. We then extended this approach to solve for self-collision avoidance uh, inverse kinematics in joint space. So in this simulation, uh, we can see in real time how the this learned gamma function changes as the humanoid moves. So in this case, a neural we use a neural network uh, was uh, to learn the high dimensional boundary function for the humanoid robot, and this can be seen in in, in the in the self-collision. Uh, if the if the robot is being controlled without the self collision of what is constraints, uh, then 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 the robot will collide with with it with itself. However, when we use uh, when we when, when when we introduce now this constraint from the self collision uh, boundary that was learned by exploring the sp the joint space of the robots, you can see that the robot kind of like finds the best pos posture for the humanoid to grab the box. From the from the from the floor, what what with uh, without colliding with itself. To summarize, I presented reactive control approaches that can be learned from humans or from exploring the state space, basically the joint space of the robots, to tackle adaptation and safety requirements imposed by physical human robot interaction scenarios. And um, so finally, I would just like to uh, give a special shout out to uh, Mikhail uh, Koptev, who uh, worked on the humanoid self-collision avoidance extension of my work. And uh, in, the, in, in, this web, in my website, you can find videos and publications and the codes for all the works that I presented today. So looking forward to uh, your questions during uh, the live session. And thank you so much for your time.
Hi everyone, welcome to our live Q&A session and thanks for listening to the uh, Professor Figueroa's talk. So basically we got some questions from our questionnaire. So the first question is like, uh, I just repeat this question. Uh, really great talk. I'm not familiar with the HRI field, but I'm curious about if we want to first train a robot policy in simulation and let it interact with human in the real world, what is the biggest challenge if we want to ensure the safety? That's a question. Okay, that, that's, a, that's a really nice question. Yeah, I mean, that's, that's some of the topics that, that I want, that I'm trying to uh, like investigate with my uh, incoming PhD students. So can we basically leverage like the very interesting work that has already been done in learning uh, policies and simulation? The problem is uh, it, it really depends on the policy or like the task, right? Like if you want the robots, um, to simply be uh, doing kind of like a task that's autonomous, for example, uh, following some trajectories, uh, um, do, doing some like polishing or something that, that the robot is interacting with an object, that it's, it's either manipulating it or deforming it, and you want the human to come in and assist. Uh, that's what's, uh, uh, that's what th it's what's difficult to model in simulation because how do you model that assistant behavior, like my, maybe we could model like as another robot, like maybe that one robot, like a policy being trained between two robots, or if we had a, a um, let's say a, a, a model of human behavior and introduced of a human and basically uh, how, how a human moves, for example, following minimum jerk trajectories or, or how a human will adapt to certain interaction forces. Uh, that's what's really uh, important for, uh, for, for HRI. So like, and more specifically for physical human robot interaction is uh, trying to, so the safety in, in human and robot interaction really like boils down to the robot not damage, not, not harming the, the, the human, right? So like not uh, applying so much, so, so like uh, so hard of forces, uh, not uh, constraining the, the the configuration of the of the human or the mobility of the human. So, uh, at the end of the day, the the policy always has to be able to kind of like adapt to whatever the intention of the human is, or to uh, or to whatever the the goal of the human is. And that's something that's uh, difficult to um, to really uh, uh, simulate to to, to to see. Even though like, I, but but I, but it's an interesting kind of like area of research that I'm really thinking about, like since we now have very realistic uh, physics simulators, or uh, for example, this NVIDIA ISAC, uh, the, the ASIC simulator, which is very photorealistic, like can we introduce, for example, models of, of, of human workers and, and uh, that are, are trained from data, of, like tracking how humans actually uh, work, like for example, in the production line, and then be able to use those in order to learn a, a policy that now, that now basically considers the human as another state or as another input to, to, to the policy. I see. Thank you so for answering the question. And uh, another question is actually from myself. Uh, okay. so, so basically it's more like a general question because I'm also not an expert in HRI to me. So, so I'm, I'm wondering, so basically when we combine learning method with physics, physics formulas in HRI, so which one should we trust more or utilize more? So basically it's like, what is the appropriate way to combine them in your opinions? It's more general that's, question. Yeah, yeah. so that, that's, the, that's like the beauty, I guess, or that's like, like yeah. the difficulty of, 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 of these techniques. So like, what should we learn, right? So like, let's say, uh, for example, if we want, the, if we want uh, the robot to not collide with the environment and not collide with the human, mm -hmm. then uh, we already know that we can formulate like very robust and reactive controllers in order to uh, to to um, accommodate for for that self collision or collision avoidance constraint. So uh, what's missing is basically like from so from my point of view is uh, whatever is difficult to model. So for example, the, this collision avoidance boundary that is what we can use data uh, to uh, to learn such boundaries and then if we can uh, so uh, let's say like you have this equation or you, you're trying to 
uh, learn like an impedance control law or an admins control law so we can use that 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 uh, equation and then use yep. data to learn kind of like the parameters such that they adapt to different preferences of the human or to different tasks uh so uh but it's i mean it's it's not something that's very like uh, uh, like i mean it would be amazing to have some sort of like auto uh, like automated uh um let's say algorithm that decides like oh this part of the, like this part of the task has to, can be learned and this part of the task uh can be can be used that uh, can be uh, uh achieved following like some equation that's already already known but uh that, that is definitely kind of like the difficulty and that's kind of like where exactly where my research lies and like what can we uh like which part of the of this control uh problem can we uh can we can we uh can we uh, can we use machine learning techniques yeah. to solve or, or for example are, are there certain parts of this control problem that we don't have a model that we do not know how they behave so like then that's where i introduce basically the machine learning techniques to be able to learn uh, uh these functions uh, which are either boundaries or stability or safety certificates uh from data yeah i see so basically it's like there are some questions equations cannot solve very well we just let data and learning try yes. to solve them right yeah okay exactly. thank you so much for your answers <laughs> and uh, i think basically that's it for today's uh live q and a session and thank you thank you so much for calling me and have a nice day okay thank you so much thank you all for inviting me <laughs> bye. all right bye hello everyone i am hao shen from peking university and i'm glad to represent our team epic lab to present our work learning category level generalizable object manipulation policy via generative adversarial self-imitation learning from demonstrations first let me introduce our team we are from embodied perception and interaction in short epic lab led by professor he wang at peking university our team members include me and Wei Kang, who contribute equally to this work, along with He Wang. We won the first place in the no external annotation track of many skill challenge, where we are allowed to interact with the environment and provided with demonstrations. We also outperformed the second place by a large scale. Based on the challenge, we proposed a novel category level imitation learning algorithm to learn a generalizable policy that can work on unseen test instances from given object categories. To ensure that our method can be applied to general imitation learning problems, we at first don't assume handcrafted dense rewards are available and only assume a terminal reward. We then couple generative adversarial imitation learning or GAL with SAC as our baseline to utilize demonstration data provided by many skill benchmark. In this baseline, GAL utilizes an adversarial trajectory generation scheme. It comprises a generator, which is the policy network of SAC, and a discriminator DeFi. This discriminator trains to di distinguish between expert trajectories tall E and generated tra trajectories tall G. It also provides dense rewards RT to SAC. This of policy imitation learning framework also contains three buffers, replay buffer BR, gener generated buffer BG, and expert buffer BE. On top of GAL with SAC baseline, we propose three important techniques, including the progressive discriminator, the generative adversarial self imitation learning from demonstrations, and the category level instance balancing buffer. Next, I will introduce the three methods respectively. The first challenge we met in GAL is that the discriminator in GAL is too strong. Due to the need to handle many training instances with large variations, the policy network struggles to ramp up at the very beginning and can easily be overpowered by the discriminator. Here the figure shows how the reward from the discriminator changes over training. Basically, it quickly diminishes to zero and leads failures in imitation learning. The issue is how can we balance the generator and discriminator? Inspired by progressive growing gain and the curriculum gain, we propose to progressively grow the architecture of the discriminator of GAL during the training to alleviate the imbalance. More specifically, we let the discriminator evolve from a simple initial architecture, which is a point net, to a more complex one, 
the point net plus transformer. In this case, the discriminative power is gradually increased. Know that we won't evolve the architecture of the generator because the output of our policy network is always in the same action space without any change, which, are, which is different from the progressive gain. And the issue mainly comes from the overpower discriminator. We want the policy network to be as strong as possible from the very beginning. Leveraging the progressive growth of the discriminator, we observe a significant increase in the reward throughout the entire training. However, the reward from the gale still tends to decay. This means the discriminator can get easier and easier to tell apart our generated trajectories from expert demonstrations. We want to know why. Our diagnosis shows that this decrease might originate from the clustering phenomenon in the trajectory space of expert demonstrations. Since the demonstration provided by main skill challenge is obtained from per instance RL training, the underlying manipulation strategies can be quite different for different object instances. This figure shows a Tisney visualization of the global feature extracted by the training discriminator, where one color refers to one object instance. Our generator tends to learn a continuous function across different object instances and therefore has intrinsic difficulties to mimic this cluster distribution. Inspired by Gesio and ICFD, we update the expert buffer with the successful trajectories generated by our own policy network, which is so-called self-imitation learning algorithms. This helps us, our policy to do well at the beginning of training and learn a more universal trajectory during the later training process. Compared to per instance RL policy, our policy network tends to learn a more universal trajectory that can handle different object instances in a similar way, which comes by nature from the continuity of neural networks with the change in object instances. This figure shows the Tisney visual comparison of the global feature extracted by training discriminator and one from initial data in expert buffer and one ge generated by our policy network. The downside of using generated successful trajectories to fill expert buffer is the Matthew effect, which makes some objects instance happen to succeed very earlier than the others, so they dominate in the expert buffer. This leading to an uneven distribution among all object instances, making the harder instance even harder to handle for the policy network. So we propose a constant slot for each object instance so the number of trajectories for all instances are the same as shown in the figure. We call this category level instance balancing or clip expert buffer. Although simple, this design is essential to avoid overfitting a small number of instances and thus ensure the generalizability towards novel test instance. This picture shows success rate comparison of some merit instances before and after using our clip expert buffer. In the open cabinet drawer task, the handles of cabinets have many variations, and some handles, for example, the nail shaped, are hard to be opened. Without clip, the expert buffer will soon forget the initial demonstrations for these instances, and the agent will not learn to finish these tasks. However, with the help of clip, the expert buffer always reserves demonstrations for these drawers so that the agent also gets some successful knowledge on these instances. The main results are showing the figure. In this figure, with progressive growing of discriminator, self-imitation learning from demonstrations, and clip expert buffer, our method combining the three techniques outperforms the baseline gale by 13% and 18% average across four tasks on training and validation sets. Also, from this figure, we can analyze the effect of one particular technique. For skill challenge, we further leverage the dense rewards provided by the original paper. We find that our methods with additional dense reward, which ranks the first place on the no external annotation track of many scale challenge 2021, can outperform the Gale baseline by 7% average across four tasks on both training and validation sets. In summary, our proposed techniques exactly pinpoint the bottleneck in category level imitation learning and thus yields significant performance improvement. We have all open sourced our project and will come to visit our project page and GitHub repo. Thanks for watching.
Hi, I'm Edward, and I'll be presenting Know Thyself, Transferable Visual Control Policies Through Robot Awareness. This is joint work with Quen Huang, Oleg Ribkin, and Dinesh Jairabin. Start by giving an overview on how model-based RL uses dynamics models for control. First, suppose we want the robot to move objects around in this scene. We learn to predict future states given actions. In our case, we're interested in visual skills, so we predict video frames. We collect a data set of the robot performing different actions and the corresponding outcomes. Then using that data set, we can train a dynamics model to predict the future frames given the current frame in action. At test time, let's say we want the robot to move the blue cloth to the left as seen in this goal image. First, we can sample the actions, forecast their outcomes with their learned model, then select the action with the best forecasted outcome and execute it. So that was a quick sketch, but the high-level idea is to learn visual dynamics models from experience for robotic control. However, these prediction models require up to a few days' worth of data collection because collecting robot data is slow. Let's say you operate a fleet of Widow X robots and have collected a data set and trained a visual dynamics model on them. It's almost certain that the robots will change over time. For example, we may upgrade or specialize some robots, like adding markers or safety bumpers. Or we may even want to upgrade the robot entirely, like with the shiny new Franco robot. Can we just use our previous model trained on Widow X data to operate this new robot? Let's see what the predictive model outputs. Ideally, the white Franco arm will move the bear to the right. However, the white Franco arm does not move, and instead, the black Widow X training robot is overlaid. The bear does not move too much to the right. So visual models are not transferable and must be trained separately for each new robot. The natural question is then, can we learn transferable visual dynamics models in controllers? Then the expensive data collection can be amortized across robots. First, we set up two essential mechanisms for the robot aware method. The first mechanism is robot segmentation so that our method can distinguish the robot and world in images. When proprioception and camera calibration are available, we can use basic projection techniques to get the mask. Next, we use our knowledge of the robot kinematics to predict how it moves. For example, if the action is end effect or displacement, we can use inverse and forward kinematics to predict the future robot state. Now I'll give a brief overview of the robot aware control framework. The first step is to train a robot aware world model on one robot. The dynamics model is composed of an analytical robot model and a learned world model. Then at test time with a new robot, we can swap in the test robot's analytical model into the world model and use a modified cost function to execute actions. Let's take a closer look at the architecture. First, we feed in the image with the robot mask down, the action, and the robot state into the world model. Because we have access to the robot dynamics model, we can also compute the future robot state and feed that into the world model as well. The world model then outputs the future image. We train the world model with the world loss, which only penalizes errors in the non-robot portions of the image. Note that the robot dynamics model will be swapped out during transfer with the test robot dynamics model, and the world model is reused. We can use the principle of robot awareness for the planning cost as well. For example, we have a current image with the robot and object in scene, and a goal image with just the object. If we just use the pixel cost, we find that the robot dominates the cost, making this cost unsuitable for planning. In contrast, the robot aware cost only computes costs over the world regions of the image, so it is unaffected by the robot. Our hypothesis is that using the robot aware dynamics model and cost function enable better prediction and control on the new robots. We validate our approach on a number of robot transfer tasks spanning six different robots. I'll now highlight our experiment on an extreme case of robot transfer. We first train an object pushing controller on about 15 hours of random interaction data collected from a Widow X two finger gripper robot. Then we transfer it to a seven degree of freedom Franca with a peg end effector. We find that only RAC can reliably push objects. The baselines suffer from two major failure modes, poor dynamics prediction and a noisy cost function. We evaluate our method on a variety of robots and tasks, both in real world and simulation. From training on a single robot data set, RAC outperforms the visual foresight baseline, a domain adaptation baseline with privileged access to the test robot, and ablations. Even after training the baselines on multiple robots to improve their generalization, RAC still vastly outperforms them. Here we show some policy rollouts. 
On the unseen robot, we command the policy to push the bear to the right or pick and place the block by specifying these goal images. We can see that the baseline fails completely in pushing. For pick and place, the baseline can reach for the object but fails to pick and place the object since it's worse at modeling object interactions. In comparison, the robot aware control policies can transfer zero shot to the new robot and successfully push and pick in place. To give more insight, we visualize the trajectories generated during planning for each method. Here are the top five planning trajectories of the baseline model with the goal image on the right column. The goal is to push the watermelon down. The baseline method transfers poorly to the new Franco robot. It treats the Franco robot as a background and moves the training robot in random directions to optimize the cost. In contrast, our method outputs sensible plans where the robot pushes the watermelon downwards. So here we show some quantitative prediction results. We either train on videos of multiple robots or just the single Widow X. Then we evaluate the zero shot prediction on the unseen Franco robot. We use PSNR and SIN, which are common metrics for the video prediction, so the higher the better. We show that the robot aware model outperforms video prediction models that only use the image, as well as video prediction models that both use image and robot state. So here are two pushing videos. The model is given the first frame of the video and we predict the rest of the frames. We can see that the baseline model doesn't do too well. The octopus doesn't move much and the shark disappears into the background. On the other hand, the robot aware model shows better object permanence and movement over the baselines. Our robot aware model can use robot dynamics to accurately predict robot movement, which in turn reduces uncertainty about object interaction. I'll briefly mention some additional experiments. We find similar trends in the few shot transfer setting. In few shot prediction, we fine tune the models on videos of the test time robot, such as the Widow X. The baseline can now accurately predict the test time robot, the Widow X, but the object, as you can see, disappears over time. The fine tuned robot aware model can predict the object uh, without it disappearing. So as a result, we we get better control results in the few shot setting as well. We also find that robot over control can achieve human goal images by just masking the human arm out of the image. So the takeaway is spatially disentangling the robot from the rest of the world enables transferring visual policies to unseen robots. Check out our website and come by a poster for more info. Thank you. Hi, my name is Brinald Kalakrishnan, and I work at Everyday Robots. We are a team at Alphabet, and we were originally under the umbrella of X, or Google X, as we used to call it. So what do we do at Everyday Robots? Our goal is to create learning robots that help people with many different tasks in their everyday lives. And this requires operating robots in natural human spaces all the time. Unlike a factory or a typical structured environment where you might find a robot today, Human environments are messy, unpredictable, and uncertain. In these everyday human environments, generalization is really key. Because our robots, they are never going to see the same state twice. Each situation is different from every other. Here are some example images that our robot camera captures from a waste sorting task. And here you can see the literal messiness and diversity in the world. And of course, this is just one task of many that we want to solve with our robots. So how do we address these issues? In this talk, I'm going to walk you through a few different strategies we've used over the years to address generalization in policy learning and applying this to the real world. I've grouped them into four buckets here, large scale data collection, simulation, multitask learning, and cross domain transfer learning. But before I proceed, I just want to point out and acknowledge that all the work I'm presenting today was done in collaboration with Robotics at Google. They've been a great research partner to us on our journey towards realizing everyday robots. All right, let's jump in. Um, the first bucket is large scale data collection. So in some ways, this is the most simple and effective way to achieve good generalization. It's also what basically kicked off the deep learning revolution by training models on millions of diverse images uh, in the ImageNet challenge, we saw that these models were able to generalize quite convincingly 
So that made us think, could we do the same with robotics? So luckily in 2015, when we first started looking into all of this, we also found a collection of robots that were lying unused from a previous project at Alphabet. So what we did was we put them all together in a room. This was around 15 or 20 of them. And we started collecting data with them. We gave each of these robots a tray and a bunch of objects to play with. This way we could also run them continuously without any human intervention, even overnight. And here are the kinds of objects we got for our robots, thousands of objects. In fact, finding new objects for our robots to play with was kind of a challenge in itself. But we were really hoping that this scale and diversity of data would allow us to train models that could generalize well. Here you can see what the data collection process looked like. So we ended up collecting around 800,000 grasps using this method over the course of two months using anywhere between six and 14 robots at any given point in time. So a lot of data. And what did we do with all of that data? Our first attempt here was to train a simple supervised learning model. Um, and this model took in the camera image and a proposed robot action. And we were trying to predict the probability of success. Um, so we are calling this a critic model. And the action here is defined as the delta between the current pose of the gripper and the final grasp pose. So this is kind of an approximation of the true problem, uh, but it makes sure that we can learn this using supervised learning. Essentially, we're converting the problem into a one-step contextual bandit. So how did that turn out? So we saw that this method achieved a success rate of anywhere between 67% and 80%. Um, and this was actually on these novel, diverse objects that we hadn't trained our robots on. The variation in success rates is because we actually ran this experiment on two different sets of robots at different points in time with different uh, setups. And so there was a natural variation in what the robots could achieve. But let's take a look at what the behavior looked like. So in this video, you'll first see the cross-entropy method process that we used to sample good actions from the neural network. The network doesn't produce actions itself, it produces probabilities given an action. So what we do in practice is that we, we run this model multiple times per grasp. So we pick a good action using the cross entropy method or CEM, we execute it for a little bit, and then we rerun the model. And so this has the effect of doing visual servoing because the model is trained with images where the gripper is in the camera view. And so it's able to choose relative actions to get closer to objects. And it turns out that this visual serving was actually the key to its success because our robots were not really well calibrated. Question now is, can we boost performance even further? Because 80% isn't quite good enough for real world applications. Okay, our next attempt was to turn to reinforcement learning. And so by this, we remove the contextual bandage approximation. So we used the same setup but we live, developed a novel form of Q-learning for continuous actions that we call QT-opt. So the model is very similar here, but this time we are estimating the expected reward that we could get by taking in particular action and then following the optimal policy. So it's, in a sense, that's the Q value. And this change ended up pushing the grasp success rate to 96%, which we were really happy with. But even better than that was the six, um, was the kind of closed loop behavior we saw when executing the policy on robots. Let's take a look at some examples. So now this model, since it's using reinforcement learning, it can actually reason over sequences of actions. So you see some really interesting and novel things like here you see that the robot is able to isolate objects before grasping them. So here it's breaking apart this block puzzle and grasping one object at a time. Um, in this next video, you'll see the robot trying to grasp some fairly challenging objects. None of these objects were in the training set. And also you see that the operator is trying to confuse the robot while it's doing the task. Uh, but the robot realizes quickly that something went wrong and is able to recover from it. So at the end of the day, we've ended up with a pretty robust policy for grasping objects and it generalizes pretty well as well. But to get to this state, we had to use you know, for this robot, we used seven robots running in parallel all day and night for four months. So that can be quite prohibitive. Um, so what can we do to improve the situation? 
Uh, what we did is we turned to simulation. So this is the next bucket of techniques I want to talk about. Why simulation? Um, as we just saw, collecting large volumes of robot data is expensive and time consuming. We needed to build these arrays of robots. It's also fairly sensitive to changes in the setup. So for example, um, if we changed the robot appearance or anything in the setup, we'd see a drop in performance unless we also introduced similar variations in the training data. So we need to overcome this somehow. Um, the promise of simulation is that we can virtually set up any environment we want, and we can programmatically randomize various aspects of them and use them to collect giant volumes of data that we can train our models on. So this sounds awesome, but of course there's a catch. Simulation doesn't look and feel exactly like a real robot in a real environment. So for example, here's a simulated image, he has a real image from the same task, and the difference in what these images look like or the difference in physics is what we call sim to real gap. So because of this gap, if we train a model just in simulation and try to use it in the real world, it's usually gonna fail catastrophically. Our models would just overfit to simulation and not do well at all in the real world. So over the years, we've developed a number of techniques which try to address the sim to real gap and that helps us actually leverage simulation to reduce the amount of real world data we need to train policies. Most of our work has actually gone into reducing the visual gap that you see here. Um, and we've primarily relied on GANs to do this. So let's dive into some of those techniques. Our first work in this space was called GRASP GAN. So let me talk you through how this works. At the core of this technique, we're essentially training this generator network. The generator network converts simulated images into realistic looking ones. Um, and just like a standard GAN, we also have a discriminator. What the discriminator is doing is it takes these generated real images as well as real images, and it learns a classifier which tries to distinguish the real image from the generated real one. And at the same time, the generator is always trying to fool this discriminator into thinking that these generated real images are actually real ones. So that's a great setup for generating realistic looking images. But we have one issue for using that in robotics. What's crucial here for us is that the semantics of the scene matter a lot. So for example, the generator should not be moving the positions of objects around, even though, even if the, the resulting real image looks really real. Um, and so we need to actually ground this transformation in something that we know. Um, so that's why we actually introduced these task networks here. So the task network that we use here is essentially the same as the supervised learning critic model that we spoke about earlier. Um, and we apply the critic model to, to these simulated images as well as the generated real images. And that makes sure that before the transformation as well as after the transformation, the task network is doing the same thing. We also apply the task network to the real images as well, and we find that that helps. There's actually a couple of other details needed to make this work, such as feature level domain adaptation, as well as task specific semantic segmentation output from the generator. Um, you can take a look at our paper for those details, but let me move on to future work we where we actually got rid of these task specific issues. Um, the next thing we built was called RL Cycle GAN. Um, this is built, this is modeled off of Cycle GAN, which is a fairly well known technique. So, in a Cycle GAN, what we do is we start off with the original GAN concept that I mentioned earlier, where we transform simulated images to real images. But then we also train another generator which converts real images to sim. And the purpose of doing this is that after these two transformations, we want to make sure that the original simulated image is very similar to the finally generated sim image. And so that can be done using the cycle consistency loss here. So that kind of closes the loop and it helps resolve a lot of these consistency issues in semantics. Um, we're still gonna ground these networks um, in a task. And so here we have the Q network that we trained earlier with QT opt for grasping. And we apply that to the sim images as well as real ones. And we make sure that um, each of these Q networks performs similarly. We also have a mirror image of this. And so 
in the lower section we see you know we start with real images apply a real real to sim generator which is the same as this one get a generated sim image then convert that back to real using the sim to real generator which is the same as the one above um, and close the loop around this as well and so this completes this picture of RL cycle again um, and this you know definitely outperforms grasp scan as well as gets rid of some task specific uh, information um, but we still have some limitations i think the main drawback with both of these approaches is that we needed real world episodes to be collected with some pre-existing policy for a specific task so in this case we already had episodes for grasping and so we were able to use those and that's needed because we want to run these queue networks on a, on that offline real data um, but we want to see if we can try and overcome that limitation somehow. So the next step that we took was to try and use object detectors. So instead of using a robot task, um, here we've simply substituted object detectors in, in its place. So we have the same setup as before with the cycle GAN. Um, and now you see that there's no robot specific or task specific information needed in here. All we have are you know, the same setup with an object detector, and we have a perception consistency loss that essentially compares bounding box outputs and ensures consistency between them. And so the big benefit of this is that the generator is actually task agnostic. And we demonstrate this in the paper by reusing the same generator that was trained on images from the grasping task. And we train a new pushing task in the same scene um, but we can train it now entirely in SIM. And this policy works at 90% in the real world without using any real world data. So we are quite happy with this. And right now, actually, this is our method of choice for all new learning tasks. But of course, that's not to say that there isn't more work required in this area. Let's take a quick look at what this looks like. So Retina GAN was applied to three different tasks as I mentioned, grasping, pushing, but also this door opening task to kind of show the diversity in its performance. And here you see some images um, and examples of what the generator is doing. So on the left, you have the sim image, and on the right, you see how Retina GAN is actually adapting that to realistic looking images. All right, let's move now to the third area of exploration, multitask learning. The promise of multitask learning is is very appealing. Surely, if a robot has learned 100 different tasks, learning the 101st one should be a lot faster and easier. There are so many things in common that should only be need to be learned once, such as how the robot arm looks, how to move it around in space, how objects behave when interacted with, and so on. But so far, we've still been learning each new task entirely from scratch. In the next couple of projects, I'll show you what we've been working on to try and change the status quo. So in this first work, we extended QT opt to the multitask setting. So this upper part here is the original QT opt Q network training. And the main change here is that we're also feeding in this task ID to the Q network. And it's represented as a one hot vector. Um, and so this lets us essentially feed a lot of data from multiple different tasks into the same network. Um, what we found was that naively throwing a lot of data into this didn't necessarily work that well. The way we chose our tasks um, was designed so that they have some amount of overlap with each other. The tasks included generic picking, semantic picking, generic placing, as well as placing them in specific locations on a fixture. So there's some overlap. And we were able to relabel successes for some tasks as success for some and failures for other tasks. But even that had to be done somewhat carefully so that we didn't flood the system with irrelevant examples. Another crucial component was how we rebalanced the data. So we couldn't just like take one example and label it as a negative for everything else. That would, you know, that would not result in a good training setup. Um, so what we found was that for the task which had the most amount of data, so for example, generic picking, the network actually performed very similar to just training on that task alone. And that's uh, kind of an expected result. But what we saw was that for the task with very little data, the performance improvement was dramatic. On the very rare tasks, 
we got an average success rate of 50%. And this is compared to 1% if we'd only trained on each rare task separately and 18% for a naive multitask QT after implementation. So that's great. Um, this does allow us to learn new tasks faster. But one big limitation here is the use of this task ID. The ID in itself doesn't have any semantic meaning. And that means that this system is not able to do zero shot generalization to new tasks because new tasks would essentially be a new ID which the robot doesn't know anything about. So could we use a better form of task conditioning instead? OK, and that's exactly what we did in this next work. So here we attempted to do language conditioning. So in theory, this should allow us to do zero-shot generalization. One change we made here was we we're also using behavior cloning for this work. So we are training a policy here and not a queue function. So the policy directly outputs robot actions. The policy takes in camera images, just like before, but also takes in text instructions, which command to perform a particular task. We use an off-the-shelf sentence embedding model to feed the commands in. And the data is, um, um, we get the data by teleoperating these robots using a VR controller. We collected data of 100 different tasks, and this included pick and place, wiping, dragging, pushing, knocking over various objects. Um, our definition of task is such that each combination of objects is defined as a new task. So for example, placing grapes in a bowl versus placing them in a tray are two different tasks. But this still allows us to test out compositional generalization to entirely new tasks. So for example, if the training data only contained placing grapes in a tray, but placing other objects in a bowl, could we have our policy generalized to the new instruction, place grapes in the bowl? And the answer here is yes. That actually works. Here you see some videos of new instructions that we gave our robots. Um, overall, we were able to achieve 32% success rate on these held out tasks. This is not super high, but what's interesting to note is that most of the failures are kind of last centimeter errors. So we, we see that the policy goes towards the right objects, but sometimes it fails to close the gripper at the right time, or maybe it doesn't let go of the object at the right time, and so on. So we're still quite happy with this result, although there's a lot more work to do. We think that perhaps combining this with reinforcement learning could be one way to improve this. All right, that takes us to the last topic I wanted to touch on, which is cross-domain transfer learning. What exactly do I mean by that? So there's a lot of other domains, such as natural language or images, and they really benefit from giant, diverse data sets. Throwing a lot of computation power at these data sets has definitely yielded really impressive results of late. Um, but in robotics, we don't yet have data sets of such size and diversity. So the question then is, can we somehow leverage these data sets and models in other modalities and use them to improve robot task performance? Recently, we made our first foray into this area. So let's take a look. So we started off with large language models. These models have a huge wealth of information in them about the real world and about how different tasks might be performed. So we were very interested in seeing if we could use these to plan high level tasks based on natural language instructions. So something like this, you know, as a user, we wanna say, I spilled my drink, can you help? But if you try to use these language models out of the box, they give you some responses that you really can't use to control the robot. You know, these are some examples of responses that we got, and that's not really helpful when programming a robot. But what we found is we can actually do this if we ground the large language model in the robot's actual abilities. So we provided the large language model with a set of possible commands that those are shown over here. And we also have value functions for each of these commands. So the value function essentially tells us how likely each command is to succeed from the robot's current state. And we can also think of this as an affordance function. And on the left, you also have the scores given by the language model for each of these commands, right? So the, the input query here is, how would you put an apple on the table? 
And here you see the, the LLM scores and on the right, the value functions. And essentially, we can combine the two and get the next best action for the robot to perform. Um, so this system lets us take a really high level text instruction, which, is, which can be quite arbitrary. And the system breaks it down into individual steps for which we have other policies that can execute them. Many of the low level policies are learned using text condition behavior cloning, just like one of the previous examples I showed you. And there are value functions that are obtained using text conditioned reinforcement learning. So let's take a look at an example of this. So here's the robot and the setting. And here is our user who's going to give it the instruction. I spilled my Coke on the table. How would you throw it away and bring me something to help clean? All right, so let's see what the robot is about to do. So on the right, you see these blue bars, which show the score given by the language model. And the red bars show the score given by the affordance function, or the value functions. And the green bar shows the combined score. So right now, pick up the Coke can, got the best score. Now go to the trash can. Let's see what it does next. Put down the Coke can. All right, it's going to do that. Didn't quite drop it into the trash, but that wasn't actually an option or a command that we had. OK, now it seems like it's going to the table, picking up the sponge. All right. What's next? All right, go to the table. It's navigating all the way to the table. All right, put down the sponge. So far, so good. OK, it's done. We didn't have a low-level primitive for wiping just yet, so the user has to wipe the table for now. But you know that's something we can work on in the future. Anyway, there's a lot of other examples as well that you can see on our website, uh, so do check it out. This work was called SayCan, if you want to Google that. OK, so let's summarize. So at Everyday Robots, we've been on a quest to learn how to make robots perform tasks and generalize really well in the real world. In partnership with Robotics at Google, we've investigated four broad strategies for tackling generalization. large-scale diverse data collection, large-scale simulation, and closing the sim to real gap, multitask learning, which can help learn new tasks faster or even generalize to new tasks. And finally, our first attempt at leveraging rich knowledge from another domain to solve robotics tasks. In practice, all of these strategies play a huge role in our end goal of having policies for robots that can handle the uncertainties of the real world and generalize well to new tasks and situations. The story is clearly not complete here, each of these definitely has more avenues to explore and maybe even new ideas. Um, in particular, I'm really excited about further prospects in multitask learning, as well as trying to see how we can leverage these rich language and vision models to kind of address or alleviate our data collection problem in robotics. All right, thank you for listening. I'm happy to take any questions that you might have. Also, if you're interested in working on any of these topics right now or in the future, we're hiring, so do check out our website, everydayrobots.com, or just get in touch with me. Thanks.
Hi everyone, uh, welcome to our live QA session and uh, thank you for listening to our invited talk. So hi, uh, Dr. Marino. So we have collected some questions from our questionnaires. So basically you, in your talk, you just mentioned four strategies for journalizing in the real world and it seems attendees also ask questions about these different perspectives. So the first question is about the uh, a uh, large scale data collection, and I will just read this question. What kind of policies you use to collect the large scale object grasping data set? And it seems the data collecting policy will definitely influence the property of the data set. Do you have any insights about choosing the policy to collect data? That's a question. Yeah, thank you for the question. So, I mean, you know the, the question is absolutely right like the, the policy you have to collect the data has a huge influence on what you end up learning um you know in practice what we did is like these data collection projects like, they run over courses of months and so we start off by sort of like engineering a policy so you can imagine that we just you know go somewhere in the bin and just randomly close you know go to a random location close your fingers come up and that would give us the 10 to 15% success rate. And then it's a process of bootstrapping from that, you know, training your first model and then running the model, which then gets higher and higher performance. And so, so even once you get into the, the world of RL, you know, it's a similar situation where you start from something, it may not be very performant and then over time it gets better and better. And so um, that's generally how we collected the data. Um, in practice, uh, we are also in parallel experimenting with different models or different algorithms and so on. So actually like all of that data gets fed in. So it's not really like a constant, um, you know, strategy, but like we mix all the data from different strategies. And so that's also, you know, leads us to focus a lot on offline RL and batch RL. Yeah, it seems the most uh, safe strategy we can use before running experiments. Yeah, okay. Thank you. Then uh, the second question is about the simulation strategy you mentioned before. So the question is like, in the Retina game paper, you used some sort of training signals from object detection. So comparing the training signals from tasks and from some predefined intermediate visual representations, just like uh, object detection, can you discuss the benefits of each one side? So comparing task signals and uh, object detection signals. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. So, you know, in fact, if we compare Retina again with the previous work, like the RL cycle again, I think that is the main difference there, right? And I think so. Maybe there's two things that I could point to. Like one is that when we use only task signals to to train these GANs. Um, the amount of supervision that you get is very low. It's like one number, right? It's the reward. And that has to essentially like help to train these networks. Whereas with object detection, you're, you're you know, also using the position of every object and bounding box and so on. So that it's a little bit more dense uh, supervision. Um, the other benefit that we saw there is that object detection is task independent. So as long as you're doing some task in the same scene, you can actually reuse that GAN across like multiple different RL tasks and rewards. Uh, so that's the other benefit we saw by switching to the object detection supervision. Great answer. And there is one more question about uh, uh, language in learning. So the question is like, several paper you just presented utilize natural language as instructions to help robot complete the tasks there are also many papers using demonstration videos as instructions to guide the robots. In your opinion, what are the advantages of using language as instructions? That's a question. Yeah, thanks, thanks for that question. In fact, I think maybe the second last work that I presented, it's called BCZ. We, we did have um, two components. One was about natural language and the other one was about learning from demonstration videos. I just didn't 
didn't highlight that part of it. Mm -hmm. um, in my opinion, I think both of these are valuable. Mm -hmm. It really depends on the use case, right? And so mm -hmm. I think, you know, ultimately when we want, we want to use robots and, you know, teach them new tasks, it will probably be through a combination of language as well as demonstrations, you know, kind of like how we might teach children how to do new things, right? Like, you know, we, we might start off by like showing them something and, you know, they pick up initial skills that way, but later on, you know, we typically tell them how to do things through language. Um, so I think, you know, I don't think one's better than the other or anything like that. It just feels like, you know, we'll need to, to do both and make both methods of instruction really good if we wanna succeed at having these generalizable robots. I see. Okay. So that's pretty much for the live Q&A session. Thank you so much for answering those questions. And thank you for the excellent talk you gave today. And uh, have a great day. Thank you. Cool. Thank you. Thank you for inviting me. Mm -hmm. Hi, this is Xiaolong. I'm an assistant professor from UC San Diego. Today, I will talk about our work on generalizing dexterous manipulation by learning from humans. Objects in our daily life are designed for human hands to use. To enable robots for general purpose, it would be ideal to allow robots to have the same flexibility as humans using multi-finger hands to manipulate objects. In this talk, we talk about the recent efforts in our group on dexterous manipulation. Compared to a parallel gripper, a dexterous hand is composed by multiple manipulators of fingers that can cooperate to grasp and manipulate objects. With high flexibility, it comes with much more challenges. The discontinuities uh, in, in the interaction pattern makes it very hard to, con to model. And the non-stationary context also increase the difficulty in control. And finally, the high degree of freedom of the dexterous hand makes reinforcement learning very hard to learn. Oftentimes, we see using reinforcement learning alone to train policy with high dimensional observations and actions, it can easily to lead to unsafe behavior. One way to relieve this problem is to use imitation learning from human demonstrations. Dexterous hand actually provides more opportunity in this direction compared to a two finger parallel gripper where human needs to mimic the 2D gripper using a multi finger hand are more aligned with human hands and thus allow the use of more lateral human manipulation demonstrations or even daily life human videos for learning. By learning from humans, perform human-like operation with dexterous hand, we find that it can quite robustly transfer across objects and also perform scene to real transfer. So we find this is quite fascinating because you would think that manipulator with high degree of freedom is harder to transfer. But if you are doing it right, like what human do, it has to, appears to be much easier to transfer and generalize to unseen objects and the real world. There are a lot of work that tries to collect human demonstrations using teleoperation through a VR device. These techniques are applied for both parallel gripper and multi-finger hands in different literature. However, all these approaches are faced the problem of flexibility and scalability. To use the VR device is not really that straightforward, and especially when the controller is not matching the manipulator or the operator in real robots or simulator, it makes a lot of effort to learn to uh, manipulate objects. A lot of the, all these uh, devices, especially for dexterous hands, the gloves people use here are not really quite available everywhere, which makes it hard to scale up the data collection. So is there a better way to scale up human demonstrations to allow robots to learn better from humans? To achieve this, we look into the current development of 3D computer vision. There are actually a lot of work studying on um, human 3D human understanding, the interactions of human and objects. There are also works that look into hand object pose estimation. However, 
most works are still focusing on the vision problem itself. In computer vision, we're still very, uh, we, we still try to minimize uh, the millimeters of post estimation error or reconstruction error. But it is unclear how this can help robot to learn. In this talk, I'm going to collect the 3D understanding of humans and objects in computer vision to dexterous manipulation. I will show how does the 3D vision technique uh, we, we, can, we use can help robots to scale up demonstration collection and perform imitation learning. So this is a robot arm set up uh, in our lab that can grasp and relocate an object using a dexterous head. So in our lab, we have three directions of efforts uh, towards the goal of generalizing dexterous manipulation. We have studied on learning from human videos, uh, which, uh, which we try to understand human behaviors from videos and ask robots to do the same. We have also used grass affordance to guide learning. We study on how human hands and objects can contact and use it to help dexterous manipulation. And finally, we also study a teleoperation, but simply, uh, but, but the simplify the, the teleoperation process to use only one single camera uh, with an iPad. And we also decided a new mechanism to provide a more intuitive way to do the data collection. Of course, all these efforts will be aiming at making the robot hand to work in the real world settings. We perform simple transfer under our framework. So uh, there are three directions. I'm going to talk about the first direction. Um, using human videos about the first direction. Um, using human videos to help dexterous manipulation. Our goal here is try to estimate the 3D structure from human videos and generate 3D demonstrations for imitation learning. We propose DexMV, a new benchmark for dexterous manipulation and a new platform using imitation learning from human videos. So Dex MV stands for dexterous manipulation from human videos. We collect paired tasks where humans and the simulated robot hands are asked to do the same thing. So in here, we have human relocating objects, pouring waters, and place the banana inside the container. And then similarly, we have the pair robotic environment with the hand doing the same tasks. And here's our pipeline. Um, in, in, in the whole framework. So in our Dex and we platform, we have the platform to collect human demonstrations. In here, we are grasping a sucker box uh, and record the video. With this video, we can um, perform 3D pose estimation and 60 object pose estimation. We then convert these human demonstrations using retargeting technique to robot demonstrations. We use these robot demonstrations together with reinforcement learning we perform uh, an imitation learning to train a policy that can generalize to many different configurations of grasping the objects. So I'm going to talk about our computer vision system first in this work. What we do here is basically we have a setup that we have a real sense camera and then record the human videos on manipulating the objects. So in here, we are relocating one object and estimating the pose the 60 posts of objects and the 3D hand posts. And similarly, we have a lot of tasks that basically pouring beans into the container. We can estimate the 3D information from the videos collected. Um, this collect data collection process is very efficient. We can collect 100 demonstrations in one hour. So this is much more simpler and more efficient than using a real device or a glove. And it's more scalable as well because you use only one real sense camera. After we have the human demonstrations, um, because human and robot hands are different in both geometry and kin kin kinematics, we need to perform hand motion retargeting to translate human demonstrations to robot demonstrations. The way to do it is to match the task space vector 
between the human hand and the robot hand. So the touch space vectors are the green arrows showed uh, on the right of the figure. Basically, you can see the dotty green arrows that is connecting to the hand palm to the, to the fingertip. So we mark, match these vectors uh, between human hand and robot hand to perform the retargeting. So once we perform the robot hand retargeting, we can simply, uh, simply just translate the human demonstrations to the robot demonstration as shown on the right side. So here is another example. Once we get these robot demonstrations, uh, note that this demonstration's translation uh, is translated in a kinematic space. Um, so we don't consider the dynamics of interaction between the object in hand during the translation. So this is actually an animation um, show in here for the demonstration. So once we collect these demonstrations, uh, we can actually use it together uh, um, with reinforcement learning to perform imitation learning. So the goal of imitation learning in here is to train a policy um, that, can, that takes in hand and object state and then output action to take to, to basically manipulate the objects. We are aiming at training a policy that can generalize to many different configurations, not just following or copying one specific demonstration. Okay. So the imitation learning algorithm we are using DAPG uh, is a very simple framework that combines a reinforcement learning term and a behavior cloning term. So you basically use our demonstration uh, wired behavior cloning to provide the policy a general guidance on how to manipulate objects and also use the reinforcement learning term uh, to, to tune the policy a little bit to get the physics and interaction correct. So here are some results showing the demo, uh, the imitation learning results. So like manipulating with this high dimension uh, degree of freedom of uh, robot hands actually is very, very challenging. If you use reinforcement learning alone, uh, you will learn very random behavior. But if you learn with the human demonstrations, it actually gives you much better results and more lateral results as well. So here are two examples on relocating objects uh, on the right is using demonstrations, on the left is just using only RL. And for more complex tasks, like putting the banana into the, the, the mark, um, reinforcement learning alone will basically fail to success. It's very hard to, to achieve this task with only RL, but with imitation uh, on human demonstrations, it's much easier. And here is a lot of examples of pouring the beans uh, from the cups into the container. And Again, we show a large advantage using our demonstrations from human videos. Uh, one interesting thing is that we can see that using imitation learning can also allow the hand to perform human-like operation that can robustly transfer to even slightly different objects. So these two marks are actually uh, some new marks that are not seen during training time, but we are somehow still able to transfer it uh, after uh, during test time. Um, but it's just a little bit different. We find that if the grasping is robust enough, it can actually transfer to a slightly different object. So all this work um, is done with using the, the human videos collected in the lab. So can we actually generalize to collect the data, uh, the human videos um, more in the wild setting? So uh, we, we actually have tried that to, to try to download YouTube videos to do, do this work. But then we find that the current 3D pose estimation and 60 object pose estimation techniques are really not really working to obtain robust and reliable demonstrations. To make uh, 3D hand pose working better, uh, we also have efforts that try to use semi-supervised learning that can generalize 3D hand pose estimation uh, more in more in the wild video. So this is uh, some results on hand pose estimation on the something something video data set. And we try to make it generalizable to more videos, looks like this. And to generalize the 60 object pose estimation, uh, we also recently collected a new data set. It's a more object-centric RGBD video uh, data set. And then we can basically use it to help us to boost the uh, ob 60 object pose estimation. We will release this data set soon, um, but this is basically this is uh, uh, some initial visualization for the data set that we use the iPhone to, to basically go around the objects and then put objects in many random places and not just in the lab. 
and we, we basically can go, have collected 5,000 videos across 1,700 objects. And this, this data set can help us to, to uh, perform this kind of very robust um, 60 object post estimation in category level in the wild. And we hope that by doing well in this kind of post estimation, it helps us to uh, perform DEX and we better. Okay, so that's the work from learning from human videos. Besides learning from human videos, we also study on the context between the human hand and the objects. So in the next work, we are going to introduce our second direction on using graphs of photons to help us to, um, to collect demonstrations and perform imitation learning. So this is actually a work uh, that published in ICCV that given the object, we reason about the human hand and object context and generate the graphs, a reasonable human graphs on top of the input objects. So the input of this work um, is basically using um, uh, using a point cloud of the objects, the output will be the grasp. And here is some uh, a visualization of the input and output putting together. And here are more visualizations that we can generate different human grasp uh, on, on a given 3D objects. So can we use this kind of technique to help us to perform dexterous manipulation? So in this work, we are going to leverage the affordance prediction technique in our ICCV paper to collect grass demonstrations for large scale of objects. By training on large, these large scale demonstrations, the policy can also generalize to unseen objects in test time. So what we're doing here is essentially, we generate the human grass using our affordance prediction model, and then use it as a goal for the cross entropy mapper to plan uh, and generate a robot hand trajectory to reach the object in the same way. So we collect demonstrations that allows the robot hand to reach and touch the objects as humans do. Um, here are some examples. Uh, we generate these kinds of um, um, the trajectories uh, using this affordance model as the goal uh, on different objects. And you see category level basically means that across different categories, uh, we have uh, tons of object instance that we can gen first generate a human grasp and then generate the robot hand that do the same grasping. Um, so we, we study on five categories and each category we, we basically collect a thousand trajectories. So here are some examples that we can basically collect uh, how the human hand can reach the rope, the bottle and grasp the bottle using our affordance model. And then here is basically a lot of examples showing that how the human hands can reach and touch the, the camera category. And 1000 trajectories are collected for each category for training. Uh, as demonstrations. To utilize these demonstrations and achieve the goals of generalization to unseen objects, we use the point neck to learn a generalizable 3D representation for decision making. Um, so our first step of learning is actually to use our large scale demonstrations to perform behavior cloning or supervised learning to train the 3D point neck representation. And then once the representation is pre-trained, we can then train the policy on top using both the reinforcement learning interaction data and the demonstrations as what, what we did for the DEX and we pipeline. But in here, it's just that the, de the, the demonstrations are uh, across different instances, not just a fixed instance. And we are training on the category level, not just an instance level. And the point net can be generalized across two different instances in the same category. But we do not stop learning the representation. As we collect more data during learning, we can use the reinforcement learning data back to perform 3D representation learning to update the point net. So we perform this learning in an interactive banner, alternating between learning the 3D representation and imitation learning for decision making. So in this way, it helps the policy actually to generalize to unseen objects uh, during testing. So here are, are basically examples uh, on the left is basically a DAPG is the baseline that does not consider uh, using point net representation. On the right is our approach. We basically show that, we basically show that you can actually um, grasp the object robustly on unseen categories using our representation and decision-making 
um, uh, approach. Okay, so this is the part uh, we try to uh, using the, the affordance model to help us to generalize uh, dexterous manipulation across unseen objects in simulator. Finally, uh, I want to present our very recent also uh, efforts on using teleoperation to help us to learn dexterous manipulation. So before uh, showing our teleoperation system, I want to show some uh, videos of our policy, the train policy that is able to basically operate with the real robot hand in the real world. So this is flipping the cup into the original position. And this is the grasping the master bottle. And this policy we get you can try and can generalize to uh, grasping different objects in the real world with different hand, uh, different poses. And this is uh, these are more examples. Um, so by using our current system, we can basically um, finally transfer the policy that learned in the simulator uh, to the real world, have real world application. So our teleoperation system setup is actually quite simple. Um, different from using VR or glove, all we need is just uh, the setup is just a laptop and the iPad. So we only use the, the RGB camera in the iPad to to help us to uh, do the teleoperation. One core contribution and the cool thing about our system is that during teleoperation. We do not directly control the Android hand or the Allegro hand that we use to deploy. We find it is actually very challenging for the user to control a hand that is different from his or her own hand, especially for Allegro hand that has four fingers. It's really, really hard to do directly teleoperation. Instead, um, we create a customized hand which has the same degree of freedom, morphology, and even the size of the user hand in the physical simulator and perform provide a more intuitive way to perform teleoperation. So let's see the demonstration in here. Uh, the student in here is basically refers to 3D hand pose estimation, and then we convert the human hand to this kind of fake customized robot hands inside the simulator. This hand looks very much alike to human hands, but you can then do physical interaction inside the simulator. And it's very intuitive because we are do not doing any retargeting. We can directly use this human-like hand to do operation in the simulator. So here is the operations on opening a door inside the simulator. Uh, so here is our interface. On the bottom, you can see two different other views on, uh, of the camera as well. And then we basically um, can open this door using just a single camera and and a more intuitive way with this five-finger customized head. Once we collect the demonstrations with the customized robot hand, we can then perform retargeting to translate to different robot hands that we want to learn with. So we only need to collect demonstration once, and we don't do any retargeting during the demonstration collection, but we can obtain demonstrations for different robot hands by doing the retargeting after so for different robot hand, we just do another demonstration, uh, retargeting, and generate that demonstration from them. Um, so we can collect demonstration once and apply to many different robot hands. So here are some examples. Um, so on the top left corner, we are collecting the demonstrations using the customized robot hand. On the other, uh, other views, uh, we are basically doing retargeting um, to, to basically get the demonstrations for different robot hands. So here is opening a door. So you can see that um, we just need, only you need to collect demonstration once, and then we can get all the demonstrations for different robot hands. Once we get the demonstrations, we basically can perform imitation learning. We use similar technology uh, using DAPG, uh, similar to the previous work. And we basically consistently find that learning with demonstrations on the right can basically, uh, for different robot hands, we can generate more reasonable uh, robust and safe uh, robot uh, policies in here. So this, these are some um, policy illustrations, train policies 
um, in a simulation environment with free hands without a robot arm. Um, it works very, very nice. Um, but once you add the robot arms, actually it make, makes the task a little bit harder. So the very exciting part for this project for me is also that we are able to add the robot arm. Um, we can attach the, the electro hands on the robot arms and in the simulator using our de demonstrations to perform learning. And then this learn policy can be transferred to the real world as well. So in here specifically, we attached the electro hand on the robot arms and instead of using a free hand. You can see that using reinforcement learning alone in here can still do a reasonable job. But the, the problem is that um, you can see on the left, the way the object is crossed is in a very unnatural way and not a very stable way. And in our case, uh, using imitation learning on the right, we can perform a more robust grass, and then it's actually helping us to transfer to the real world better. And here are the, the, uh, the results when we transfer to the real world, and we can see that the policy chain with demonstrations on the right uh, can grasp the object more robustly, but the policy that chain with the reinforcement learning essentially failed to grasp the object because it's using a very unstable grass uh, uh, policy. Similarly, when flipping the cup, the reinforcement learning policy is trying, just trying to uh, touch the side of the cup. We can see it again. It's just trying to touch the side of the cup and then try to flip it. But on the other hand, um, our policy uh, learned from human demonstrations is trying to put the finger inside the, the, the cup and then we try to uh, flip the cup. So this policy, uh, trans when transferred to the real world, it becomes more robust. Um, but the reinforcement learning policy is no, there's no way that it can um, transfer to the real world and make the physics work that way. So, so it's interesting to see that, like using imitation learning, can actually allows the robot hand to perform more human-like operation, and this human-like operation can actually help you do better in seem to real transfer. Uh, to and 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 apply to the real world. So these are basically the three directions uh, we are exploring and continue exploring in the lab for dexterous manipulation. And there are also other efforts in computer vision in our lab that is trying to help us to better understanding uh, the articulated objects. So in the future, we will also extend manipulation on articulation uh, articulated objects. And we also um, is doing some work on predictions on large scale videos, egocentric videos, and we hope this data can also help us to learn better, better dexterous manipulation. So in general, uh, we are basically working towards, uh, the, the efforts are towards generalizing dexterous manipulation. And uh, we want to learn 3D representation from videos to help it. We also want to uh, learn, to free, learn from the 3D human videos, um, basically for, for imitation. So that's uh, the end of my talk. Um, and welcome any questions. Thank you. Hi, everyone. Welcome to our live Q&A session for Professor Xiaolong Wang's invited talk. And thank you, you all, for listening to this talk. So basically, we got several questions from the questionnaire. 
So Professor Xiaolong, I will just read this question to you. Okay, so the okay. first question is like, in the first work you presented, when converting human demonstrations into robot hand demonstrations, how do you get the dynamics information? For example, the actions in the robot hand demo and what are the skills of arrows in resulting robot actions? That's it. Right, so, um, so first, the, um, there are actually two parts. Um, so the first part is doing the kinematics retargeting. Um, so for the kinematics retargeting, there, there's basically no um, dynamics is considered. Um, so if you see, uh, go back to see the video, when you see the, uh, the hand is uh, pouring the cup, um, there's actually some penetrations happening there. Um, so this is basically an animation um, it's all geometry, there's no dynamics. And then after we 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 have this um um this kinematics trajectories, uh, and then we then apply some inverse dynamics model to to compute uh, basically the, the joint angles, the motions, uh, like 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 the force we we um that can get from these trajectories. Um so this the second part, um if you I didn't explain in here basically. But you can look in the paper that we have a second part that uh, is using some inverse dynamics model to compute the actions. Um, so, so that's where we get the action. Um, so it is indeed that um, the kinematics retargeting is not it's not very accurate in the sense that it does not really fit the dynamics of the simulator. Um, so the actions can be a little bit wrong uh, as well if you compute the, the actions using inverse dynamics model on this trajectory. Um, but we basically find that um, this trajectories with the not so accurate action still provides a very good guidance um, for imitation learning. And then the algorithm DAPG we use basically combine the behavior cloning and reinforcement learning together during learning. So essentially that's the reinforcement learning part helping you to uh, rectify the, the, dynam the dynamics part. Um, and, the, and the behavior cloning is using the demonstrations to provide, provide a more like a global guidance, uh, even though it's not very accurate. Um, so that's, yeah, so that's the overall, the, the, the background of this thing, yeah. That makes sense, thank you. And mm -hmm. let me read the second question. The second question is like, thanks for the excellent talk. You mentioned three strategies to achieve DAX manipulation. Among the three strategies, which one has the best generalization performance? I guess each of them has its unique benefits in generalization, right? Right. Yeah, so um, there are multiple sense of generalization. Um, so learning from videos, um, in, it, it generalizes in the sense that um, it, it provides some potential to collect uh, videos in like from YouTube, and then you can collect a lot of data in, in more general video. Although the, the post estimation is not working that well there, but once the, the vision works better, it basically has some potentials on, we can look at a lot of videos in learning. So hopefully that can provide some generalization. Um, in terms of teleoperation, it provides uh, basically a very accurate uh, contact um, um, in like basically, um, so, 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 because we are all basically just directly manipulating the in the dynamics um, simulator, the physical simulator, so so that we, we actually can get a more much better contact um, compared to like learning from videos. Um, but then it takes a little bit more time to collect it. Um, so, so what we do here is we try to offer to make the interface and system uh, much more easy to use using this kind of fake or customized hand. Um, so hopefully uh, in the future, we can also apply these systems on mechanical turkers, then everyone can basically just online and then can still collect this data. Um, but I feel like um, it's less easier to get more data compared to the video, but basically much better contact information. And finally, the affordance thing, um, so it gives us um, it generates infinite number of data for free, actually. Um, but then um, there are some restrictions, like the tasks you can perform. 
Um, so it gives some human prior, but currently most for grasping task, um, where the contact between the object and hand does not change. Um, so we, if you want to apply for tasks that actually the contact between hand and object needs to change, then um, using this affordance prior will have some limitation there. Um, but it gives you the most number of uh, uh, demonstrations for the current task we apply. Yeah, so so they are an easy way to 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 scale up data, but then the data has more limitation. We can get better data, but then uh, it's harder to to scale up. So that's the general. Uh, yeah, I see. I see. Yeah. It's like the quality of the data versus right. the amount of data, right? Yeah. Right, right. I so see. I think I would I would like to like maybe build a system to combine all like different sorts of data. Um, so, so this will be some long-term work we will do in the lab, um, basically, yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, and uh, there is one more question. So the question is, when studying robot manipulation, there are at least two directions to make things more challenging. One is to make agent really complicated, for example, DEX manipulation. And the other one is to make the task very, very complicated. For example, long horizon task or something like soft body right. manipulation. From your perspective, what are the different challenges in the two directions? Right. Um, so I think um, so. Yeah, if you it is really two different, very different directions. So I feel like when people are doing the long horizon tasks, um, solving this more complex task they often assume the low level uh, part is basically easy to achieve and solve. Um, so, so you just, you, you have some atomic actions, atomic policy, low level policy says pre-train and then you train a high level policy on top. And then you just assume the low level policy works. Um, so that's, that's just, um, um, I think that has a little bit limitation, right? So uh, it doesn't really, the low level policy doesn't really work um, if you try to generalize to a cross object, which is the, the, the purpose of this many skill um, challenge. Um, and then in terms of generalization from sim to real, um, this also there's facing a lot of problem uh, on this low level policy. Um, so, so I think we still have a lot to work to do actually to, to, to make the robot work uh, on this low level policies. And then um, the, the making the, the hand harder like like much much higher dimensions in action and state space. Um, in one glance, it seems to be making things much harder, but actually, uh, we find that if you learn the hand manipulation correctly, like operate like human, you actually can get better transfer or seem to real transfer or more but more robust to 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 the physical simulation gap between sim and real, um, because like you give. Like for example, for grasping, it gives you a much better closure. Um, so, so it actually transfer much better than the parallel gripper uh, from sim to real. Um, so it's a harder task, but then if you do it right, um, you actually um, it's, it's, it can solve and get better performance um, in, in terms of in the low level control. Um, yeah, so just that, that's my general idea. Like uh, we still have a lot of things, I think, to do with the, the very simple low level control thing um, is actually still very hard. And then um, and then we can, yeah, so so then we can maybe look into much complex long horizon to to like not try to ignore the low level part is like pretend the low level part is solved. And then we do the long horizon and low level part together uh, instead of like pretending the low level is already solved. I think that's something we need to aim at. Um, um, in the future, yeah. I see. I see. It's like we should build a more solid foundation before going to the right. Right. Yeah. Right. Okay. Right. I see. Yeah. Then that's pretty much all the questions for this live QA session. Thank you so much for coming today and also for your great talk. So Thank you. basically, that's it. Have a great okay. day. Thank you. All right. See you. Bye. Bye. Hello everyone, I'm Ning Wenpang from JDI Research.
It's my great pleasure to present and share our system for many skill challenges today. Actually, it's a collaborative effort with my colleagues, Ye Hao, Yi Hen, Tai Chi, Fu Chen, Gao Fan, Ting, and Tao. Meanwhile, I also want to thank the challenge organizer for hosting this wonderful challenge. In general, we present both learning from demonstration and heuristic rule-based methods for two tracks, the no interaction track and the no restriction track in this challenge. This challenge aims to develop object-level generalizable manipulation tool, which can generalize to unseen test objects after learning on training objects. The provided manuscript benchmark is very challenging for large diversities of objects and tasks. For example, the benchmark contains four different tasks, like open the door, open drawer, move bucket, and push chair. And it also includes 102 objects over four categories. The controlling systems are driven by four physics simulation. Depending on each task, one or two robot arms are connected to the robot body. There are 22 joints in a dual arm robot and 34 single arm robots. The action output contains platform, uh, voltage, platform angle, joint angle, robot pick, and the finger positions. This benchmark provides users with an egocentric and panoramic camera to capture both point cloud or RGB depth inks. Here, we summarize our contributions in this challenge for two tracks. One is a non-interaction track, and the other is a non-restriction track. So for the first track, which only use the provided demonstration trajectories, uh, our system investigates both imitation learning-based and offline resource learning-based approaches. Moreover, we also employ transform transformer-based hierarchical representation of objects and the robot arms. For the non-restriction track, we design a heuristic rule-based method, HRM in short, to decompose the tasks into a series of subtasks. So now we present our systems for non-interaction track in detail. So the system can be treated as a fusion of imitation learning and offline reinforcement learning. First, the imitation learning uh, in the imitation learning uh, policy is trained with supervised learning that directly imitates the behaviors of provided demonstrations. Can we say as the supervised learning? And for the offline reinforcement learning, we leverage the division transformer to cast the task of object manipulation as a sequence modeling problem. Moreover, we also design the hierarchical reputation from different abstraction levels to represent objects or robotic arts. So the hierarchical reputation includes three levels. The first the point level features, which denotes the geometric feature, texture feature, and the robotic feature for each point. And the second is the part level feature, which groups the points according to the provided masks, for example, the robotic arms, cabinet doors, and so on. And the third is the task level features, where we employ transformer over part level features to achieve the task level feature. And here we show the overall systems for our system for non interaction track. So next, we present our system for non-restriction track. The basic idea of our heuristic robot method is to facilitate object manipulation by decomposing each task into a series of subtasks. And then we survey each subtask with simple robot controlling strategies. And here, which uh, this figure is used to illustrate an overview 
of our heuristic draw based method. So we can see the subtask subtask subtasks uh, include the move steps step, which takes some action times and times, and also the subtask of move to, which takes some action until read target. And the non subtask is arm stabilization, which can keep the pose of arm stable. So, in particular, at the beginning of a manipulation task, HRM, that is our heuristic draw based method, will first estimate the attributes. For example, the location, shape, size, and orientation of the robot, target object, and target point. And from the observations, this initialization process is denoted as the environment observation in this figure. Next, in each observation action iteration, the first unfinished subtask is carried out for one step. Such iterations will stop when the robot successfully manipulates the object or takes more than 200 steps. And now comes the section of performance comparison. We first show the performance of each component in a far systems on non-interaction track. Uh, for example, the one we only using the imitation learning or using division transform mode. And the, the ensemble model presents the combination of two components. One is the imitation learning, and the other is division transform mode. So from this table, we can see the ensemble models a combined advantage of imitation learning and offline reference learning with division transform mode and then achieve the best performance on all tasks. And next, we show the final performance of our submissions on the leaderboard in non interaction track, where our system also achieved the best performance in both uh, evaluation stages. And last, we show the final performance of our sub submission on the leaderboard in non restriction track, where we can clearly see that the performance gap between train set and test set are significantly reduced due to the non data dependent feature of our heuristic raw based systems. Okay, thanks for your listening. Please note that we have already released all the source codes and models for our systems on GitHub. So, welcome to use sets.
Hello, um, welcome back. The last event of today is the award ceremony for the Many Skill Challenge. I will first summarize the results of the first Many Skill Challenge and then review the plan for the second Many Skill Challenge. And we will then give awards to the challenge winners. For those of you, those of you who are not familiar with Many Skill, let me introduce what it is. As the name suggested, many skill is a benchmark for manipulation skills. Here, the word skill refers to solving short horizon tasks. Then we want to define generalizable manipulation skills. If we think how humans learn to manipulate, we find that once we have learned to manipulate a category of objects, we will be able to manipulate even unseen objects of the same category despite the topological and the geometric variations. However, such generalizable manipulation policy is very hard to learn because we need to generalize over object geometry, topology, appearance variations. For example, to manipulate the swivel chairs, we must handle tested chairs different from training ones, which probably requires to discover some sort of knowledge about object structure like part, key point, or skeleton. We refer to such ability to interact with unseen objects within a certain category as the object level generalizability. And this kind of generalization is different from most existing RL generalization benchmarks like ArcGen, where the variation of individual objects is limited. To help summarize the results, let us introduce the tasks in many skills with some more details. Many skill currently includes four different physical manipulation tasks, each targeting at a distinct challenge. In the open, cab in open cabinet door task, we have a robot arm installed on a movable platform, and it needs to open the door of a cabinet. And this task exemplifies motions constrained by a revolute joint. In the open cabinet door task, a robot arm is required to pull out the drawer of a cabinet. In this task, exemplifies motions constrained by a kurtmatic joint. In a push chair task, two robot arms need to collaborate and push the chair to the target position indicated by a red ball. And this task exemplifies motions constrained on a plane through real ground contact. But in a move bucket task, two robot arms collaborate to lift a bucket and then move it to a platform. And note that there's the moving ball in the bucket, and this task exemplifies motions without constraints. To test the generalizability of policy learning, many skill challenge now includes a variety of 3D articulated objects in the benchmark. There's 162 objects over the four tasks in total, and each object is processed and verified to support manipulation. And the third feature of many skill is egocentric 3D visual input so that um, the inputs are represented as point clouds or RGBD data, which are captured from a simulated panor panoramic camera mounted on a robot. And lastly, we have also provided a large number of high quality demonstration trajectories for each training object of the task. We have 36,000 trajectories in total. With these demos, researchers can then sp spend less time on collecting trajectories and instead focus more on the interest aspects of the problem, such as network design or learning algorithms. So to sum up, many skill is the benchmark for learning generalizable manipulation skills and features four challenging man manipulation tasks, diverse articulated objects, egocentric 3D video inputs, and large scale demonstrations. And to accommodate for participants with different backgrounds, our challenge is arranged into three tracks. In the no interaction track, participants are only allowed to use provided demonstrations to build agents. In the no interaction with the environment is allowed. In the no external annotation track, both demonstrations and interactions with the environments are allowed. But no external annotation is allowed. And this is a track like a common setup of reinforcement learning. In the no restriction track, Participants are encouraged to solve the problems using any method. And note that the method must work for objects 
that the algorithm has never seen before, which is also difficult. After the intense preparation of the challenge by the organization team, we launched the challenge on July the 29th, 2021. And over 40 teams registered. And after over five months of competition, seven teams have received the final awards. The winning teams will be announced soon. And thank you for our sponsors, Qualcomm AI, awards worth $20,000 have been given out. So next, let me summarize the major results from the many scale challenge. Let us first check which track is the most difficult. Considering that even learning policies on the learning on the training set would be challenging. We use the metric as averaging the training set performance and the testing set performance and give them 50% weight for each. So under this metric, for each track, we can compute the average score across all tasks. See the results in the bar plot? And here are what I can read from the plot. First, the no interaction track only allows learning from observations. This method or this track performs the worst, which consolidates the importance of interaction experiences for policy learning. And second, if all kinds of hacks are allowed, then the no restriction track can solve most of the tasks at good performance. It also shows that the end-to-end -end learning methods, end-to-end -end policy learning methods, such as reinforcement learning, still cannot outperform carefully engineered system using a classical task and motion planning pipeline, but the gap is not really big. And since many skill challenge imposes the open source policy, we encourage everyone interested in the results to check the source code and learn more about the details. The next, let us check which task is the most difficult. We still use the metric to average the performance on training and the test sets. Under this metric, for each task, we can compute the average score across all tracks to see results on the bar plot. And here are what we can read. The first, opening cabinet drawer seems to be the simplest. The major challenge is the basic navigation and the grasping skill, and the both seem to be easy. Second, the task of pushing chair seems to be the most difficult. Recall that the chairs under test are swivel chairs. Their dynamic model under external force is very complex. Also, the agent needs to push them by the collaboration of two arms. For this under actuated system to be manipulated with two arm collaboration, the existing methods still cannot solve it very well. And third, let us analyze the generalization performance, which is the gap between the performance on the training set and the test set for different tracks. It is very clear that the trend test performance gap is quite big, but interaction is not allowed. And therefore, um, from the opposite way, we can read it like interaction can effectively improve the generalizability when a shape difference exists across training and the test data. Now, finally, let us analyze the generalization performance for different tasks. It is a bit surprising that the open cabinet door task has the biggest train task gap. Now, after checking the data, we guess it is mainly because many doors have small handles and detecting the handles, which are small objects from point clouds reliably is hard. And therefore, the visual perception generalization gap may have caused the policy learning gap.
So that summarizes the result for Manuscript 2021. And next, let me introduce the basic plan of our Manuscript 2022 challenge to take place this summer. The basic form will follow from the 2021 challenge. We will still focus on object level generalizability, and we will still have the three tracks. But we will add new tasks and update our system to support high level parallel computation. Now in particular, to recap, Miniscale 2021 includes four tasks. But for the new version of many scale, we will significantly increase the amount of tasks. Our current plan includes adding a new set of tasks to manipulate rigid objects, some new tasks to the existing articulated objects. And we're going to add a, a new set of very interesting tasks to manipulate soft body objects, as shown on the right. We hope that you will find it interesting and join us again. Okay, so uh, we plan to launch the competition in summer and you're welcome to join us then. Please watch the Twitter of my group account for further updates. Okay, next, let us announce the winners of the awards, uh, of the challenge. We are delighted to have the Vice President of Qualcomm, Dr. Jile Ho, Ho, to announce the awards for us. I will stop my screen sharing and pass the ball to Jile. All right, hey, thank you, Hal. Um, thank you for the nice introduction. Let me share the slides. So, hold on. All right, uh, can you guys see my screen here? Yes. How can you confirm? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yes, you can see it. All right, thank you. Hey, everyone, thank you, uh, uh, you know, for uh, uh, inviting me to this event. Um, you know, I'm very glad to see um, a lot of exciting, you know, results uh, and also competition, you know, uh, you know, teams, right? You know, join these events. Uh, a lot of results are very impressive, and also I can see uh, a lot of progress here. Definitely is laying the foundation. Uh, into the future in terms of how uh, people combining perception, you know, reasoning and actioning all together. Uh, uh, you know, even from an industry, from a corporate research point of view, uh, we definitely like to further, you know, look into these areas and, and also looking at how they're leveraging a lot of exciting results uh, from uh, this workshop here. Uh, so I'll spend maybe just two minutes really quick to talk about who we are as a Qualcomm AI research. And then we'll very quickly, you know, moving into talk about, you know, uh, uh, announcing all the winning uh, teams. Okay. So the first one is uh, uh, on our side, you know, basically, and at Qualcomm AI Research, our central mission uh, is about advancing AI research to make the edge AI uh, ubiquitous. Uh, a, a lot of innovation we conduct uh, largely is a, a lot at the platform level, right, and to help. Uh, skill AI in across industry. Um, particularly, you know, we emphasize on the power efficiency. We emphasize on the on device learning, and of course, we also, you know, kind of, you know, very focused on the um, efficient learning, learning representation perspective. Uh, but on the other hand, you know, through our internal research, including you know collaboration with the you know university program, like with the house team, you know, elaborately. Uh, in terms of looking into various, you know, you know, tasks, the use case of perception, reasoning, actioning, but we are, you know, uh, have a very dedicated focus to think about from a business impact perspective, how we make it into the industry, you know, from our roots, right, starting from a mobile, 
but we also become a leading um, you know, chipset and compute platform vendors for XR and automotive. And also, you know, uh, uh, we also fell into IoT into robotics. It's a very exciting field into the future. A lot of AI gonna play very essential uh, kind of impact in that space. So uh, uh, if we try to zoom in one more level down, I think a lot of R&D activity at Qualcomm. Uh, we, you know, from an AI perspective, we kind of, you know, really, you know, organizing into three different perspectives. Uh, what we call the, you know, fundamental research, apply research, and the platform research. So uh, on a platform research side, I primarily think about just like NVIDIA providing the best uh, compute platform, right? You know, from our side, play providing the best of mobile of compute platform. And, and also fundamental research side, I think we have been advancing a lot of interesting ideas like the quantum AI, a causality, you know, aquarium model and self-supervised learning, a lot of exciting areas. Uh, also coming on applied research uh, space, you know, for example, uh, I think we have a lot of really cool research on the video, um, you know, voice, um, you know, graphics, uh, but on the other hand, I'm taking it forward and also looking at how to you know, further uh, invest into deep learning for robotics. Uh, a lot of exciting uh, topics. Uh, so also for that matter, if people have more interest in learning about the us, Qualcomm AI research, uh, you guys can look in for the keywords here. You know, just search on the web. You can find us. I'll be very ha happy to further engage and discuss. Okay, uh, now we can come into the more exciting part, you know, uh, announcement of the winner. Uh, under the first track, right? It's a no interaction track. Uh, the the first prize goes to team of Fatumi. Uh, congratulations to the team. Uh, here is uh, uh, the team, all the members. Uh, now I see uh, Quinn is here. Uh, congratulations, Quinn. Um, okay. uh, I, I should hand over to you, I guess, for a minute uh, presentation. Okay, thank you. Uh, hello, everyone. I'm Quinn Wu. And we are uh, very glad to receive this award. Uh, this work is done during my internship at the AI Innovation Center of my dear group. And uh, uh, in this work, we propose a minimalist uh, in, in ensemble method for generalizable manipulation tasks uh, in the many scale challenge. And uh, first, we simply modified the hyperparameters and the network architectures to make each agent uh, more robust. And then for ensemble modeling, we use the uh, both uh, both trapping sampling and uh, orthogonal basis to increase the data diversity and make uh, each base agent more independent. And the uh, finally the results on the leaderboard of the many scale challenge and the local ablation study uh, well demonstrated our uh, the effectiveness of our methods. And uh, uh, so. For more details, uh, please refer to our paper. Uh, thank you very much. All right, thank you, Quinn. Um, so now, um, again, still under the no interaction track, uh, the second prize goes to Team Big Fish. Um, here is uh, mm, uh, the team um, from the Team Big Fish. Um, uh, congratulations again. So, uh, so for the Big Fish team members, please open your camera. And for other teams members, please close your camera. Thank you. I will take a screenshot to record the moment. Yeah, any team members from uh, Team uh, Big Fish? I think Kun Liu is from Team Big Fish. Kun, can you open up your camera? Hi Kun, are you there? Uh, yes, uh, the, the camera uh, is something Yeah, wrong. we can see you now, Kun. Glad to see you here. Congratulations again. Yeah, please uh, go ahead with your uh, one minute presentation. Yeah. Oh, uh, I just uh, followed the many skill uh, original person's method. Uh, use the point net as the uh, 
uh, 3D visual uh, feature extractor and uh, uh, use the transformer based network to predict uh, the action. Uh, uh, my collusion is a uh, wider and deeper transformer uh, works. Uh, um, and we also try training the model use, uh, using more data, but uh, it uh, doesn't work. Uh, we also try some transformer uh, methods. Uh, it uh, didn't work. Uh, I uh, also I also try to uh, use the uh, uh, large larger batch batch size, and uh, uh, it works. Oh, <laughs> that's all. Thank you. All right, thank you, Gwen. Uh, appreciate all the insights, uh, quite helpful. Uh, okay, now the still on the, the same track, no interaction track. Uh, the third prize goes to Team IC. Um, all right, we have uh, Fabian here. Uh, congratulations again. Uh, please uh, share your insight. Thank you. So hello, my name is uh, Fabian. I'm Jenny from Tokyo. Um, so I work for Astaya Art with uh, Eric and Tom, where we are building like software to help uh, robotics engineers leverage the simulation. And so since we joined the competition quite late, uh, we reused the baseline uh, Maniskill Learn model as a start and focused on the cabinet task of the no interaction track. Um, we noticed that training progress was very slow after uh, the first round of K iterations. Uh, but still gave a significant improvement in success rate. Um, so we tweaked the learning rate schedule and obtained a super convergence effect, uh, which uh, doubled the success rate in half the training time. Um, so our second idea was to train a single multitask model on the two tasks, hoping to improve generalization. And we did obtain better results and even reach a top score on unseen cabinets of the open drawer task. So yeah, we would like to thank the organizers for this stimulating challenge and uh, we hope to join again next year. All right, thank you. Thank you, Fabian, for the insight. You can all very appreciate it. Uh, okay, now uh, we are going to the second track, the no external annotation track. Um, now the first prize goes to Team Epic Lab. Um, so we have uh, Wicom. We come when? Yeah. Uh, Congratulations again. So yeah, please go ahead and uh, share your one minute. Mm. Okay, can, uh, can I share my screen? Yeah, uh, please go ahead. Yeah, you can share the screen. Yeah. Okay. Uh, so. Do I need to actually stop sharing, right? Which I just did. You can go ahead. Uh, there is a green button on the bottom of the uh, um, webinar hmm, desk, right? Oh, uh, sorry. Oh, I I can't share my screen. Oh, I will go ahead. Sure. Oh, yeah. okay. Hello, okay. everyone. Uh, I'm Wei Kong Wan from Peking University. And I'm glad to present our message. First, let me introduce our team. We are from Embodied Perception and Interaction in short, Epic Labs, led by Professor He Wang at Peking University. And our team members include me and Hao Shen, along with Professor He Wang. Uh, based on the challenge, we propose a novel category level imitation learning algorithm to learn a generalizable policy that can work on unseen test instances from given object categories. We won the first place in the no external annotation track of many scale challenge, and we outperformed the second place by a large scale. As our baseline, we couple generative adversarial imitation learning or GAL with SAC to utilize demonstration data provided by many scale challenge. On top of GAL with SAC baseline, we propose three important te techniques, including 
the progressive discriminator and self imitation learning from demonstrations and uh, the category level instance balancing buffer, which we call clip expert buffer. In summary, our proposed techniques exactly pinpoint the bottleneck in the category level imitation learning and thus yields significant performance improvement. And we have open sourced our project and welcome to visit our project. Oh, thank you. Uh, all right, um, thank you. Uh, we can uh, appreciate the summary and the insight. All right, let's uh, move on to second prize. Now uh, for the no external annotation track goes to team me. Do, do I pronounce correctly? I should I say me or my? <laughs> Hello? Yeah. Yeah. Um, so yeah, Kang Chi, right? Kang Chi it will, will be the one present. Please go ahead. Uh, thank you. Hello, we are Team IMI from the Machine Intelligence Lab of Peking University. And our idea in many skill challenges about utilizing action semantics. In demonstrations to get a generalized policy. Specifically, we recovered action semantics by translating original actions to explicit fixed post transformation of the end factor for a generalized understanding of the relationship between state and action. Uh, totally, we added two new branches to the network, one to predict the 6D post transformation of the next time step another to predict the factor's final pose relative to the target object. And finally, we fine-tuned the imitator in the RIL environments using SAC and got a boosting result. Uh, that's all, thank you. All right, thank you, Kanji. Uh, appreciate the uh, summary. Uh, now, um, we go into the third track, uh, which is no restriction track. Uh, the first prize goes to Team Silver Bullet 3D. Um, we have Yingwei Pan, yeah, here. Uh, Yingwei, and please go ahead and you know give your summary. Yeah. Okay. Uh, thanks for all challenge organizer and sponsor for hosting this wonderful challenge. And actually, our team has joined two tracks in this challenge. So I, I, I will summarize each solution for each uh, track. And for no interaction track, we combine both uh, imitation learning and offline reinforced learning based approaches. Uh, moreover, we design a transformer based network to explore the geometry and the textual structures of objects and the robotic apps to boost the imitation learning. And uh, for the no restriction track, we design a heuristic rule based method to decompose the tasks into a series of subtasks, and uh, each subtask is tackled with just a simple role-based controlling strategies. And uh, more details can be uh, can be found in our GitHub link. So thanks again. Yeah, that's all. All right. Thank you, Ingwei. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Thank you. All right. Thank you. Uh, okay, now the same track, uh, going the second prize going to team Aiden and Ju Tian. Uh, I'll passing on to Ju Tian uh, to providing the summary, please. Yeah. Hi, everyone. So we followed uh, a similar approach where each policy is a state machine. We processed a point cloud to estimate um, the attributes of the and the poses of the objects and links in order to compute the target and the factor poses and determine the controller state changes. Um, uh, and then we, uh, with the ND factor pose, we use inverse kinematics to find the desired joint positions and use PID controllers to command the robots. Uh, with our results, uh, which perform pretty well on um, open cabinet drawer and push the chair, we think it's helpful that because we're estimating the center of the base of the chair using the using PCA, and we are able to nudge the chair until it reached the 
uh, target location. So uh, with the ability to uh, have the segmented point clouds is helpful. We didn't do quite well at the opening the cabinet, cabinet door because our state machine is quite long. And we think the longer the, the subtasks there are, the more error that there will might happen. Thank you. All right, thank you, uh, Juting. Uh, and also, again, you know, thank you all the, you know, congratulations to the, all the uh, winners. Uh, how, I'll pass back to you and uh, Tongzhou. Thank you. Okay, thank you. No, Tongzhou? Uh, yeah, so thanks everyone for coming to today's workshop and uh, many skill awards through money. And uh, without your support, we cannot achieve this. And uh, I think this, this is pretty much for today. And uh, have a great weekend for everyone. Thank you. So also, um, hope to see you offline in the future events. Okay. Um, we believe that the offline meeting is still the best way to exchange experience, right? To, to communicate. And, and also stay safe, you know, <laughs> in the pandemic. Okay. Okay. Thank you very much for participation. All right. Thank you, everyone. Take care. Bye. Bye.